Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? All right. The coffee's working. We're ready to go. A, a great first day, and uh, I would be worried of how we top the first day, except uh, today's going to be even better. Uh, unbelievable. No pressure on General Rainey down there, but I'm telling you, he always comes through and uh, announces something great and has uh, just tremendous, uh, tremendous job. So really looking forward to that this morning. Kind of a futures transformation focused day and uh, should, should be great. So uh, welcome back. And uh, you know, uh, as I introduced General Rain, I would just tell you, he's, he's really the perfect individual for this job. Uh, Army Futures Command, newest command, really tasked with uh, transforming the Army to ensure a war-winning future readiness. War-winning future readiness, no easy task. But boy, does he, uh, does he and the team get after 30,000 soldiers and civilians in 128 locations worldwide, Army Futures Command, and they're making a huge difference and really helping cut through a lot of the bureaucracy and get our soldiers uh, what they need, no doubt about it. In his previous position, he served a little minor job in the Pentagon as a G357, kept him a little bit busy. Uh, he's, he was uh, uh, commissioned Eastern Kentucky University in 1987 as an infantry officer, and he's commanded at every level from platoon to division has uh, served in numerous combat deployments in both Iraq and Afghanistan. When you look at his background, it's perfect for looking at, uh, again, leading Futures Command. He's earned a master's degree. This I did not know. He's a SAMS, Jedi Knight. I had no idea. It kind of shocked me. I thought, you know, there's no way. And <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I think he's probably honor grad from SAMS as well, no doubt about it. He also uh, has a master's in uh, uh, public administration from Troy University. And he also completed a senior service fellowship at the University of Denver's Corbell School of International Relations. So uh, he's not only uh, an amazing leader, he's got the brains as well, no doubt about it. Uh, he's been happily married to his wife, Tracy, for 36 years. They have two daughters, two son-in-laws, and a brand new grandson that they can spoil. And I'm, I'm giving him uh, advice on that because I just send my check immediately to the seven grandkids I have. So uh, give him some advice on that. So without further ado, let's have a warm welcome for General Jim Rainey. Thanks, sir. No <laughs> yeah. 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 A lot of people are surprised about a lot of things about me, uh, especially the people who knew me young. Which is funny, so I love the Army, I love, man, it's just awesome. I love AUSA, thanks sir, to you and your great team and including us and bringing us down and you know, uh, the people in the Army are what we all, I think we all love, right? You know, that's why everybody joins and stays. And I'm not even, I mean, we'll turn the recruiting thing around. One of the most encouraging thing is our retentions through the roof, right? So what that tells me is we're having trouble talking people into joining, but once people join, it's still that great army that most people don't want to leave until they get told to go home when they're too old, right? So it's just funny because last night uh, I was back at the hotel. Great first day, sir. Thanks. Um, and uh, I was getting ready to go. My team's like, hey, sir, you got to go prep for your speech. And I was walking by the bar in my hotel and I bumped into the lieutenant who sponsored me when I was a second lieutenant, showed up my first unit, 3505, 82nd Airborne, 1987. So I bump into him and uh, I won't say how much time I spent in the bar with him versus prepping, but uh, <laughs> if I suck this morning, Colonel Retired Lee Fretwell is out there somewhere. <laughs> you can take, a, take your issues to him, please. <clears throat> But man, it, I'm, I'm just in a, it's just an honor to be here with you all. Um, last year I talked about <clears throat> warfare and the future of warfare and what we think is going to change and not change. And we've kept working on that. But uh, this year I kind of want to talk about Army transformation. What our secretary and our chief, the under, the vice, Honorable Bush and myself and the other part of the Army enterprise that's responsible, General Brito, my great teammate at TRADOC and all of his guys. So I wanna talk about that because I wanna talk to industry and our industry teammates. <clears throat> and uh, you know, as, as the AFC commander, the analogy I use, so if you think about Daryl Williams, our great commander over in US Army Europe, Africa, 
the way he feels about the NATO countries that are part of that alliance, or the way that General Flynn, who's just crushing it out there in the Pacific, the way General Flynn, U.S. Army Pacific commander, feels about the partner countries, you know, and, and, and they're not going to see, he knows he's, those two great commanders know they're not going to succeed without those partners and those teammates. From an AFC perspective, I think my analogy to that is, is the industry, is our industry teammates, big, middle, and small. So we are not going to succeed at transformation without building that team that brings the superpower that is the U.S. Army or the United States technical and military capabilities to bear to make sure we stay the greatest country in the world. So, so I hope this is interesting. Um, I want to talk about, uh, and, and again, back to the changing, not changing. I'll take questions on that if anybody's interested, but indisputably, the amount of technical disruption in the character of war is unprecedented and continues to just go faster and faster. So whatever you think you know this year, you know, come back in 90 days and you'll, and you'll know something different. <clears throat> and that provides challenges, but I, I personally believe it provides more opportunities because of what the United States can do when we give way together to adapt faster than our enemies. So we're trying to do continuous transformation in the Army, continuous transformation. Be better next year. We're the best Army in the world right now. We want that statement to be true in 2027, 2030, 2040. And just for clarity, a lot of times people talk about Army 2030, Army 2040. <clears throat> you know, just to state the obvious, we, we only have one Army, you know, so... It's, going to, you know, it's not like we can build the Army of 2030 while the, our great teammates at Forcecom are executing the GIF map, keeping, them, keeping the world safe. So we got to kind of continuously transform that Army. So we, we have decided to approach that problem <clears throat> in three distinct periods of time, okay? Three periods of time, hopelessly interrelated. You know, you do something in one, it has impacts and consequences in the others. <clears throat> But the first one is, is what we refer to as transforming in contact. Transforming in contact. So think inside two years. We have to look at what's happening in the world and adapt faster. And it's a big challenge. It's a priority for our chief. He's spoken about it at length. Um, so the, the term transforming in contact <clears throat> confuses some people maybe. I, it's pretty simple. What, he, what we are saying is the great brigade combat teams and divisions and MDTFs that we have right now that are rotating forward into CENTCOM, into Europe, into the Indo-Pacific <clears throat> and other places, that's the best place for us to work on transformation. So what the chief has challenged all of us, and I'll, I'll extend to our industry partners, is what capabilities can we deliver now? So instead of thinking about five years to deliver a long program or record, which makes sense sometimes, I'll talk about that. But what technology is out there now that we can get into the hands of our units where our best leaders are, where our soldiers are, so that they can experiment and learn with it and provide feedback into the, into the Pentagon, into AFC, into TRADOC, so we can get better next year and get better every year after that. The second, um, well, let me, let me go on. So transforming in contact, um, deploying deployed units. So some of the things in that 18 to 24 months that we're really interested in. So we've done some priority directed requirements. And I'm a big believer in directed requirements. I think the criteria is if something it literally exists today, that we don't have or we want, or technology exists today with a little bit of integration, we could have it in the hands of our soldiers. We should write a quick directed requirement, line money up behind it and go after it. <clears throat> An example is loitering munitions, right? We watched what's happened in Ukraine. Loitering munitions are absolutely effective. We don't have them. Write a directed requirement. We're in the process of buying them. <clears throat> and there's several other things, ground-based rockets, ground-based missiles, uh, a, 
a, a counter UAS system that would work with an armor company in the attack or that could protect a light infantry company on the offense. Most of our counter UA, and it's a crisis, we're doing everything we can, you know, we should absolutely be doing everything we can in counter UAS, but if you think about everything we're doing, it's kind of defending static positions. The United States Army, you know, we believe in the offense and attacking, so, so there's a big opportunity to figure out how we're gonna provide effective counter UAS capabilities to units in the offense. We're, and it's not just material, we're working on new organizations in the Army. So you know, we added multi-domain task force, which have been very successful. We're also looking at reorganizing our IBCTs into light formations and, and mobile formations, taking advantage of the technology that exists. We're working very hard on a thing we call human machine integrated formations. And I talked about it last year and it was just an idea um, but the entire team, not, not just AFC, but TRADOC, the Centers of Excellence, uh, RICTO, our teammates in ASOL, and the PMs have come together to kind of breathe life into this. So if you bear with me, I've got a really short three minute video um, of what we did in the first ever combined arms live fire with human machine integrated formations last week out at NTC. So if, so if you don't mind, it's pretty cool. We roll that please. The, uh, I wanted to show you that really to just make the point that, that this isn't a bunch of PowerPoint briefings bouncing around the Pentagon. I mean, this is, this is real thing. So uh, I think that you will see over the next, you know, the, inside that transforming in contact, we'll, we'll start prototyping the first versions of platoons that take machines and humans not, not to replace our, our great soldiers with machines. That's not what it's about. It's offloading risk. Think of all the things we do where we lead with our most precious 
thing that we have, which is our young men and women, right? So no blood for first contact. But we will start, we're gonna snap the chalk line on ink one of the first two versions, one for light infantry, one for our armored formations, and we'll start scaling that over the next couple of years. <clears throat> so if you're in the UAS business, loitering munition business, um, uh, I think it's gonna be more about can you integrate that onto a platform or a payload onto one of our machines and bring that to bear in the context of a formation versus coming to the Army with a thing or a piece of kit. You know, we buy stuff, but we fight formations. Uh, Colonel Troy Denemy is here today. Ross Kaufman's here. I think there's a panel this afternoon that'll go into more detail about this, but th this is one of our major, major efforts inside the Army, and it's going very well, and it's full of opportunities to go to the next level. Again, you know, we, we, are, we are never gonna replace humans with machines. It's about optimizing them. Because if you think about it, um, the things that only humans can do, ethical decision-making, practicing the art of command, you know, computers and machines don't have instincts. They, aren't, they don't have that curiosity that a great cavalryman you know, was just raised to understand. So putting those two things together in the optimal way that, that makes the Army better. Um, it also inside this two-year two, two year period, another, another point I'd make, and uh, I think we're gonna have a panel later with the Honorable Bush, but uh, we don't really have a technology problem in the Army. What, what we have is a tech adoption <clears throat> problem, in my opinion. We just can't close the acquisition kill chain as fast as the change, the pace of change in technology, and that's something we're working very hard on, because we absolutely have to bring that. You know, people say the defense industrial base. I, I really think it's the American industrial base. You know, that's such a such a huge advantage we have here in the country. And how do we bring that to bear at a speed of relevance <clears throat> for our country? And to do that, we got to work on the thing I call fiscal agility, which Mr. Bush and the. Uh, the under talked about yesterday, and we'll talk about that more in a panel. So that's kind of the inside two years. Be better next year, go faster, get kit into the hands of our best units that are forward so that we can learn faster and adapt faster than our enemies. The second period of time that we're really interested in is what we refer to as deliberate transformation. So think, uh, two to seven years, kind of the, the FIDEP period. Um, <clears throat> I like to say there, there's no such thing as a good army process. There's bad ones and necessary ones. You know, um, the POM, the FIDEP, it's, it's law, it's how our country works. So if you're gonna do things, you know, that, that five-year approach from like year two to year seven matters. And this is a place where I've, I'm very proud of the Army. I, I think uh, the modernization and transformation efforts the Army started about six years ago now um, with the stand-up of AFC, but that was just part of it. <clears throat> um, the way the Army is stuck to its modernization uh, priorities. You know, we haven't moved the goalpost. My predecessor, General Murray, and his team deserves a lot of credit. They put in the hard work up front to get the requirements very close to right. Uh, our signature modernization efforts, with a couple exceptions, are, are either on track or ahead of schedule. I feel very good about that. Um, I won't go into the aviation rebalance um, that's been talked about a lot, but uh, the Army is 100% committed to FLARA. We have to make that work. The ability to vertically envelop our enemies with our best weapon system we have, the U.S. Army Rifle Squad. You know, we don't, we don't do attrition warfare. We're not gonna sign up for trading thousands of human lives for, for hundreds of meters. We, we don't do that, we do maneuver warfare. So FLARA is an absolute must that we have to continue to deliver and it's in good shape. And if you're interested in launched effects, I think that's a huge opportunity. If you don't understand that, Colonel Promotable Kane Baker's here, is my guy leading that. But one of the reasons the chief and secretary were able to make the hard decision they made about FARA is because what we've learned about the ability to employ launched effects to you know trucks with payloads of capabilities 
that can operate on the modern battlefield. Um, so those are, those are good. <clears throat> um, IRCA is another one I'd like to talk about a little bit, a lot of interest in that. Um, so extended range cannon artillery is a requirement, not a thing. So nothing has changed about the requirement that we have that's valid to extend the range of our cannon artillery. We did a rapid prototyping <clears throat> effort and we watched what's going on in Ukraine and that led us to make an adjustment to IRCA. So we did a thing called the tactical fire study, put a bunch of work in. <clears throat> what we realized is just by focusing on the round, we had a significant amount of success in extending the range at, at, the, at the round. Uh, again, thanks to all the great capabilities that are coming out of industry. <clears throat> and then we also realized, re-realized, that when you're talking about conventional artillery and fires, it's probably more about capacity than capability. You know, the structure, the depth of your magazine. So if you're in a resource constrained environment where you're gonna spend your money, <clears throat> um, you can go after an exquisite system or you can take a more holistic approach to delivering capability and capacity. <clears throat> so, um, the fire study had some interesting and I think accurate conclusions that I'll talk to you about a little bit. So the first one's what I just said, we need to innovate at the round. You know, across our fires enterprise, how do we get more range out of the weapon systems we have by innovating at the round? And there's a lot of room for technology. We're still using technology that was invented in the 40s in a lot of case, talk about RDX, things like that. So there's huge opportunities in, in energetics and additive manufacturing. We need to continue to pursue delivering a better armored howitzer. Better armored howitzer is one of our priorities. And there's some great capabilities out there. And I think Mr. Bush and his team will talk about that some more. We need to pursue mobile indirect fires, mobile indirect fires. Um, I, I personally believe that we, are, we, are, we have witnessed the end of uh, the effectiveness of towed artillery, okay? Uh, the future is not bright for towed artillery. <clears throat> and and it, this isn't about the humans. We have the best, best artillery men in the world. But displacement times against a high-end threat like China in terms of large-scale combat ops you know, there can't be displacement. You know, somebody asked me, what do you think the standard for displacement is? I'm like, no displacement. I mean, we gotta be faster. We gotta continuously move. So we're interested in mobile indirect fires, especially in our light infantry and striker formations. I'm very interested in an autonomous and robotic cannon solution for our joint forcible entry formations. Think about the 82nd, 101st, our great units, some of our uh, soft forces that are gonna have to live for a couple hours on the ground and are gonna need organic fires that exceed you know, what they can get from just the joint force. But I think there's a huge opportunity with autonomous and robotic solutions to that. <clears throat> They're not, not, not wed to any caliber. Um, can't forget our great infantrymen. We gotta relook our suite of mortars. We haven't changed our, you know, no infantrymen, would ever give up their mortars, right? Um, I happen to be one. It's an organic weapon system, uh, but we, we're, we're at 60, 81, 120, and, and we've been that way. So we'll take a holistic look at what we could do with munitions and capabilities and autonomy, robotics, uh, with our whole suite of mortars. And then bringing things like launched effects, <clears throat> loitering munitions, we can't treat those in isolation from our fires portfolio. And again, I'll end with, it's as much about the structure as it is about the capability. Um, some of the, some, I'm looking at a few of my, my heroes and legends. You know, we, we, De Desert Storm, we had divisions that had four brigades of fires behind them. Right? I don't know if we're gonna get back to that much capacity, but the future of war is gonna be about maneuvering to emplace fires. And while we, we need to continue to pursue the long range precision fires, we gotta make sure 
that we can dominate the close fight with tactical fires. <clears throat> so that's something in that kind of two to, two to seven year where I think there'll be a lot of opportunities. The same human machine integrated formations that I just showed you and said we'll be prototyping and, uh, and piloting the next couple years, I think in the 26 to 30 time frame, <clears throat> you're gonna see those platoons start showing up in more and more company troop batteries. So we need to scale them horizontally, and we also need to add, you know, what's the, arti what's the artillery battery version of a human machine integrated pl platoon? What's the artillery, I'm sorry, what's the air defense version? Uh, our engineers, you know, they're, they're part of the five finger death punch, right? So we're reestablishing the engineer battalions in our divisions. We got to get back to making sure that we can breach anything and cross anything in our tactical formations. And I think if we're honest, our engineers have probably uh, lagged the most in terms of modernization and transformation, and, and especially the heavy part of our army. You know, we got the best ABCTs in the world, but, but you know, we can't let them get stopped by a seven meter gap. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're more likely to get stopped by the terrain than we are by any enemy we're gonna fight, and that's not okay. So we gotta get after the engineer transformation and modernization. <clears throat> the number one priority in this period of time is the network. So we're working on fixing our network inside two years taking advantage of technology and improving the network we have. But the real opportunity is to move to a genuinely data-centric approach to warfare, what we refer to as next generation command and control. And while we have to fix everything left to right, um, we're never gonna get where we need to be if we keep focus on connecting disparate sensors, building mission partner environments for our, you know, our critical allies and partners. So next generation C2 is about moving to truly data-centric warfare that's 100% about the commander, right? We have a network to enable our biggest advantage, which is our, our commanders, our humans. So moving to data-centric warfare, commanders that can make more, better, and faster decisions than the person they're, that they're fighting. Because our system can't just be a little better than who we're fighting, it needs to be about 10x, because we're, unlike our enemies, we're gonna continue to practice ethical decision-making, right? Not super restrictive ROE, but we are gonna continue to abide by the law of armed conflict, because that's what makes us the people we are. So we can't be a little faster, we gotta be way faster. Um, think no mission command systems, right? The, the next generation command and control can't, can't have stovepipe mission command systems. It needs to be truly data centric. Software over hardware. We gotta get to a position where we can solve problems and integrate by updating software and we can take anybody's piece of hardware and rapidly integrate it with software solutions vice trying to stitch it together. And then another big part of this that'll impact industry is we would like to move to infrastructure as a service, right? Mr. Bush talked about this at the industry day. Uh, the unders talked about it. But, you know, think of any piece, I challenge anybody to think of a piece of technology that you would sign up for a five-year buy of. You know, would you go to Best Buy or the iPhone store or whatever and say, I'll, I'll, I'll make a five-year commitment to something, right? So we think the great companies out there, and there's lots of examples, we would like to go to service-based models for as much of the infrastructure as we can for our entire network. And then with all the data stuff everybody's talking about, those of you that have been in combat and have fought and have trained, we gotta keep a pace plan, right? So we can't go so far down the data path that we forget that the enemy's good, they're gonna take that capability away and we better have an alternate, alternative, alternate contingency and emergency solution to the command and control system, right? So that's, that's probably, well that is the chief's number one priority and that's probably the biggest disruption I, I think we will see in that two to seven year period. Critical to our success in this period of time is Project Convergence, which some of you are familiar with. <clears throat> AFC leads that for the Army. 
but it's really an army hosted joint experimentation series. It's persistent. We do it all year long. Um, I'm very proud of the, of the team. We've increased our experimentation 25% from 22 to 23 and another 25% from 23 to 24. So a 15% increase in army experimentation over the last 24 months, which is really significant. <clears throat> and that's the opportunity. That's the place where we want industry to come partner with us and see what we're doing, get, get access to our great soldiers so you can iterate. And there's an there's a opportunity for anybody in industry to partner with the Army and Project Convergence. We did Capstone 4 uh, out in Pendleton a couple weeks ago and the National Training Center last week. Those weren't robot tanks, or those were real tanks out there. I put them in there for you. Uh, out at the NTC, but uh, most of the rest of that stuff, Miklik, Javelins, those were all robots. Um, but that we did those kind of things out of Project Convergence, live firing at the National Training Center off of robots, unmanned UH-60s flying around. It's a huge opportunity for us. The Army spends a lot of resources, energy on it. We'll do the next, we have lots of persistent experimentation opportunities. Net Mod X in the fall. We're doing a robotic summit uh, down at College Station in November. Be glad to talk to people about those things. And then we'll do Capstone 5 in March, April of 25 timeframe. And then the third period of time is what we refer to as concept driven transformation. So we used to talk about 2040. I think we've refined that more accurately. We're really talking about the decade from 2030 to 2040. So if you go out past, past the FIDEP and get into that second and third FIDEP, 30 to 35, 35 to 40, there's some real opportunities for us to transform and make some bigger adjustments than we can make inside, seven, uh, inside the first five to seven years. So we're working very hard on that. The Army, we, we, have, we can't roll it out yet, I will probably, a teaser for October at USA there, sir, but uh, maybe. But uh, we've updated the Army warfighting concept. So think what, what comes after multi-domain operations. We're working very hard on that. We've got a good theory of victory. Um, starts with sustaining our indisputable asymmetric advantages we have right now. So if you're going to fight, the first thing you want to do is preserve your strength. For us, we believe that's our people. We have the best soldiers preserving the all-volunteer force. We've got the best NCO Corps in the world, envy of the world. We've got more better leaders, and we've got commanders that nobody can match. So whatever we do as we transform, we got to preserve that people advantage we have. The second thing we need to preserve, and I've talked about it, is we don't do attrition warfare. We're, we are the world's best at maneuver warfare as a joint force and especially as an army. And the ability to, you know, we owe the country and the joint force an army that can indisputably dominate the land domain anywhere with partners as, point of, as part of a joint force, but we exist to dominate the land. The land domain is not going out of business. If, you know, look what's happening in the world. Wars about people fighting each other, contest of will, as long as those people insist on living on the land, the future of war is not going to change. The ability to dominate the decisive domain that the land is why we have an army. So sustaining some things, but we need to add some new capabilities. Um, I'll give you two as an example. We have to develop adaptability as, as a capability in the army. Um, the reason I'm pushing so hard to go fast now is we need to build that, we need to rebuild those reps and sets, that muscle memory so we can see, because we're not going to get the future right. No, it's, it's unpredictable. We'll do the best we can to not get it really wrong, but nobody's going to figure it out exactly. <clears throat> so what that means is we're going to need, even when we're in, in combat, we're going to need the ability to see something happening and make that adjustment faster than the person we're fighting. So we need to add adaptability as an, as an advantage in the Army. And then the last one is this idea of endurance, right? I, I, 
Uh, I do not believe in the short, sharp war idea. I mean, uh, nuclear equipped superpowers, if they got into an existential fight, I believe it will be a long, tough, nasty fight. <clears throat> and we as an army, and we as a joint force, and we as a country need to be clear eyed about that. And we need to do everything we can to make sure we have the endurance for what will be the most horrific and lethal uh, contest of wills in the history of warfare. <clears throat> so things like the defense industrial base, magazine depth, but also the humans, you know, think about our, I said our superpowers, those young men and women, right? Making sure that we recruit and train and develop humans that are gonna be able to withstand the horrors of what will be the next war we fight. <laughs> We have uh, some imperatives for transformation that'll be included in this. And we're gonna put out concept required capabilities. So we want inside the department, we wanna or orientate, orient our, uh, I was flashing back to being an infantry lieutenant there for a second. Uh, we need to orient our S&T enterprise on you know, what capabilities are we gonna need in that decade that we don't have now and how do we bring the superpower of U.S. academic excellence and industrial excellence? I think for industry and even the venture guys, you know, we, we owe you what are the big, hard, wicked problems we're trying to solve so we can bring your IRAD investments to bear in a way that's meaningful. And there's a complete list of that that, like I said, we'll share here in the new future. <clears throat> but some of them aren't real hard to imagine. Uh, I mentioned the number one is moving to a truly data-centric approach with a resilient command and control system. Um, protection, we, we have to develop the ability to protect our formations and our forward positioned supplies, uh, locations, bases. So somebody, and it's got to, and candidly, it cannot be a purely kinetic solution, right? We just cannot move enough kinetic ammo against an enemy that's operating on interior lines with a bigger magazine depth. <clears throat> so we need a solution to the protection problem that is some combination of kinetic, but largely non-kinetic. <clears throat> Again, lots of opportunities, high power microwave, directed energy. And not just that, it has to come with a realistic power solution, right? Uh, I've not spent as much time in the, in the South China Sea as some, but there are a lot of places where we're not gonna be able to, you know, go plug into the local power grid. So a holistic approach to throw in a bubble, counter UAS to ballistic missile over our formations, over our, our ports, over our airfields, over our BCTs, over our Air Force teammates when they do agile combat deployment <clears throat> that brings non-kinetic technology, a little bit of kinetic, and a power solution. That's a big wicked problem that we would love people to help with. I believe the future of contested logistics is largely one of autonomy and robotic solutions. <clears throat> Even if we had a big giant ship to put a brigade's worth of tanks on, I, I don't see that as being a real prudent approach. You know, we might have to do some of that, but that can't be the entire solution. So how do we get smaller? How do we bring autonomy and robotics to bear predictive log logistics to build a, a sustainment enterprise that will work against a good enemy? Um, I, I believe that if you think about offense and defensive fires, so think air and missile defense and offensive fires. We currently, I think, have the best of breed in the world. You know, HIMARS, uh, TACMs, Patriot, THAAD, best of breed. <clears throat> but those systems right now, for a lot of good reasons, were built, they have their own sensors, their own decision-making process, their own firing solution, and their own sustainment enterprise. By 2030 at the latest, we have to merge offensive and defensive fires so we do not have 
the time that it takes to integrate those two separate functions. Um, anything we can do with our light infantry formations to increase the survivability and lethality, bring technology to bear. Some of you have been around long enough when we were messing around with light infantry divisions. <clears throat> and basically, everybody came to the conclusion, I'm paraphrasing, but a bunch of the best people in the world said, hey, light infantry is an awesome idea, but it's not going to work because we can't kill tanks with light infantry. But guess what? With technology today, you know, I grew up in, a, in the light infantry formations that were worried about the first three to five kilometers in front of them. Today, our IBCTs can get into restrictive terrain. They can sense as deep as they want to, and we need to give them the ability to start killing at 50 kilometers, not, not five, the expanded battle space. But if we're gonna put our best precious, most precious system, that rifle squad in that kind of harm's way, we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to make sure that we can meet the expectations, moral responsibility for casualty evacuation and treatment. You know, we're, not, we're gonna turn the golden hour into a golden day. And we absolutely have to solve the counter UAS problem to keep, keep swarm UAVs, massive amounts of indirect fire coming down <clears throat> on the people wearing OCPs and flak jackets. And uh, the requirement for ABCTs, heavy army, heavy divisions is not going away. <clears throat> it's not going away. Uh, I reject the idea that we've seen the end of the tanks. We have the best tank in the world. Um, if you say, people like to argue about tanks, what I say is let's talk about tank companies. Let's talk about U.S. Army soldiers, non-commissioned officers, a couple great lieutenants, and a U.S. Army company commander in 14 tanks. And you can bring a battalion of your crap. And let's go at it, you know what I mean? Let's go out at the NTC, not, not try to start a war or anything. <laughs> right, <clears throat> when you put all the pieces together. And as long as our enemies have tanks, we're gonna need tanks. And while we're rightly focused on the Indo-Pacific, we live in a dangerous world. So I don't know how many ABCTs and how many tanks we'll have in 2030 and 2040, but the armor formations we have better be the best in the world, indisputably. Kill at a ratio of 10 to one. End wars. Dominate the land domain. Deter people from even thinking about fighting us. But those heavy formations are way too heavy. <clears throat> we have got to get the weight down, not just of the individual vehicles, but we have to get the overall formation-based weight. <clears throat> so alternative fuels, hybrid engines, new metallurgy, um, innovating at the round, you know, stowed kills inside a tank. I think there's huge opportunities to jack the technology way up. How do we put robotic and human formations into a tank platoon that lets the men and women in the turrets focus on nothing but destroying the enemy? So there's opportunities in the light and heavy formations. <clears throat> and just like Project Convergence is the, is the vehicle by which we study and understand what we're doing in that deliberate transformation window. <clears throat> we have a future studies program, so a war gaming series that Lieutenant General Dave Hodney, who works for us at Future Concept Center, is gonna rebreathe life into over the next couple years. And just to show we're good learning people, I was at the industry day yesterday, one of our teammates said, hey, you know, <clears throat> there's a big opportunity to bring industry into some of your war gaming early and share, go up to TS with people that can and make sure you understand the problems we're trying to solve at a deeper level. And I love that idea, told Hodney this morning to do it. So there you go. Uh, but we, we are gonna increase our emphasis on war gaming. <clears throat> and those of you familiar with the Army, we, we used to be a lot better at this than we are now. So that's something we're gonna take to the next level over the next 12 and 24 months. Um, I'll probably stop there, but those are the three periods of time. I hope, I hope some of that was interesting. I hope some of our great industry teammates saw some opportunities in there. But before I leave this, I just gotta say one more thing as the futures guy. Uh, we, you know, we, we have to never forget that, that this is about close combat dominance. 
So the United States Army, whatever we do as we transform, we have to make sure that we are clear-eyed and understand that, that those young men and women, that, that last 500 meters that has made us the best army in the world since 1775, we can't ever lose that. And I just ask everybody to talk to young men and women, you know, inspire people to serve. It's not for everybody, but we need the best and brightest. And we need cyber people, we need geniuses, but uh, zeros and ones don't hurt. You know, we're not gonna kill anybody with data. You know, we are still gonna need tough young men and women that can close that last 500 meters in the dark, when it's cold, when you didn't get food, when the battery didn't work. And unfortunately, um, the ability to set the enemy's tanks on fire and stab a few of their humans on the objective is something that we, we can never afford to walk away from. And that all comes down to preserving the all-volunteer force. So thank you all very much. I'll stand by for your questions. Good morning, General Rainey, Rodney Pennywell Caliber. Thank you very much for that brief. You obviously covered a waterfall of things. At a time where the Army Futures Command is really probably the most significant, uh, has the most significant impact on our Army, at a time where we're at the most pivotal change, how and what philo philosophical changes do you potentially see on training, how we train our forces to keep up with the adaptability that you're talking about, as well as our acquisition approach in order to figure out how we buy and support and keep our, OI, our industrial base in line with the, both the logistics and the sustainment that's gonna be necessary to do the things that you just mentioned. And I'll sit down, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, you know, I don't think, it, you know, I don't think any one part of the Army is any more significant than the other you know we all gotta we gotta play our position well um i think if you look at what forcecom is doing to generate current readiness and meet the unbelievable global demand in, in, in conjunction with figuring out how to do that without the, the amount of people we would like to have general brito and his tradoc team are responsible for for delivering the profession you know making sure that that you know, we don't have jobs, right? We don't work at the Army, we're a profession, and preserving that is probably more important than any one technological advancement. And our great teammates at AMC here, they gotta sustain the whole, you know, they got the easy task of sustaining the entire enterprise, you know, so, um, and I think you'd agree that, you know, the most important formations we have in the Army are company troop battery, you know, that's where all the, that's where all the fighting happens. Um, but your good, good question about training. So I, I, I think the innovation, the best innovation, in my experience in the Army, you know, the closer you are to getting shot, the better you are at innovating. You know, the, the sergeant in the E4 that figured out how to get through the hedgerows. Um, so I think we need to be as innovative in our approaches to training as we are in our innovation, as, as we are to our approaches to uh, modernization. So uh, we need to do some range modernization. You know, one of my nightmares is we actually deliver all this great kit, the, all these new capabilities, and we can't train on them at home station. You know, we're the best army in the world because of home station training and the, the CTCs. So making sure we modernize the TT peg at a pace that's greater to or equal to uh, our modernization in the EE peg is important to me. I don't know if that answered your question. We'll talk about the acquisition thing. I, I've got some thoughts, but I had to speak four times here and I only got this much interesting stuff to say because I got to kind of spread it out <laughs> over, over the four. So show up to the next thing. Hi, sir. Um, hey. Cindy Gaddis, Boots to Cyber. You had mentioned that Project Convergence is really where you do your experimentation mm -hmm. and you've increased it by 15% over the year. Yeah. So one of the questions that I was wondering is, as part of the experimentation that you are doing out there, how much of it is uh, cyber warfare that you're, you're focused on protecting the operations in the midst of the battle in yeah. that area? Yeah, a lot. Um, if, if, I could kind of, if I could answer that in the context of electronic warfare. Uh, so 
cyber is is absolutely you know critical. But I but I think what we're really learning and experimenting with is the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we, this last one, we have a, a very good EW capability that's man pack, man portable. We put that through the paces. Um, it did, I didn't put it in my awesome video. This is a good, this is a good thing. I didn't put it in my awesome video because it wasn't awesome, but like that was the day that we did it. But you know, like anybody in the army, you got to do all the rehearsals and eight step training model. So we have an EW capability on a robot that was designed as a counter UAS capability. Uh, and when we turned it on the first time, it worked awesome. It knocked down all the enemy UAS and every single UAV we had up and the entire network that we were experimenting with. So you just like EW hate on a robot. But we learned that there, right? And then two days later, we had gone into the electromagnetic spectrum, apportioned it. One of the biggest things I'm learning is kind of more war fighting probably than, than, than technology. But uh, if you're familiar with graphic control measures and how we control direct fires so we kill the enemy and not ourselves, how we call artillery and have coordination measures, one of the biggest things we've learned at, at Project Convergence is there needs to be a doctrinal part of this electromagnetic electronic warfare where we're going to have to establish graphic control measures in the electromagnetic spectrum the same way we do in the air, ground, littoral, and on the ground. So those are some examples of some really good learning that happened out there. Good morning, sir, and uh, thank you. This is William King from uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, and uh, great thinker and great uh, insights. The National Defense Strategy talks about this. We're at an inflection point and in needing to rebalance and refocus and potentially resource real threats that are coming in that 15 to 20 year realm at the risk of uh, current fight. Uh, how well do you see the Army and the greater enterprise really embracing that notion that the current fight needs to be just enough while we really focus our efforts on those threats that can really change our way of life? Yeah. Um not, not to dodge your question, I think that's more of a policy thing than it is a uh, uniformed aspect. Um, it's, it's a tough problem. I mean, you know, China, everything that everybody's saying about China is absolutely true. I mean, their pace uh, that they have moved over the last couple decades, the capabilities they have, the advantages they have of interior lines, magazine depth, um, you know, there's, there's a, you can make a real clear argument that every single ounce of capacity we have should be oriented on that. Um, <clears throat> and I think we, I think the Army has, done, General Flynn, I mean, in the last couple of years, the Army has leaned into Indo-PACOM in a way that has been unprecedented with great effect, great deterrent effect uh, with his partners and allies, you know, as part of the, the whole Indo-PACOM team. So I think we're doing okay. I mean, there's never, like, I don't think I would ever say, like, okay, I'm good on China. What else? You know, I, mean, I think it's going to be a perpetual, you know, contest, um, competition. But at the same time, you know, just look around the world, man. You know, it's a dangerous place, dangerous place. There's a war in Europe for the first time in 70 years. Uh, you know, Middle East, Middle East is violent. Most likely place will lose a U.S. service member in the next 24 hours, which we all pray doesn't happen. But if it did, it's probably going to be in the Middle East. Um, you know, North Korea is more belligerent and aggressive than they were when we almost went to war with them in 2018. And like, you don't, you hardly hear about that. Um, that's a real, real threat. Um, like I like to say about violent extremists, you know, you can quit them, but they ain't quitting you, right? So that tragic event that just happened in, in Moscow, I think we should be clear-eyed about the potential of something like that happening in Europe and, and even here in the homeland. So uh, got to focus on got to focus on China, but we live in a dangerous world. One thing I like to say about the Army, you know, everybody, everybody in the Joint Force matters, but one thing I like to say about the Army is we do windows. You know what I mean? Like, we go where we're told. That's, that's what we do. You know, you want, you want 2,500 National Guardsmen down on the border, they'll be there. You know, there's a disaster in the United States, we'll be there. You want, you want to go, you want, something happens in Africa, doesn't matter where it's at on the priority, 
82nd Airborne's ready to jump in there if you need us to. And that, that's a big part of our contribution to the joint force. So I think we got to do both. Good morning, sir. This is some first class Clemens from the University of North Georgia, uh, senior military college. Uh, wanted to let you know that every single thing that you're talking about in terms of the beginning to the middle to the end phase concept uh, makes me think of the retooling concept of using professional trading mentality of fundamental to technical analysis from the high of we need to get this done and then the challenges going downward of how to implement it and then how to uh, su sustain or to increase or acknowledge that there's a downfall to it and protecting it in the process uh, in terms of the Elliott Waves sequence, if you're familiar or anything with any type of tr trading mentality, sir. Yep. And the other question is, uh, for service members like myself, uh, I'm 19 years in, uh, recently found out, hey, there's something to do with AI, uh, something to do with technology, but I'm stuck in having to deal with the marketplace and trying to talk to brands and trying to figure out how to finagle somewhere in between there to be put into something that is of a high interest and yep. not be caught up in, uh, oh, your evals suck, so uh, <laughs> sucks to be you, I guess. Yeah, I, there's a lot there. I'd, I'd love to link you up with some of my people. Um, <laughs> I've been in Dahlonega. I wasn't in school. I was starving in the woods line somewhere. 30 years ago, but it's beautiful. That's a great university. Yeah, we'll follow up with you. Uh, I, I am familiar with what you're talking about. Uh, system engineering, you know, process improvement is a big part of how AFC tries to look at things different. I'd ask you to link up with uh, Dr. Casey Purley, who runs Army Application Lab for us. We'll make that, that connection. Yeah. And the marketplace, you know, hey, I'm not in the people, you know, everybody's in the people business. That's not my portfolio, but, you know. There's a reason the U.S. comes before my on your name tag there. Sometimes, you know, you just got to go and be the best soldier you can be where the Army asks you to go some days. Hey, good morning, sir. Hey. Brian Cook, MKS2 Technologies. Uh, first of all, thanks for the insights and kind of the rollout. With the advent of highly consequential quantum computing and quantum sensing, what do you think that lies in your three time horizons? All three, I mean, that's the, e the easy right. answer. Um, I said yesterday, and probably overstated it for effect, but um, I I'm not sure we have as much of a sensing problem as we think we do. I think what we really have is the ability to do anything with all the data that is coming off the joint sensors. And, uh, you know, we've kind of gone up crazy with PED which is critical, but we, we can't have, you know, we'd have a whole army full of great MI professionals doing PED if, if we continue to try and take a human only approach to dealing with the amount of data off here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think in the immediate near term, we need to get our data into a usable and accessible state. Like even if all the, if somebody, one of you guys walked up and like, hey, good news, solve the AI thing, here's the answer, greatest thing ever, we couldn't do anything with it because our data is all over the place and it's not in a usable state. So that's why that next generation C2 and moving, you know, working on AI as part of the network fix in the next two years, but the fundamental idea behind C2 next or next generation C2 is to move all the data from all the sensors, not into a physical place, but into a state that's usable and accessible, then you can bring AI, AI now, the future of AI, machine learning. You know, I'm old enough to, people have been telling me quantum's coming for 20 years now, so I'm kind of from Missouri on that, but computing at quantum-like speeds, being able to bring that to bear. And then out in that 30 to 40, one of the gigantic fundamental changes we're gonna see, I believe, is algorithmic warfare, right? We're gonna to have to have the tough rifle squads and the best tanks in the world, but we're gonna be able to confront our enemies with an AI-driven algorithmic approach to warfare where they look at it and go, holy crap, You know, if I pull the first trigger, they're gonna take a system on system approach at, at machine speed that we can't keep up with. That that's gonna negate our advantage of interior lines. It's gonna negate our advantage of magazine depth. 
So I think we ought to be going all in on it in all three periods of time. Sir, Dan Roper with AUSA. You made a great laydown of what's involved in continuous transformation yeah. you know, based on what the Chiefs obviously put out as guidance and what we're seeing around the world. Could you talk about the effects and the impact of some of the budget disruption that's occurring at levels above your head, but what are the mitigating steps that you're taking yeah. to maintain continuity in that transformation? Yeah. Again, not trying to dodge the question, you know, um, $185, $189 billion is a lot of money. Um, you know, especially if you look at, you know, our country has a lot of challenges, you know. Um, so I think our job is to get every dollar worth of effectiveness out of the money we're given. You know, we cannot waste money. Um, and we need to be more efficient, more effective. And I think we should spend more money on, on improving our ability to move the money we have, being more agile with what we have so we can move at a speed of relevance. And then Congress and the department will decide who to give what, how much money. There's a great uh, George Marshall, you know, probably one of the greatest generals ever, is famous, famously said, you know, in the World War II time frame, he said, when I, had, when I had the time, I didn't have the money. And when I had the money, I didn't have the time. I don't want to speak for our great chief now, but I think, I think if you look at General George and the problem he's trying to solve, you could make a good argument that he doesn't have the time or the money right now. So we got to get better and faster. Uh, sir, uh, good morning. Uh, Ken Crate, Sir Cam Vets Media. Uh, reports recently out of Ukraine, they were doing pretty well about shooting down drones, UAVs, but were struggling with the hypersonics that they were uh, being attacked with. Well, I'm just curious what's different about a hypersonic, you know, and other types of systems uh, versus uh, UAVs in, in defending against them? Uh, speed, mostly. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, I don't, I'm not trying to be flippant. I, you know, the, the bottom line is we have to, it was what I was trying to say about building a protection enterprise that runs the gamut from, you know, like somebody's like, well, it's just a little quadcopter. It's not that big a deal. If you're a rifle squad and that quadcopter is what's calling accurate indirect fire, that's a big deal. Um, but we have, to, we have to build an air and missile defense enterprise formation based to include developing and reestablish in the air defense branch in, in our tactical formations that can transcend the threat spectrum from small swarm UAS all the way up to the, the most lethal capabilities that, that our enemies have. Thank you. Again, way more interested in non-kinetic uh, solutions to this problem that are, that are going to be able to keep up. You know, we got to counter the, if, if your enemy has a magazine depth advantage, you can have the best interceptor in the world. They only have to have one more round than, than you do. So we got to get after it from a, a kinetic and non-kinetic approach. Good morning, sir. My name's Tom Koshute. I'm with the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And thank you for being here this morning. I'm interested in your perspective on the role of academia and army transformation. Yeah. You know, what, what, are, what are some of the attributes that you would see in a good partner with, with Army Futures Command? Uh, you know, and how, how might you think that universities need to transform themselves as we go forward to be, to be able to successfully support what you're doing? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And, and Army Futures Command, I'm the Army, I'm the executive agent for the secretary in, in terms of all the funding that goes to academic institutions. So it's a big part of what we do. We take it very seriously. Uh, Dr. Baker at Army Research Lab, this gentleman over here, uh, kind of executes that for me. Um, but yeah, it's a superpower, man. Like, you know, the United States, and you know, we'll see, you know, there's always something going on in some college that pisses somebody off somewhere. But uh, generally speaking, it's a superpower, right, that we have in our country in preserving it. Uh, if you look at you know, the invention of radar. I mean, you can go back, if you're a student of history, you, you know, you can see where something started in an academic setting, transitioned into the defense industry, American industrial base, and turned into true capability. So I'm, I'm a big fan of it. It's pennies on the dollar, you know? I mean, like, it, there's some of these, these larger defense companies that, you know, if I gave them a million dollars, it'd be mildly interesting. You know, I could, I could give your university a million dollars and sponsor five students, PhDs, and get, you know what I mean? So the, the return on investment is super high. Takes, takes longer, but we're going to have problems in 30, 40. 
Um, the, a couple things to think about is uh, you got to protect technology. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not as familiar. I know we do, part, we do work with your great university, um, my contested logistics teams and, and others. But we got to protect. You know, the risk of going into a, a, an academic setting is, is you, you, risk, um, you risk tech transfer to some of our enemies different than if you're dealing with an a established defense company that has a SCIF capability. And I also, I, I wrote an article, I don't know if it's been published yet, but, but um, I, I think there's, there's an idea that, that we should start thinking about, back to my point about endurance, if we go to war, you know, we should be doing things now to set the conditions in our academic base. So if we do go to a, a no kidding war, that we'll be able to transition that. So th simple things like getting security clearances now for your best and brightest professors, and, and, and you know, if it makes sense, putting SCIF secure facilities for a small amount of money with the right university partners, we could create <clears throat> facilities would, which would give your academic, properly credentialed academic students and faculty access to a higher level of classification. There's some interesting phenomenon, like the harder the problem is, the more classified it is. <laughs> you know, like, so, so if we want academics solving the wicked hard problems, it's not open source type kind of stuff. We're gonna have to get you better access. So those are some ideas. Thank you uh, for being here. Just give Rainey a big All right, applause. thanks a lot. <laughs> Go ahead. Great job, great job. Thank you. I told you he'd come through, knocked it out of the park again. I really appreciate it, uh, Jim, just fantastic. I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but I'm awful glad we have uh, Army Futures Command working these incredibly tough problems and uh, so well partnered uh, with industry had to get the solutions and uh, help us really deter conflict because nobody would be foolish enough uh, to, to uh, start something. Uh, when you look at uh, the capabilities we have out there. So thanks, Jim, really appreciate it. And we, we have a uh, really an all-star panel next at 10.15, and, and uh, General Rainey will be back, Honorable uh, Doug Bush will be back. So 10.15, back in here, an all-star panel on transformation will continue and get into an even a little more detail. So see you back here, 10.15, and again, uh, I look forward to it. And Jim, thanks. Great job. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Hope you had a great break. Um, I'm Guy Swan, a senior fellow here at uh, AUSA. And let me just start out with uh, a personal note of thanks to General Brown and the AUSA team. I've been associated with this event for many, many years, and I have to say uh, this is the best one ever. Jack and Alex, well done. This is great. And uh, I know Alex mentioned it yesterday, but uh, AUSA can't do it without membership. Uh, many of you, I think, of, I won't ask you for, uh, to raise your hand, but I would say the vast majority of you are members, and thank you for that. Uh, if you're not a member, go to AUSA.org and please join AUSA. These events cannot occur, just simply cannot occur uh, with the, the valued uh, members of AUSA. Uh, we've got a great panel this morning, uh, kind of following on the theme of the of the conference itself, the panel Transformational Capabilities Enabling Ready Combat Formations comes right off of the theme for the, for the uh, symposium uh, and follows uh, on General Rainey's uh, keynote address earlier this morning. So uh, if you didn't get a chance to ask General Rainey questions, uh, you can do that here. Let me introduce our, our panel moderator today, uh, someone many of you know, uh, Jerry O'Keefe also a senior fellow here at AUSA. Uh, Jerry uh, served for 37 years uh, of service as a U.S. Army officer and later a Department of the Army civilian at the senior executive level. Jerry's last job in the Army was the administrative assistant to the Secretary of the Army. Many of you know that that's the, one of the principal officers in the Army headquarters at the Pentagon, uh, the senior career civilian and senior executive uh, advisor to the Secretary of the Army. 
who oversees a myriad of tasks uh, in, the, in the headquarters uh, of the department in the Pentagon, as well as a number of other programs throughout the Army. And uh, now uh, Jerry's into probably his third or fourth career serving as the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of the Civilian Marksmanship Program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jerry O'Keefe. Well, thank you, General Swan, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's always great to, to be back with AUSA and, of course, back with the Army. Um, we have an important topic this morning, and, uh, and obviously, as you can see, a great panel, as General Brown said, a panel of all-stars. Uh, and the topic is transformational capabilities enabling ready combat formations. The way this panel is going to work is, is like the others you've seen this week, is that each panelist will make some brief opening comments, um, and then I'll start the discussion and the, and the question and answer period. Um, but, but this panel is really about you and your questions, um, so we really want you to start uh, getting those ready and getting those in. And uh, the way you're going to do that is uh, the AUSA staff is going to be walking around with these uh, five by eight cards, and we'd ask you to fill out the cards and uh, get your questions submitted that way. <clears throat> um, so now to our panel. Leading our panel today is the Honorable Doug Bush. Mr. Bush is the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. He is a presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed official and a principal official of Headquarters Department of the Army. In this position, Mr. Bush serves as the Army's Acquisition Executive, the Senior Procurement Executive, the Science Advisor to the Secretary of the Army, and the Army's Senior Research and Development Official. In his role as the ASALT, Mr. Bush is responsible for both acquisition policy and through the PEOs and PMs acquisition execution. Mr. Bush also manages the Army Acquisition Corps and the Army Acquisition Workforce. Um, our next panel member, of course, you just heard from him this morning with his keynote address. Keynote address. He is, of course, the commander of Army Futures Command, headquartered in Austin, Texas, um, and responsible for transforming the Army to ensure war-winning future readiness. So, General Rainey, welcome to you. Um, interesting on this panel, we also have um, two outside representatives, who will. The, the first one is Mr. Jer Jeremy Tondreau. And he is the president of BAA Systems, Platforms, and Services. Headquartered in Falls Church, Virginia, the BAA Platforms and Services sector employs about 12,000 people around the world, and its products include tracked and wheeled armored combat vehicles, maritime and land gun systems, missile launch systems, precision guided weapons and munitions, and explosives and propellants. Jeremy's career at BAE spans nearly 30 years. And finally, we have Mr. Mac Carey. Mac is the CEO and founder of the Lexington Institute, a public policy think tank established in 1998 and based in Arlington, Virginia. The Institute runs research, press efforts, and policy forums to advance <coughs> democratic capitalism and a strong national defense. Mac is also a partner in the consulting firm Source Associates and serves on the board of the Advanced Technology Systems Company. So again, a great uh, and diverse panel uh, with senior leaders from the Army, the defense commercial <coughs> sector, and from a prominent defense think tank. And I'm sure this will give us some different and interesting perspectives on transformational capabilities. Um, so let's get started. And uh, Mr. Bush, over to you for your opening comments, please. <coughs> Thanks. Um, so apologies if my voice gives out. I'll just have General Rainey will have to do all the talking. <laughs> um, but I will, I will soldier through. Um, and I'll be brief in my remarks because I really want to get to your questions. Um, so first of all, you know, acquisitions role is part of a big Army team. You know, we're, we're not the lead effort. We're a supporting effort fundamentally, but a key one. And it does take teamwork to accomplish everything we're talking about. So I'll talk briefly about some things in the acquisition world that we've been doing to try to go faster. Uh, get to scale more quickly, and uh, including touting a few success stories that I think show the Army uh, has really changed and can do this now. So if I had two overarching messages, it would be what we're trying to do in acquisition is, first of all, focus on speed. So acquisition at speed has been my mantra since I arrived. Uh, I took that on because that was the clear demand signal from Congress. It was a clear demand signal from the Army, OSD, everyone. Um, and that's based on perception of threat. 
So we're, we're not in a place where we can um, take our time, frankly, on programs. Uh, we've got to be able to go faster. We've got to keep up with technology. We've got to keep up with our industry partners' innovation. Now, we have the tools to do that that some of my predecessors didn't, and we are uh, now fully operational with those tools. So middle-tier acquisition in particular, but also software pathway, are just uh, new avenues we have to go much faster once we have requirements and we have the funding aligned. And we're going to use those, continue to use those. I think we've been using them pretty ruthlessly. Um, they've become our default methods for getting to things quickly. Um, and then even faster than those two things is our, when we have to do it, our urgent need pathway, complemented by rapid uh, acquisition authority funding, um, which is additional reprogramming authority for supporting kind of troops in contact, troops in danger. And we've used both of those authorities recently uh, to support CENTCOM. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to do broadly uh, to just be able to keep pace with tech and make sure that acquisition isn't what's holding up uh, you know, the Army as it moves forward. So the second issue is production at scale. So you can do a lot of R&D, but ultimately, if you don't get to production and you don't get to do it at scale, it doesn't actually get any capability to anyone. So in an environment where dollars are scarce or um, you know, limited, they always are, uh, in my view, I'd much rather spend a dollar on a procurement, uh, producing something that will go to the field and be able to be used for soldiers than, uh, than R&D. We have to do R&D. We have a lot of good R&D. But this is where meeting industry with innovations you've already achieved is the best solution. Um, you know, when industry's done the innovation and we can just meet it, do some quick R&D perhaps, and go straight to production, that's when I think we're making the best use of our taxpayer dollars. So. Those two factors, acquisition seed and production scale, are my two focus areas. Let me mention a couple things just as illustrative, uh, as food for thought. So uh, first on production at scale, the one that's been talked about the most is ammunition and munitions. So since the war uh, in Ukraine started and we started supporting them, uh, we've dramatically ramped up our artillery production, uh, other types of ammunition, and then also precision munitions. We're ramping up um, Pac-3, Gimlers, HIMARS. Um, all the things that were high in demand, um, bring, even bringing back some things into production like Stinger uh, to meet the need uh, of Ukraine, but also more importantly, in a lot of ways, meet our needs to replenish more quickly and build an industrial base that is scalable quickly should a conflict arise with someone else. Um, one of the means of deterrence is our enemies, our potential enemies, knowing that we can scale up quickly, the arsenal of democracy once funded and once uh, fully supported by uh, the American people is not to be trifled with. They need to know that, but we have to show it. So you have to show that you can do production at scale quickly so they know that if they take us on, we're gonna bury them. That is always our goal when we go to war and we're trying to set the stage now to, uh, because of the conflicts we're in for the future so that we can be in a much better place to send our adversaries that message that our arsenal is ready and it can scale quickly and you won't like it. The second thing I want to talk about is a few just good acquisition programs we've done quickly, speaking of acquisition at speed. So M10 Booker, a uh, great program. We got to production in four years. That's the uh, first new Army vehicle in a long time and so far going really well with our industry partner. But it was competitive, but we still got it done really quickly. Uh, Flora. So not in production yet, but all full steam ahead um, with our aviation rebalance. Uh, we're looking forward to a milestone B uh, this summer, and uh, we are lining things up for that, and we want to move quickly. Uh, integrated Battle Command System, IBCS. So a little bit of a quiet but super big deal success story. People talk about JADC2 and connecting dots and doing data warfare. IBCS is data warfare in the air defense sector. It allows any sensor to connect to any shooter. Over time, we're going to bring in more capabilities but this is the future, and it brings tremendous additional capability to our already superb air defense weapons we have. Um, we've also done some things kind of off program of record. One uh, that you may have heard about, uh, the Coyote Interceptor. Um, it's a critical counter UAS capability uh, in saving lives in CENTCOM right now. We've got some others, but Coyote we did really is an urgent need. Got to do it kind of off, not off the books, but off the normal process working with the uh, JCO at OSD. Um, and in the Army, and got that deployed, and it's a good thing we did, because uh, we've, been, we've been in contact with UAS uh, with, uh, across the Middle East for many years, um, but luckily we had done that work, and we are now ramping that production up. 
So that's a non-program of record that we've also been able to do quickly. A couple of final two things to mention in terms of what's critical to speed. The first is a software pathway. So people talk a lot about middle tier acquisition, rapid prototyping, rapid fielding, which we're doing more every day. But the new software <coughs> pathway in some ways is more radical, and allows us to go even faster. So here we, this pathway combined with our new software policy, uh, we are trying to fundamentally change how we do software and meet industry where it, how it does it. So um, software is in all of our platforms now. Uh, we are going to use this pathway inside hardware programs to do the software uh, faster and, um, and in a way that's more approachable and more appropriate to doing software. But that's a huge effort. The last one I'll mention is contracting. So it doesn't get as much attention, but uh, industry knows that you know, ultimately you can have budgets, you can have requirements, you can have acquisition programs, but until you have a contract, the US government, we cannot, we cannot give you money uh, to do things for us. So rapid contracting is a focus. We've gotten reforms from Congress tied to Ukraine replenishment that I want to work with Congress just to make the standard to go much faster. And we've used that to dr go dramatically fast on getting replenishment contracts for Ukraine. You know, we're, we're up at around 18 billion now in replenishment contracts. So, and we did them at uh, really light speed compared to normal. Now we want to take that approach and just move it across the board. Um, so uh, since my voice is giving out on me, I will stop there and let my colleagues talk. But that's a few things as food for thought. Um, that I keep pounding on is acquisition speed, production of scale, and we want to work with industry to achieve those things because you know how to do both of those. And uh, we have to rely on industry innovation uh, like we are right now uh, to get those things done for the American people. Thanks. Thank you. General Rainey. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and thanks to AUSA. Thank you, Honorable Bush, for letting me be on the panel with you. Um, and obviously, you know, AFC and, and, and ASOL uh, see things the same way. And, you know, I, I really appreciate your leadership and approach. You know, and first conversation we had is we're either both going to win or we're both going to lose. <laughs> we're in this together. So uh, I appreciate that teamwork. And I think it transcends down to the PMs and the CFTs and, and even in TRADOC with our great CEO guys, or <clears throat> COE folks. So I think we got the team set, which is always the most important thing. But we do have some hard work um, just to be tangible and try and have recommendations. So I, I agree with, with uh, Honorable Bush. It's all about speed. You know, we don't, we don't have a technology problem. We got a tech adoption problem. Uh, the chief has ta challenged us to, to be better next year than we are this year. We have to transform and contact, go fast. Um, <clears throat> you know, we don't get to pick the time that we send men and women to war next. So, you know, the sense of urgency that we all share, I think, is, is critical. But uh, I'll offer six things with a little to show you we're synced up. There's a lot of overlap. Starts with AFC. Um, <clears throat> we're accountable for writing requirements for the chief who approves them, and they move over to, to be uh, acquired by our great acquisition professionals. So we need to move to capability-based requirements. <clears throat> And we're doing that. I'll give you a couple examples. The characteristic of need statements that we that we started the XM30 program. You know, what characteristics are we looking for? That start there, and industry will will, will deliver. I think <clears throat> that's another program that's in great shape and absolutely critical. Um, the BAA, the open BAA for our approach to the next generation command and control system I talked to, if you're not familiar with that, you know, it's an attempt to, to tell industry the, the things we are looking for in terms of our network as opposed to being overly prescriptive. <clears throat> um, and, and there's a couple other examples. So uh, UAS, we don't want to buy a UAV. We want to buy a UAV, UAS capability at Echelon. So our company commanders need 24 hours worth of a tritable UAS that has configurable payloads, right? That may be one UAV, it may be 10. We want to tell you what the capability we're looking for, and I think that unleashes the power of industry better. It also, <clears throat> you know, we have the PMs helping us write good requirements, just like, just like the requirement owners are useful in the process. 
fiscal agility. We got to get, you know, whether we have enough money or not, it's not my, not my place to say. Um, but the money we do have, we got to be able to move faster and, and go into portfolio based, capability based funding is something that the chief and the secretary and the under and Mr. Bush and I are all working on. Um, to be able to have more, the world's just changing too fast and being as agile as we can below threshold, above threshold. And I think Congress, you know, they, it, they have to extend that to us and we owe them accountability. But that's the second one. Um, Mr. Bush talked about new acquisition approaches. You know, we, we have the authorities, we're bringing them to bear, we're learning. Um, but agile acquisition, I think that the, my compliments to Mr. Bush and his team. Uh, the under talked about as a service capability. I would just say from, from our vision of the next generation command and control that the infrastructure, the default should be as a service. Why, why buy technology? We want high refresh rates to make sure we have the best capabilities. Uh, contracting, I agree. I, I, we, the men and women that do contracting are, are heroes. I mean, the, the, it is not a question of the talent of the people. It's how many do we have? How much are we asking them to do? Um, I think you used the Ukraine example as proof that we can go as fast as we need to. I would, I would offer warp speed as another un, untold mm -hmm. story about the heroes in Army contracting business when the country needed them. They, they delivered, so, but we gotta go fast. No matter how fast you're going, the acquisition process, you can't have a nine month air bubble in the middle to deliver a, a contract. <clears throat> but again, it's not a talent of people, it's quantity and prioritization. Testing is another one. We need to be as innovative in our testing enterprise, and Jake Gallivan at ATEC and his team, best guy we've ever had do that job, phenomenal. But we gotta pay the, the cost to make sure we modernize our testing enterprise, get into more analytics. We can't afford to buy threat replication for testing and a whole nother set of threat replication for the National Training Center and places like that. So that's a place where there's lots of opportunities. Um, you, you know, the, the threat replication of threat UAVs, I think the best people to do that are the best UAS companies in the United States, you know, and we need people helping us with that. And there's a lot of, com a lot of cases where some companies have better access to that threat capability than, than we do to deliver that. So testing, testing to yes, not testing to no. <coughs> um, one of my concerns, I won't let it happen, but one of the things we pay attention to is we can't test robots like tanks, you know? I mean, there's a reason there's nobody in them. It, you know, we care dearly about the safety of the tank crew. I do not care about the crew of a robot. You know, it's unmanned for a reason. So we gotta, you know, we can't buy, we can't test software like we test chemical protective kit. You know, we gotta get more agile in our testing. And the last one, I'll just throw this out. I do not have a solution to this, but to our great industry teammates, um, the, we need to reimagine the role of integrators. Um, you know, on one hand, it's not something that, that we would wanna do ourselves in the Army, but the standard uh, use of an integrator where the Army loses agency in the downstream decisions, um, I don't think is gonna keep up with the speed of technology, the speed of uh, change in the character of war. So companies that can pull together a team of the best companies and lead that team in a way that, the, that Mr. Bush and the requirement owners uh, still maintain agency, but we get the best of multiple companies instead of getting into a vendor lock or getting into an integration type situation where they're making business decisions on best companies versus us who may very well be willing to pay more for a significantly better capability somewhere in the enterprise. So those, real quick, those are six things that I think are tangible opportunities that we can all work together, close the acquisition kill chain a little better and, and make sure whenever the next time we go to war, you know, that, that we've done everything we can to make sure our great men and women have every advantage they possibly could have. Thank you. Thank you, General Rainey. Jeremy? Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having us, and Mr. Bush, thanks for inviting me to the panel. Glad to uh, you know, glad to be here, and uh, thanks to AUSA for putting on uh, a great event here in uh, in Huntsville this week. Uh, just great to be here. Um, so I've got probably two two messages uh, to open up with, uh, but really interested in getting into the the questions and discussion and and dialogue that's yet to come. 
Uh, so sort of trying to serve the role here of offering a bit of an industry perspective. Um, so, so one is just the importance of the, the partnership between the Army uh, and industry. And, you know, I think um, actually the fact that we're here on this panel is a good sort of uh, visual symbol of, I think, the partnership that we, uh, we are fostering and that we, as that we aspire to uh, between requirements, uh, programs, and, uh, and industry. And, you know, from industry's perspective, there's a, there's a couple things that, you know, that we are really looking for uh, in, in that partnership. And, uh, and one of them is uh, transparency of, of requirements uh, and transparency of resourcing. So where, you know, where is the future of, of the Army focused from a requirements perspective? We obviously want to contribute to that conversation and influence, uh, but we also want to hear back uh, from Army Futures Command and, and other parts within the Army around, you know, what, what are the future requirements priorities? Uh, and obviously everything costs money, and so at some point it comes down to resourcing and what are those, you know, resourcing priorities. And then what, what we really do with that as an industry is, you know, that shapes what we invest in. So all of us in industry have a certain capacity to kind of reinvest in, you know, whether it's technology that could uh, provide choices for the Army on the next generation weapon system, you know, or whether it's our own industrial base to be able to perform on programs more effectively in the future uh, and modernize, you know, from that, you know, from that perspective. And so the more transparent we are in this partnership in the kind of early phases, the more likely industry is going to be able to make their investments useful to the Army, you know, by actually having them aligned with, uh, aligned with the Army's priorities. So I think uh, conversations like this and, and all of the engagements, you know, that we have at, at a variety of levels help to help to fuel that. And, and that's just in the end what we do with that information as an industry is try to focus on, you know, investing in the things that ultimately the Army would use, um, which, uh, which is what makes them useful. Um, and I think that that comes at a couple different levels. One, you know, maybe at the senior level where we're talking about, you know, things like, you know, what comes out of the, uh, the fire study in terms of requirements, priorities, what comes out of the budget, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, funding priorities. But I think it also comes out in how we collaborate together um, at the um, tactical level. You know, things like project convergence uh, or, or just in the way we run our programs. Uh, I, the best, some of the best innovations that I have seen in my, uh, my time in industry have been when we have our best soldiers from the Army and our best engineers from industry, you know, out at a test range or in an integration lab you know, collaborating together on, you know, what's the best way to bring um, technology to bear to help solve a war fighting problem. And that finding, finding ways where we can foster those soldier touch points uh, in a truly collaborative way where it can be sort of open to different ways of solving those problems, I think helps us, uh, helps us bring uh, technology to bear in a, in, in a better way uh, to solve real war fighting problems. So I think those are a couple of different ways that uh, I, I think are really important from a uh, from a partnership perspective between the army uh, between the army and industry. Uh, sec second point I would make just in these opening remarks, just from an industry perspective, you know, when we sort of look at the challenge space of the whether it's the army of 2030 or the army of 2040, whatever time horizon you want to pick, um, you've you've got sort of three three main challenges at least from my my foxhole. Um, you know, so one is, you know, how do we make sure our soldiers have the technology overmatch so that, you know, they're never in a fair fight, so that w whatever, whatever adversary they face around the world, now or in the future, you know, we've got, we've got better technology than, uh, than the bad guys. Um, and so, so that's one challenge. I think one of the things we're seeing lessons learned out of Ukraine is, boy, artillery, <laughs> scale, mass, um, you know, munitions, that still really matters. Um, and some of the things that Mr. Bush, you just spoke about in terms of, you know, what we're sort of going through as a, a sort of a generational uh, uh, ramp up of surge capacity for those things, uh, not just to support the needs of today, but also to show those who might want to challenge us in the future that, um, that we have that capacity and we can, you know, we can scale. And so how do we get sort of technology overmatch? How do we get scale and mass overmatch within the realities of a budget? 
uh, and the realities of what, what fits and doesn't fit you know, inside of still a really big budget, but it is not an unlimited budget. Um, and I think that there's still room for industry and, and the Army to partner more on how do we get technology overmatched where you need it, how do you get scale overmatched where you need it, but then how do you also have creative ways to, you know, to bring maybe a, a, a mixed fleet of platforms and systems, high-end, low-end mixes, uh, to be able to also make it affordable across the full range of, of missions that the, uh, the Army's charged with. Uh, so to me, those are some of the, the real interesting challenges, I think, as a community we need to, uh, we need to focus on. But thanks for having me. Look forward, to, uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Mac. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Today, the United States and the U.S. Army are once again positioning for a two-front war, as we did in the Spanish-American War, World War II, and during the Cold War. The U.S. is the chief outside architect of the assistance to Ukraine as it battles Russia, while we and our friends in Asia prepare for what many believe will be an inevitable clash of arms with China. Otto von Bismarck's guiding strategy for the 19th century German Empire was to avoid a two-front war, but America seems to keep finding them. We could even get drawn into a three-front war if the gloves come off between Israel and Iran in the Middle East. While some think the U.S. Army should not be a big player in the Western Pacific, we know from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam how quickly our land component will be essential in what initially looks like a naval or air power campaign. The Army's big six modernization efforts are already flowing into the Pacific Basin. Long-range fires, medium lift, and air defense place the U.S. Army in the Pacific sweet spot. Those missions are enormously needed. The new Army tilt rotors long range and flexibility will make it invaluable in both the first and second island chains in Westpac. Land-based air defense is essential in a limited land geography environment as are long range fires. You cannot sink an island. Hmm. Army modernization and transformation are also helping our friends and allies overseas. Just when you thought insurgents and terrorists might be receding into the past, Gaza has exploded on the world scene to pull us back into a type of land conflict like those early in the 21st century. Israel aligns nicely with U.S. Army modernization efforts as the IDF, ne IDF needs to be more connected on the battlefield. The U.S. Army's efforts are great timing for the Jewish state. The Israeli Army has always been a few steps behind their Air Force. Israeli land power is now catching up with similar requirements for precision fires, future vertical lift, and being connected in the network. Israel has a small defense force, and it has to be connected. However, Israel has been moving faster than America on ground combat vehicles, with better situational awareness and active protective systems. The U.S. Army has benefited from that. The Israeli situational awareness is being imported to America for ground combat vehicles. Israeli developed advanced aviation helmets, have adapted software and digital capabilities for building a sensor net around a ground combat vehicle. The U.S. Army is experimenting with that. Russia, of course, is the perfect foil or forcing function for U.S. Army modernization. And Ukraine is the early warning laboratory. Armor, artillery battles, air defense, commercial and military networks, and sophisticated ISR and deep sensing are all front and center in Ukraine. And they are all nested in Army modernization and Army transformation. U.S. Army systems have once again proven to be the world's best in a nose-to-nose -nose fight. Even the OSD Office of Technology and Assessment has had to admit that. <laughs> the pattern of war fighting in Ukraine is validating the Army's six-point plan. And our frontline allies like Poland are piggybacking nicely on Army modernization with large American armor and air defense purchases. Poland will also be conveniently interoperable with U.S. Army formations that are forward deployed or on their way to Europe in a crisis. 
Poland has even built tank and high Mars service centers in country. For the West, two of the most pro-American nations on Earth, Great Britain and the Netherlands, are already nosing around the Army's V-280 tilt rotor for potential foreign sales, giving the U.S. Army yet another potential force multiplier in Europe. None of this has been easy. Things do not always happen fast or run smoothly in a large organization like the U.S. Army. But if you want high-quality control, especially for warfighting systems and intercontinental logistics, those things take time and they cost money. Likewise, our decentralized political system with myriad power centers and endless elections keep the ground shifting underneath the feet of anyone trying to pull off something as complicated as Army transformation. But Army leadership through both the Trump and Biden administrations is, against all odds, pulling off an ambitious plan. And it is bearing impressive fruit for our soldiers and for our allies. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so again, please uh, go ahead and get your questions in. We've got about a half a dozen of them so far, but uh, you know, more is better. So I think I'd, I'd like to start this off in a little bit of a different way. Over the, over the past day and a half, you know, we've heard a lot from us, from the Army, about, about transformation. Um, and so, Mac, you, you, I think I'll start with you, actually. And, you know, you, you covered some of this in your opening comments, but how do the think tanks think about what the Army is proposing in terms of its uh, transformational modernization plan? And, and also, you know, how do you think Capitol Hill is, is viewing it? Uh, for the most part, it's very positive. I would say uh, I heard from an uh, Army-oriented consultant recently that in 30 years, this is the smoothest he's ever seen Hill relations uh, between the Army and Capitol Hill. I think it's a lot about communications. It's a lot about early warning. Uh, but it's also about having a consistent plan over, actually very impressively, over two different administrations that is held together uh, through thick and thin, for the most part, uh, and people see it working. Um, it's amazing to me that, for instance, the cancellation of the uh, new scout of Farah did not receive a huge amount of pushback uh, out in the political community, uh, similar with uh, the cancellation of Arca, uh, Urca, pardon me. And uh, I think that's just because the Army is uh, really working the political system in the Hill very well. On the, I wouldn't say small, but a couple negative areas, you do hear criticism. There's real worry about counter UAS. There's real worry about drone, drone production, more drone production. You hear people out in the think tank saying, the future is now. We need to get to counter UAS. We need to just take chances, do more on counter UAS faster. You do hear complaints about uh, the industrial base. But it's obvious that uh, both the public and the private sector industrial base are doing everything they can in a full employment economy, an economy with labor shortages, materiel shortages. And uh, we are building a uh, military right now for deterrence. Uh, we are not building, except for maybe 155s, we are not building a military right now to fight a war. Uh, if we're going to have to fight a war, we're going to need a lot bigger industrial base. We're going to need a lot more central planning. And as of right now, we just have not reached that stage. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other comments from uh, any of the panelists on that? Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to provide sort of an industry, industry perspective to that, you know, to that question. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of real positives here in terms of, you know, Army modernization. I, I think um, there's been a lot of a clarity of, uh, of priorities and requirements. Um, it's also been sort of clear, I think, from the outset to industry that, you know, there's a level of experimentation that's expected in this process and that, uh, you know, some of these things are going to uh, go all the way and some of them are not, and that's okay. Um, and I think that's, um, that's been pretty clear. Uh, you, you know, the, the thing that I would offer is it, it still isn't quite clear from an industry perspective just how all of this solves uh, within the budget. Uh, and so, you know, we think that there's a place, there's surely a place for uh, some of the high-end systems and high-end platforms uh, that the Army and industry are, you know, are developing, are developing together 
Uh, we surely want to make sure that we have a kind of technological overmatch, as I mentioned before, for, you know, for our soldiers. Uh, but are those going to be the answer for every, uh, for every role? Um, and it makes me think of like when the Air Force faced this a number of years ago, well, decades ago, um, with sort of the F-22, which was a great high-end, you know, high-end system, uh, but not actually affordable across the whole fleet. And you needed, to, you still needed your F-16s. You still needed that sort of um, affordable, versatile, um, you know, multi-role kind of platform. And you ended up in more of a mixed, uh, kind of mixed fleet to get to get what you needed where you needed it, but at a at an affordable price tag across uh, across the fleet. And, and we think this is where the, the Army's focus on things like digital engineering and, and modular open system architecture um, and that kind of partnership with industry can really make a difference. Because uh, there's obviously there's an existing suite of platforms and capabilities that the Army has today. And, and many of those with the right sort of most aware it matters uh, focus can become uh, a less expensive, uh, faster way uh, to get new capabilities into the fleet uh, in compared to, you know, an exquisite new thing. So I think getting the balance right between, you know, where do we need a new thing um, and, you know, where is it better to, to really lean in on digital engineering, modular open systems architecture and, you know, make modifications to uh, some of the capabilities we already have to get the right balance of affordability across the fleet, but uh, the right capabilities into the hands of, of soldiers for the whole suite of missions uh, that they're tasked with delivering. Thank you. So let's um, let's take that a, a little further. And uh, you know, Jen Rainey's uh, capstone uh, remarks uh, or opening remarks. Uh, you know, uh, really a, a pretty comprehensive list of uh, technology, systems, programs, capabilities. All of it's uh, expensive, um, and you talked about requirements a little bit. So, so how is the 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 Army Futures Command and, and then the department um, prioritizing um, all of those resourcing requirements in a, in a budget that is, you know, is somewhat constrained. Yeah, well, the, uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I didn't get the safety brief on the microphone. The, uh, yeah, well, you know, we, we've had modernization priorities. I think, I think it's one of the strengths one of the reasons our, I think Army, especially in the deliberate transformation space, you know, two to seven years fight up, I think we're doing incredibly well. And I think one of the reasons is uh, we got that about right and the current uh, leadership of the Army stayed with it. So um, the six modernization priorities haven't changed. The chief moved the network to one. So we we moved within the six, but we've had continuity for five, I'm probably going on six years now. And we have signature modernization efforts um, that we haven't fundamentally changed significantly. Um, in fact, you know, if you're an optimist, the biggest problem we got is more of the stuff is working on pace than we have money for. So that's a good problem to have, in my opinion. That's better than the other problem of having money and none of your stuff working. So, uh, you know, people are going to have to make hard choices. You know, and and I I personally think that if we if we make a compelling argument and industry delivers really good equipment, um, I think the money will be there. I hope the money's there before we go to war. I'm certain that if we go to war, the money will be there. So we're not wasting yeah. energy. I think if any fiscal disruption happens it might slow a program down i don't i don't think we're going to walk away from game changing capability just because of the, you know one year's budget over the other but it's tough choices but i'll, I'll let mr bush go next maybe you can talk about sure. um, also the uh, the the palm process the peg process um, the undersecretary yesterday talked about um, and general randy did too that, that you know, some of the problems here are, are kind of the Army enterprise processes not being agile enough. And so are those being transformed as well uh, to I mean, be able to meet the needs? Well, inside the Army, in terms of how we manage our budget, we don't have an agility problem. We've got a money problem. Okay, so I, you know, you can torture yourself over your processes all, as much as you want, but fundamentally you need the resources and you need good judgment among leaders, and we have that right now. Um, to make the right calls on the tough calls like General Rainey was talking about. 
So a couple of things. First on Congress, that has been a conscious effort, absolutely, to uh, be more transparent, open, truthful, you know, kind of always over there talking and always with the, uh, hopefully the similar message, um, but also telling them when things aren't going well. Uh, they, under our system, you know, decide when and, when and how much of the American people's uh, money we get. So uh, we have to respect that, and we have been. And I think that transparency and um, honesty and openness has been rewarded. If you look at where we started with some of the 24 marks, for example, in the two bills, almost across the board, they walked them back because um, we came with a better story. We filled in holes they had in their whatever information they were looking for. That takes a lot of work. Um, good folks, that uh, the uh, people do that all the time, but also leaders. So General Rainey and I, among many others. So the thing with Congress, we want to absolutely keep that going because we have to earn those dollars because Congress has a lot of things on its plate. Um, as far as priorities, I think you can look at our current plan. It was originally envisioned. It's kind of front-loaded with uh, network, air missile defense, and long-range fires, and that was on purpose. That was uh, based on um, the belief that those areas uh, were the most critical and we were furthest behind, so that's where we had the most risk. So we continue with that plan, and if you look at our 25 budget, I think you see it, it's starting to, though, buy out a lot of those uh, initial efforts if you look at the out years. So one question we are facing, and I think the thought was always at some point we have to um, transition to kind of wave two, which is right now, if you look at where things are, it's going to be new ground vehicles, new aircraft, and now added to that mix, um, Intel systems, UAS, counter UAS. So kind of wave two is what we're working through in terms of what we can afford to do, how fast, and what the priorities are. But the fundamental priorities haven't shifted. Um, I, I do think that we are showing, and it's, it's good, you, you don't want a plan that's completely inflexible. So the fact that we are working through, learning from the conflicts we're seeing, and uh, professionals like General Rainey and his folks are watching these things closely, you know, uh, figuring out what's real, what's not. You can talk yourself into a lot just watching YouTube about what war is, but um, professionals have to see through that fog and actually help us understand where we have to put our dollars, and that's happening. So, for example, the new emphasis uh, on UAS at all echelons, absolutely, based on learning. Counter UAS, we've been doing a lot, by the way. Um, point taken, Mac, on, um, you know, uh, doing that broadly, um, really CENTCOM has been the focus, but now obviously we have to do it everywhere. And at greater scale. Um, I think, uh, but I think we've laid the groundwork for success, and General Rainey's positioned us with flexible requirements that we can move quickly on. And it is just a question of realigning resources where it's important. But uh, this chief and this secretary are not shy about doing that. Um, and. Uh, they get the hardest problems and they make the hardest decisions, but um, they've both done, I think, a great job uh, taking on the hard things and moving us to new things when we need to. And that's what you want from your leaders. And General Rainey and I, as part of the Army team, you know, sometimes feel like we're having trouble keeping up. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's our job. We're awesome staff officers, or we aspire to be, um, <laughs> for, for our chief and secretary. Um, so, yeah, so industry, last thing, uh, when we're changing our plans, that transparency I know is very important for all the points Mr. Tondro made, uh, please keep coming to us with questions. We will do our very best to answer them and give you that kind of forward look. Um, and when we don't have a definitive answer on something, we will be honest and say, we don't know yet, but here's the range of things we're looking at, um, rather than kind of making it like we have a perfect master plan. Yeah, well, we don't. Uh, but we've got a really good plan that is flexible in the right ways, and we still need industry, though, at the end of the day, to deliver for us. Of course. Thank you. So the, the next question is for uh, General Rainey, and it's actually two questions that, I, that are different but I think are related. And the uh, first one is uh, from one of our NATO partners, and so obviously we're not the only country that's looking at technology and transforming, and so the question is how does Futures Command use knowledge and developmental efforts uh, um, and integrate that from, from what other allied countries are doing. How do we learn from them and integrate that? And then the, the other question is about Ukraine. Obviously, a lot of lessons observed and learned there. And, um, but the question is, are, are, are you concerned that we're too focused on the Ukraine uh, and what's going on there? And are we going too far and too fast? Yeah, um, the, uh, on the partner thing, 
uh, you know, we're you know, a, a, an existential large scale combat. You know, if you think pick a pick one of our enemies, there's not going to be any sitting that out. You know, I mean, everybody's going to be in, and we're going to need all the great partners and allies. Um, you know, alliances, partnerships, people that are on the fence are going to have to, you know, I, th I think we'll have to rapidly integrate people who decide to join the cause of good. Um, in experimentation, which is what AFC, so real world ops is one problem, training is another problem. There's a huge opportunity in experimentation because, you, you know, we, we don't have the, the drama around sharing information at the scale you do in a real world operation if you're doing an experiment. You know, we, we ran an open unclassified network experiment that was easy to integrate. So Five Eyes, great all in, but also Japan, South Korea, other partners have joined us. So I think there's a real opportunity through the Project Convergence series and our Wargaming series to make sure we're learning, not just sharing with our partners, but genuinely learning with us. Some of the best thinking is, is happening uh, in places that are not the United States, so we have a responsibility. You know, we have a moral responsibility on the Ukraine, Gaza, I mean, horrific, tragic events. Warfare is horrible. Um, I, I think we have a moral responsibility to, to learn and observe everything we can. Um, I wouldn't say we're over-focused on Ukraine. I, I, I think that people need to look at Ukraine and say, okay, that's interesting. Is that unique to Ukraine fighting Russia in an artificially, you know, in, in, a, in a small geographically constrained environment? Or is that something that is absolutely a major disruption to the character of war that we need to be ready because that's gonna happen the next time we fight somewhere? And I think, uh, you know, Tradox had lesson learned collection around Ukraine be since before the Russians there. We're pretty good at it. We pay attention to it. But I think observing things, thinking about them, and figuring out what's a disruption of the character war and what's an anomaly uh, will help us make better, better decisions. I mean, the, the disruption in the air ground littoral, which is an entirely new phenomenon, that's, that's the observation, not a specific UAV type kind of thing, you know, so make sure we're learning the right things. We're going to have to deal with that in the future. I personally think that two years from now, we'll be talking about ground autonomy, right? I think what we're really seeing is the leading edge, this air, it's easier in the air, but it's coming closer and closer to the earth. The disruption that happened 20 years ago in the air domain, 10 years ago in the maritime domain is coming to the ground domain and who figures that out first. Um, and then all things with data-centric warfare that, that we're seeing are gonna be things that we need to capitalize on. So the answer is both. Okay, thank you. And, and well, by the way, the amount of learning that's happening out, what U US Army Pacific is doing in the, you know, winning the pre-conflict phase deterrence, I, I think that is, is incredibly fascinating and something that everybody should be paying attention to. How you can deter an enemy by aggressively campaigning and building partnerships with land forces. Um, you know, every, every service matters in the joint force, but if you're talking about deterrence, the way you deter people is with an army. And General Flynn's led a masterful effort out there that we should absolutely be learning from also. Thank you. So staying on the theme of Ukraine, Jeremy, how is industry thinking about U.S. Army modernization and replenishment requirements around munitions given the lessons learned from the conflict in Ukraine? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, Mr. Bush mentioned this already, but I think we're going through, uh, industry is going through a, a once in a maybe generation uh, scale up, particularly of uh, artillery, 155 shells, probably the most pronounced, but uh, a number of different uh, munition, munition types uh, around the Army and, and around the industry. Uh, I, I think the one that I know the most about is, is more the artillery 155 ramp, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that perspective. Uh, going from where we were to where uh, where we're headed, um, you know, over the last year or two, and over the over the next year or two, is uh, it's a 10x or so increase in uh, in industrial base capacity uh, for for 155 shells for artillery, and you know that that is an extraordinary thing to do uh, across you know across a two or three or four year 
you know, span of time. I, I think this is this is a place where we are, in fact, showing that you know when we need to, we can we can line up between industry, uh, the army, um, our partners in Congress, uh, to make to to make some really hard things you know really hard things happen. Um, and, and I would focus on maybe two aspects of this. You know, uh, one of it's just people. Uh, being able to do, you know, if you think about what goes into some of these munitions uh, from the you know, metal bodies, the chemicals, you know, all of those things, this is difficult uh, things to do. Uh, and it's also a, you know, pretty, like lots of things, a pretty complex, you know, pretty complex supply chain uh, that has, you know, industry components in it, has, you know, government owned uh, facil facilities that are components to it that all have to kind of come, you know, sort of come together. Uh, and so I, I think making sure that when we go through these kind of surges that we're being very mindful about workforce uh, training, development of, of people to be able to not just do this at, at capacity, but to be able to do it safely. Uh, if you think about what, what it is that we're, uh, we're being asked to produce at, at what scale. Uh, the other part, I think it's, an, it's another interesting twist on the theme of modernization. Mostly when we talk modernization, I think we talk uh, weapon systems, platforms, um, autonomy, uh, you know, data-centric warfare. Uh, but I think there's also a role uh, or a, a theme here around modernization of the industrial base. Uh, and you know, this, the, in particular, this ramp up here, we're taking some elements of the industrial base that are, are as they were when they were built in, to support World War II. And we're modernizing from that you know, kind of starting point to, to something better. Uh, so I think it's, it's important that we not just do this capacity ramp up, uh, in, again, in partnership between industry and the Army, but again, this is a once in a generation sort of opportunity to uh, leave it with an industrial base uh, that's in a much stronger position for many, many years to come. So I think this is, this is one of these opportunities to make sure we don't just um, do it to produce what's needed right away, but we do it in a way uh, that leaves a, a stronger public and private uh, industrial base that can you know, act as a deterrent, that can act as uh, sort of a show of force to those around the world that wonder uh, if we still have the capacity in the industrial base to be the arsenal of democracy. I think here you've got a chance to show that, uh, and I think we are showing uh, that we do. Thank you. So, so Mac, uh, everything we've talked about here in this panel and uh, over the past day and a half um, is really complex, right? So the, the technologies, integrating them into formations, integrating them into formations at the scale, the massive scale of the United States Army Active Guard and Reserve. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not a trivial problem. So can an organization as big as the Army ever actually move fast on technology and modernization? And what are, what are the downside implications if, uh, if they cannot? Well, I'm not sure. I don't think it would be a good idea <clears throat> if the, uh, in peacetime if the Army moved all that much faster than it is. I think the CFTs are great. I think AFC is working well, and the bridge to ASALT is all working well and speeding things up. But uh, if we want quality control, and if we want to make sure the uh, weapons land where they're supposed to land, uh, we want to do this very deliberately and uh, very systematically. And the Army and the U.S. military are gigantic organizations. Um, so I would, I would say if there is a war, so for instance, the decisions on what was going to Ukraine until about a year ago were being made in the Oval Office. When that happens, things happen fast. <laughs> if, there's, if there's a war going on, uh, then these things are going to happen a lot faster. If you're in a situation like Vietnam where 200 guys are getting killed every day, uh, things are going to happen a lot faster. But I don't think that in our current circumstances uh, we want to rush too much because geopolitical situation can change fast, like Gaza. Um, uh, China could collapse. China's political and, eco and economic system co could collapse, as some people think. Things can change fast. And we don't want to be cutting our way through the jungle and not have any uh, trail back behind us. I will say this, though, on the issue of partners and foreign military sales. Uh, the United States is the exact opposite of China. 
we have something like 35 legal allies. And these are countries that actually like us. China has one ally, and it's North Korea, and it's more of a client state than it is an ally. <laughs> Our allies right now are howling in pain. There appears to be an infinite demand for American aerospace and defense products. And our best friends can't get to the front of the line. And it's obvious that Ukraine or Taiwan or Israel need things faster. Uh, but we've got a lot of friends now who just uh, are, are uh, hurting. They are hurting because they can't replenish their stocks. In many cases, it's countries that dumped 40% of their military into Ukraine or their military equipment into Ukraine. But I'm not sure there's really an answer to that. I mean, we are, we are tapped out. And uh, we've got a labor shortage. We've got 8.8 .8 million job openings in this country, 3.5% unemployment. I, I'm not quite sure what that answer would be. And I think the Army's doing better than the other services on foreign military sales. Uh, to quote Doug Bush in another context, uh, we're using brute force and lots of travel uh, <laughs> to make this happen. But uh, I, I'm just not sure there's a real answer to that. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, General Rainey, this morning you, you mentioned that, you know, innovation best happens at the lowest level, at the point of the spear. Um, so, kind of two questions. Um, you know, from, from my days in the Army, which are a little bit dated now, um, it always seemed like it was hard to, hard to see that, hard for those lessons to kind of get through the bureaucracy to, the, to where a decision maker can actually act on it. Um, so, from that perspective of, you know, experiment, experimentation and testing, um, you know, how does the Army solve that problem? And kind of with that, um, you know, you just completed Project Converg Convergence, a joint and multinational two-phased experiment that uh, just concluded on 20 March. So what were your biggest takeaways from the experiment, and how will that impact, you know, future priorities and efforts? Um, yeah, the innovation in the force, you know, it's, it, Americans are innovative. You know, by nature, the problem solvers, um, and you know, ninety something percent of the energy in a in a force comm unit should be about generating readiness to go to war tonight with the stuff they have. But where they have some capacity, there's some really interesting stuff happening, um, and we're very well tied into that. Uh, Lieutenant General Dave Hodney is one of my deputies. Runs a you know, the, the last thing we want to do to innovation is put a council of colonels and a couple of gossips in between it. If you want to kill it, that would be my recommendation. But we actually want to incentivize it. But what, what we're working real hard in General Pappas at Forcecom and his whole team at Echelon, if the, op, if the operating force is trying to solve a problem and Mr. Bush and my teams are not, that's a problem. The other is also true. A lot of the problems they're trying to solve were actually solved or, all, or are solving. So we don't want them out there innovating when, when some PM is six months away from delivering the, the, the problem. So we got to stay stitched up in a way that doesn't kill it. You know, don't, don't pet and Lenny's rabbit. You know, we don't want to kill the thing. But, but, uh, but we do uh, want our operating force focused on readiness and it, TRADOC, AFC, ASALT Enterprises doing the institutional backside. Uh, Project Convergence is, is fascinating. Um, the, the amount of technology that is available right now that's not in the hands of our soldiers is, is what motivates me to, to go faster. The big takeaways, the no-brainer is it's 100% about the network. If, if we don't fix the network, and we don't pivot to data-centric warfare, anything else we're talking about doesn't matter. And at the same time, uh, the opportunity to speed up by, you know, Rick, like, so if you walk around, this is some, just is an example, but you go out to Project Convergence, you go out to the floor, you see all this great capability, but every vendor is trying to solve their own, they're doing their own software solution, they're doing their own controllers. So the ability to move to centralized standards hmm. will unleash the power and productivity of industry. You know, we want a UAV, a loitering munition, a robot person to be able to come in and, and just connect to our data-centric system. So that was probably my biggest. And then, um, 
you know, the signature modernization, so the signature modernization efforts are on track and doing well. So when we talk about HMI or next generation C2, that's about capitalizing on the opportunities, not to replace the emphasis on the deliberate modernization. But I'm telling you, the ability to offload risk onto machines in a way that you know, we do not want to trade blood for first contact. I'm super passionate about that. We did the first ever battalion size live fire with humans and machines. And it was PMs, PEOs, it's TRADOCs, Centers of Excellence, it's, it's our CFTs. Um, I, I just really came out of Project Convergence thinking that we could, you know, I agree with you, speed you know, speed kills in the positive and negative way, right? So it's more about tempo but I don't think we can go fast enough on autonomous and robotic integration, not to replace our humans, but to optimize them. So those are the two big ones probably. Thank you. So um, bringing it back up to uh, a strategic level. Um, so continuing the resolutions and delayed defense budgets have become pretty much standard in the norm. Um, we're in a general election year. Um, it's typically the norm in, in those kinds of years as well. Um, so for, for Mr. Bush, you know, so what is, what is the impact uh, from all this to the Army's development and delivery of critical capabilities to soldiers? <coughs> and then maybe Jeremy can follow on and, you know, how does, how does that impact uh, the defense sector? Sure. So, I mean, and by the way, I mean, Congress knows this, okay? So I'm not revealing anything they don't know. Um, and there are many, many, many members who do work really hard every day to help the U.S. Army and uh, the Department of Defense. So we have many friends and, uh, and then, uh, but yes, they know and we know that continuing resolutions, the big, the big thing it does, there's a lot of smaller pain points, but the big thing is it greatly limits our ability to do new things. So, um, you know, a CR that's six months means there are six months where we're severely limited on reprogramming authority, for example, to do new things that we know we need to do. Um, we are severely limited uh, with new starts. So CRs are not supposed to be fun, by the way. I mean, Congress writes them to not be good, to help incentivize getting the real bill done. So um, that's on purpose. Um, now, it doesn't make it easy for us, and, uh, but you know, we, we, uh, I was getting really worried. I mean, a year-long CR would have been really bad on a huge number of fronts, but to their credit, Congress got it done, and uh, we're now off and running with our full 24 amounts. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not ideal, um, but, you know, big picture, uh, you know, Congress, we have a divided government, and uh, that kind of represents the American people where they are. So yeah, getting things done is, takes longer. I've served in both types of Congresses with unified control and with divided control. Um, yeah, it's harder. But, uh, you know, when you're handing out trillions of dollars to the American people's money, it probably shouldn't be easy. You should be worried if it was too easy, because um, you should be worried about where it's going. But uh, I, think, I think our message on uh, the necessity of full-year funding sunk in, it helped. I think next thing now is the supplemental, which we um, absolutely need. The Army needs its parts of that supplemental. Um, lots of things in that bill, when you have a $92 billion bill, but we need those replenishment dollars. We are behind. We need that for ourselves. So it's not a, a Ukraine issue, really, in that regard. It's us. It's your soldiers, I tell Congressman, that these are your soldiers who need your help to get that equipment right now. Um, we have troops in contact in danger in the Middle East. The supplemental the Senate passed uh, at our request added critical funding to support U.S. Army operations in CENTCOM. Again, not Ukraine. Our people. Our people in danger. So nothing is more important than that. So I believe that the Army parts of that supplemental are going to get there for sure. Um, Members know what we need, and I, I have confidence that we'll, we'll get that, but we absolutely do need it. Um, so baseline bill, great. Need that SUP, need the parts of it, you know, very urgently. And uh, I think we have a lot of friends, though, helping us do that in Congress. Thank you. Yeah, I think from an industry perspective, uh, I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but uh, there are CRs so frequently that we know how to manage them. Um, and so we can all decide whether that's good or bad. But, um, but I think, you know, between, between the Army, uh, between navigating with our, our uh, supporters on, on the Hill and, and how industry is able to uh, 
I'll, I guess I'll just say be agile. Um, Short-term CRs, uh, I think really what they cost is, is, uh, is speed for things to the soldiers. Um, and so I think the, the constituent here who, who kind of pays the dearest price is actually the soldiers get things later. Uh, but I think between Army programming and industry, this one was a bit stressful because it was a bit longer than, uh, than they, they typically have been. Uh, but the ones that are in that sort of two, three months have almost become normal. Um, and so I think industry's view is we kind of bake that in uh, to, uh, to our plans. Um, you know, this one pushed the limits. If it had gone much longer, a full year CR would be a significant impact to industry. Uh, and so we would certainly never want to see that. Uh, but I think, you know, Doug, you talked about the, the Ukraine supplemental. Uh, you know, I think industry shares, shares um, support and, uh, and, and kind of focus on that and uh, are certainly putting our shoulder to the wheel every, everywhere we can. And, and I think one of the things we've got to remember to tell the story is where that money really goes. Um, and it, it doesn't just go, it goes directly to uh, your army soldiers, uh, but also goes directly into the ha into the hands of, you know, patriotic and uh, and proud Americans in U.S. facilities who are actually building these things. Uh, and so we had uh, we had a nice visit at the um, the Army's Radford uh, ammunition facility of the chief yesterday, um, and uh, and Senator Kane, and you know there are a thousand blue collar. Mm -hmm. Uh, proud Americans who build um, propellants for 155 and, and, and other things there, uh, that that's where the supplemental money goes. It goes into their hands to produce those things uh, that then go into the hands of into soldiers. It, you know, it goes into you know, factories all around, you know, all around the U.S. Uh, that actually produce these things that uh, are replenishing the inventory of uh, what this nation has chosen to, uh, to donate to, uh, to Ukraine. And so you're really actually producing things not directly for Ukraine. You're producing them you know, with American workers back for uh, American soldiers to replenish their inventories. And I, I think that um, we need to make sure we tell that story too. It, the headline is it's a Ukraine supplemental, but the, the chief beneficiaries are American workers and American <clears throat> soldiers. Great. Thank you. Um, this one's for you, Mac. Uh, so I, I think we've heard, uh, you know, over the this morning and, and yesterday that, uh, you know, the Army's transformational efforts have been successful for a number of reasons, but certainly the continuity and consistency, you know, over over many years and across two administrations um, has been a big part of that. So um, will fast shifts in geopolitical lands in the ge geopolitical landscape undercut Army modernization? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think the, uh, the obvious one is Gaza came out of the blue. Uh, 50 years after the uh, first Yom Kippur attack, we had a second Yom Kippur attack on almost the exact same day, but it came out of the blue. And uh, that kind of sort of roars us back into insurgency and terrorism, uh, which we thought maybe we were looking at in the rearview mirror. Uh, but, I think, but I think the way the CFTs are set up and I think the way Army Futures Command is operating, that it can adjust to that uh, if, it becomes, if it becomes bigger than Gaza. Um, so I, I, think that's, uh, I, think that's, I think it's working pretty well, uh, especially the good links to ASALT. Um, another, another issue, you know, strategic surprises are often on the uh, upside. Hmm. There are a lot of smart people that think China, their economy is already uh, heading down, their demographics are already heading down. Uh, it may well be that China really recedes, but Russia becomes more and more of a problem. So I just think we always have to be uh, aware that things are going to change fast. Okay, great. Thank you. So the discussion um, this morning has been pretty equipment-centric um, on this panel. And, uh, you know, but General, General, Rainey, General Rainey mentioned, uh, you know, some of the other elements of the Dotmul PF that uh, most of us are familiar with. And so with the, with the, the pace of the technology change and adaption of technology change, how do you integrate it into the other parts of dot mil PF, the organization, the, the doctrine? I mean, it's got to have some pretty significant impacts. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, I would offer that leader development number one, training number two, 
I mean, those will, those will trump uh, <clears throat> anything we do material-wise. Um, and organizational, you know, <clears throat> material is important, but it, it's in the context of whether you put capability into a formation or not. Um, so we work really closely with uh, our teammates in TRADOC, the Centers of Excellence, Lieutenant General Beagle, who runs the Combined Arms Center, is the force mod proponent, you know, that, that does all things multi-domain operations, and his relationship with Future Concept Center, uh, you know, is like Ranger Buddy level, uh, personally and professionally. So that's kind of how we guard, and then we have CDIDs and CFTs integrated with the Centers of Excellence. So I think we're doing good, but, but the, the bigger point is, you know, I mentioned how important it is. You know, the biggest advantage we have as an Army and as a joint force is we got better people at scale. You know, Department of Army civilians uh, down to the all-volunteer soldiers, the non-commissioned officer corps. So getting that right and sustaining that, we're going to need to upskill our, you know, if we're going to be a data-centric Army, we're going to have to add data warfare skills not to replace, you know, it's not like you can go, well, hey, Lieutenant, you got to learn data so you can not be physically fit, or you got to learn data so you can not know how to converge, you know, direct and indirect fire. So we got to upskill our workforce um, so that we have leaders that can still be, you know, that have that asymmetric advantage. So professional military education, you know, the amount of energy we invest as an army in building leaders is one of, the, one of, if not the reason, we're the best army in the world. And then training, you know, we, whatever army you got, it better be ready, it better be good. And continuing to invest in that is something that Forcecom just, you know, ruthlessly goes after. Um, and if you, back to your point about, you know, it, you know, we owe the joint force dominant land forces. Right, and, and if we go to war somewhere we didn't expect, the country is not going to accept. Hey, we'd love to go help, but uh, you know we shifted to here and did this instead of this. Nobody's going to want to hear that. Hmm. We're going to go. So whatever we do, making sure that we can provide joint force combatant commanders with land forces that can indisputably dominate it anywhere. That's why you know I'll never walk away from rifle squads that are the most lethal in the world, having the best armor formations indisputably. And, you know, the XM-30 is a must because the only way the rifle squads and the tanks end up on the same objective is if you can move them. So um, that's something that some people look at the world and go like, Where, what do you need tanks for? I think that's preposterous. I think it's short-sighted. And, uh, you know, the men and women are going to go fight where we're told, and we better have the best army in the world, period. Thank you. Any other comments from any of the panelists? On that? Well, if I could just, General Ray's done a great job of this. So acquisition is, you know, one part of the puzzle, and we have uh, an ability to go much faster now. Um, we've kind of surprised other elements of the Army in a good way. They were like, hey, are things ready? Where do you want it? Uh, <laughs> There's been a few of those bumps in the road, but the system has responded just fine. Once we get all the right talent, focus on the problem, we figure out the milcom, we figure out the people, and then the training materials and everything else. So it's like General Ernie said, it's a good problem to have to be going quick. Uh, you know, our next generation squad weapon got to production incredibly fast. It's a dramatic change in capability for our infantry force. We're gonna have to adapt our ranges and training and other things, but hey, that's okay. The capability it brings. Uh, for those infantry soldiers you talked about is the most important thing. So I think the system's adapting, um, but going, the whole system has to go faster, not just acquisition. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so, the, so the next question is about our, our great reserve components, right? So we have one army, active guard and reserve, um, and in the past, um, the fielding of systems um, has kind of trickled down to the reserve and guard, sometimes at a, at a slower pace, and, and I think the Army took steps to fix that. And again, given the complexity and the pace of what we're doing here, how, how are we bringing the, the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve into the fold on all this? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, depending on what you mean by the past, I would agree <laughs> or disagree with that. Uh, our, our last chief, uh, General McConville, and I, know this because I was the G3 at the time, uh, 
was adamant about modernizing and transforming the total army. And I, I, I would challenge anybody to look at the projected or, or fielding of any piece of kit and say that we were biased to Compo 1. In, in fact, there's times where if there's any bias, we went faster into Compo 2 or Compo 3 than, than you know, maybe we should have. So, um, yeah, we're, we're one army, we're all going together. We got six priority divisions in terms of transformation. One of them is the great 34th Infantry Division. Um, and, and obviously the reserve, you know, they're, not only are they going, some of them are, you know. <laughs> I, I tell my, my maneuver teammates in Compo 1, there'll be reservists waiting for you at the port when you get there. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you know how many days a month you work has anything to do with how fast you're going to find yourself in harm's way so it's definitely something to pay attention to i don't want to speak for general george but i think if he was here he'd tell you that, that john jensen and the tags have been very responsive and are actually you know they're looking for opportunities to transform in general you know the transformation in contact that inside two-year period i was just talking about there's national guard divisions in CENTCOM that are part of that transforming and contact effort the chiefs prioritized. Thank you. But we are, in fact, all going. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I give a soldier an award and thank him for serving and you know, tell him they're a soldier for life, I tell him to stay in shape. Because <laughs> you, you may think you're retiring, but I see you over there, Joe Thurman. We may need you in the tank turret. I mean, if we fight China, everybody's freaking going, so uh, period. I guess I better dust off my uniform. <laughs> um, so the, the next question, it, it's probably uh, one better suited to uh, senior leader for Army Material Command, but it's about the organic uh, industrial base, and uh, sure. it's targeted at you here. Um, so, so obviously, over many years, uh, the Army hasn't resourced it, um, probably to the extent that it could have. And so the, the question is, um, you know, it, you know what, is, what is the plan to address that? And is there also a plan to address the Army Working Capital Fund, which is the business model that operates that, and, and that at least from some perspectives here from the audience that it, it's not a very competitive model to private industry? Hmm. So I kind of bifurcate my answer, and I think my AMC colleagues uh, would give the same answer. Um, so with regard to the organic ammunition plants, so if you think about those as a separate thing, Actually, modernizing those and improving those started before the war in Ukraine. So uh, this is one where I have to give Congress credit. Uh, they started raising the alarm bell on that uh, pretty early, you know, really 2016, 2017. Started asking hard questions about, you know, what's your plan, Army? Do you have a more thoughtful 10, 15-year plan? And uh, they made us generate one. So that was uh, General Daly, uh, my original uh, partner at AMC. Um, brought that to fruition with my predecessor, uh, Dr. Jetty, and um, we had a plant on the shelf. Now, at the time, for the, for the ammo plants, frankly, we didn't have as much money to actually carry out the plan. Um, the Congress did start helping. If you look at the 2018, 2019, 2020 bills, they were adding money for additional ammo plant projects, extremely helpful based on our plan. Uh, but having that plan fully thought out, ready to go, all of a sudden, with the war in Ukraine and supplementals, we had the money. And we uh, have poured billions into modernizing those facilities. They are going to look dramatically different from Scranton to Radford, Holston, Iowa, uh, Army ammunition plants, you know, uh, and then over the next five years in, in the best kind of way. Modern manufacturing, safer manufacturing, scalable and more flexible. So the ammunition plants I actually feel quite good about, although I'm happy to, you know, talk to anyone about that where we might be falling short. The rest of the OIB, though, it is a fair point that we have really, frankly, money-wise, economy have forced um, the depots. Um, so this is something we struggle with every year in the SSPEG as I work with my uh, teammate there, the G4, currently uh, Lieutenant General Hoyle, and our colleagues at AMC. Uh, it, it's tight. I know it's tight. Um, we have a legal responsibility to maintain that, though, in a state that it could support us for going to war. So. Um, I think we have a clear sight picture. Uh, it's a resource struggle. Um, I would say I am concerned. We have accumulated a lot of risk there over the last several years. Um, and at some point, uh, especially I worry about the people, because those facilities are nothing without the great people that work there. Um, 
we may hit an uncomfortable risk level. So something we're definitely working on in Palm 26, um, the financing model, I mean, working capital fund, um, most of the time is fine. Every now and then through a policy decision or a financial decision, sometimes not even the Army, it's OSD sometimes, they remove money from those funds to pay other bills. We just have to be really careful about that. Um, I'm happy to take more on this afterwards if someone's more of an expert than I am, but I think it's okay right now, but that doesn't mean um, it's as healthy as it could be. So acknowledge the question's underlying concern about risk in the non-ammunition organic industrial base. We gotta have it. We gotta have Anison, uh, Toby Hanna, all of them. They gotta be good places. We need them, we're using them, to, for example, to repair equipment that then goes to Ukraine or stuff that comes back that we have to repair. So it's, it's not just the U.S. Army, it's our allies as well. Thank you. So Jeremy or Mac, any, any comments on that from your Yeah, I mean, console? I'm happy to share from the ammunition industrial base, organic industrial base perspective, um, probably have more, more perspective on that. I, you know, this is, um, I share, Mr. Bush, uh, your view there that um, you know, if you go back maybe, maybe 10 years, we didn't really have much of a, mm. of a plan relative to the uh, ammunition uh, organic industrial base but if you compare progress made uh, over that you know decade or so, it's you know it's night and day. I think uh, today um, it's it's a pretty resource intensive plan, uh, and so there is you know there's a pace at which we'll be able to do that as a kind of as a partnership. But I think we know what to do. We know what you know what the needs are, and we know kind of what the priorities are more or less. Uh, certainly enough to uh, to move forward, and I think we've had some really great support uh, in Congress there. Um, many many visits from uh, from our uh, supporters on the Hill to see it uh, for uh, for the first time with their own eyes, which is helpful to see those types of facilities, uh, which again were built dominantly in World War II, and and some of them are still original. And so it's it, it almost takes seeing it to believe it sometimes. Um, but I think today we've got a um, Provided supplemental budgets are passed, uh, we've got a we've yeah. got a plan that I think can really meet the need. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, I, would, I would just say quickly, uh, it's been about 20 years since the last base closing round collapsed, and we never hear about BRACs anymore. Mm. And uh, the last base closing round collapsed mostly under pressure from Congress when we were in much smaller wars or prospective wars than we are now. So we're fortunate that the Congress uh, takes the industrial base seriously, both public and private, and uh, it continues to do so, and nobody's heard about a BRAC in a long time. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got about three minutes left, so maybe one or two more questions. Um, next one is kind of an acquisition contracting question, and uh, I think it was the undersecretary um, yesterday who mentioned that, you know, all sized companies are important, the small companies, uh, medium sized companies, and of course the, the larger uh, companies. And um, so there's a concern, I, I believe, that, that maybe the, the process uh, isn't as fair as it could be for the smaller companies or the mid sized companies. So, what, what can the Army do to, to level the playing field and ensure that it gets you know, what all of these, uh, these great companies have to offer? So first of all, the Army leads the Department of Defense in small business contracting. So we, we actually hit our targets and we exceed them and the scale of the funding uh, dwarfs everyone else. So now that's, that's across all types of things, right? So that's everything from food services to component parts and a lot of things in between. So General Rainey and I share, uh, though, for example, work on the small business innovation system. So SBIR, that program, it's for about 400 million a year across the Army in a given year. We both uh, execute part of that. I think we've made dramatic strides there in being able to go for uh, SBIR much faster, get money on contract <coughs> much faster, um, and have more outreach. You know, having AFC at Austin gives us direct access to um, tech innovation that, and other innovation that we wouldn't have otherwise. So I think um, the machinery is there. Is it perfect? Probably not. Um, one thing we do emphasize, certainly, when we're doing uh, competitions, and by the way, you know, I, sometimes I get the question, including from uh, colleagues on the Hill, like, um, you know, what's, what's slowing you down sometimes? I'm like, 
The competition law you passed? <laughs> <laughs> what? The Competition and Contracting Act? Um, so, uh, however, that is the law of the land and we follow it and it's a good law because um, without that we would probably easily fall into, um, with good intentions, not creating competitive space um, for companies to innovate. So within that, um, those competitions, my team knows, I'm very serious about it, they gotta be real competitions, no for show competitions. We are open to new vendors. We've had some recent contract awards with a lot of non-traditionals winning. Um, you know, we had a uh, really a foundationally a software company, Palantir, win the contract for Titan. Um, so tough competition, we had two, two good bids, um, but you know, that shows I think that we're open to non-traditional companies while still valuing, of course, our terrific partners like BAE and others um, who are doing huge things for the Army. So small businesses, I mean, I think where the Army can help is making sure they know where the ball is going to be. So I would encourage a lot of small businesses, for example, all of my PEOs have consortiums. These are a new thing we use. They're kind of quasi-governmental, but they can do contract awards. They do OTAs, but they also share information. They're a great source of information on contract awards that are coming up where you might be able to compete directly or partner with a mid-sized company or even one of our primes like BAE with innovative technology that you bring to the table. So, you know, we, we want to be helpful. We've uh, tried to get better at consolidating that information online, for example. Um, but I'm open to uh, good criticism and ways we can do that better. We got a million, we got lots of great innovative companies in this country. We need to leverage them all. Um, that's America's, one of America's superpowers. And I just I know we're coming up on time here, but I just offer from an industry perspective, you know, General Rainey, one of your six uh, kind of themes that you opened up with, one of them was you know, reimagining integrators. I, I do think this is a space where, where your integrators can add some value. Um, you know, typical combat vehicle or um, helicopter, you know, 70, 75 percent of, of that work's not done by your prime. It's done by the supply chain that serves that. Uh, that supports those those vehicles, and so as integrators, we have um, you know pretty extensive supply chain organizations. We've got, uh, and we we are encouraged to, and we embrace that um, encouragement to to focus on small business uh, providers and partners. And you know, some of the feedback we get from some small businesses is that it's actually a little bit easier to do business with the Army through. Uh, um, like an industry to army translator, which as integrators we can be, <laughs> um, and to uh, and to be you know part of one of those part of one of those programs. So that's a that's a big part of I think some of the value we can offer uh, as an integrator. Not not just us. All, all integrators can offer um, you know to encourage more of that small business participation and make it a little bit easier for them uh, to do business in a kind of business to business arrangement rather than business to government arrangement, which does bring some more rules. All right, we are, uh, we are at time. I would uh, like to thank our panel for the great discussion this morning. Let's give them a big hand. Um, we, we got to many of your questions, but not all. So what, what I'll do here is uh, um, I'll, I'll give the questions out to the, to the senior leaders who they were addressed to, um, to include the ones that we didn't, uh, we didn't get to, so at least they'll have the benefit of the insights of the questions that you're asking. Uh, but again, I would like to thank the panelists for, uh, for all the great discussion this morning, and less over to you. Thank you so much. Mr. Bush and, and panelists, thanks again for such a great conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a short lunch break from now so you can get a bite to eat and take some time to spend it with your friends. Please be back at your seats by 1315 for our next Fireside Chat, Rapid Innovation. Good afternoon. Um, I am Colonel Nikki Buxman. I'm from the Joint Enabling Capabilities Command in Norfolk, Virginia, and I'm, I'm an Army Reservist. I am a board director for AUSA Huntsville chapter. Next up, we have a fireside chat to discuss rapid innovation. Our moderator is Ms. Megan Metzger. Ms. Metzger is the founder and CEO of DCOM. D Decode focuses on connecting the tech community with government to so solve critical challenges. Check. Oh, there we go. 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to what I promise will be the best panel of the day. You the agree? Best. The best. Uh, so, uh, as she said, Megan Mesker, I'm the CEO of Decode, and with me, they probably need no introduction, but I have Lieutenant General Kaufman, Deputy Commanding General of AFC. Welcome, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And Lieutenant General Rash, Director of Capabilities and Critical Technology. I always call it RICTO, and I was worried I wouldn't actually get the It's word. RICTO, like a person. Oh, like a toe. Dr. Great. Yeah. Gentlemen, we have a really hefty challenge in front of us. The first, which is keeping everyone awake after lunch. There we go. And the second is talking about mission critical rapid innovation, which is something near and dear to my heart. Life's work is getting better technology to the people that need it the most. So this morning we heard, no blood for first contact. Steel before humans. And there's no better example of rapid innovation than to talk about our HMI efforts, human machine, integrated formations. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Great. Sound good? Yep. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. All right, so the first thing I, I want to just pick on, there, we've heard about HMI throughout the morning. We heard a lot about it yesterday. And the first thought is robotics. But this is way more than just a robot going into a field. Talk about the missions they're gonna be solving and what other emerging tech capabilities are really gonna be critical on this, it's a platform is the way that I think about it. Yeah, so first, when you think about a robot, boy, that's a big voice. <laughs> I wonder, like, my beatbox here. Um, when you think about a robot, people only see the truck. So when you walk around the, the floor here, there's incredible companies out there with, with robots and they have different payloads on them. But what, it, what is a robot and how do you use it? It starts with the user interface. And then it goes to a radio or some form of communication device that then ties into a secondary communication device that's actually on platform. And that platform then has multiple uh, operating systems on it. One is operating the vehicle itself, so make it turn right, turn left, you know, turn the lights on, turn the lights off. Then there's an operating system that controls the payload. Okay? And that payload could be anything from a tractor to a, a machine gun. Then you've got an autonomy package, and then you have you know, computer vision or LIDAR. And so as they're moving around the battlefield, all of that has to happen securely, so our adversaries can't hack into it. But any payload that is done today, whether that's EW to NBC detection to, to weapons, uh, I mean, heck, it almost, can even do what the infantry does, Rob. You know? <laughs> I feel like we're in role reversal here. You're talking like an acquisition engineer, and I'm going to come in from an operational perspective because I'll simplify it a little bit from my perspective. When you, when you look at the capabilities that we want to provide to soldiers, we've been fighting as a, the combined arms fight and the joint fight for years. Uh, what, what Ross is describing, though, is, is really uh, we, we can very easily add too much complexity to this problem space. And what we've got to do is figure out how to reduce that complexity. So I, I tell my team as we've been looking at this problem, you know, the robot, the robot math is what I call it. And I'm on from the math. great state of Georgia. So my math isn't probably it's great to be begin with. But, you and me both. But, yeah. but, but, but capability wise, you know, one plus one equals three, right? So this capability right. plus that capability combined at the right point in uh, space and time, you get a, a better capability. But from a complexity perspective, we can't have one plus one even equal two. It's got to equal 1.1 or 1.01 as we continue to add payloads because they're trucks. Robots are trucks. Yep. Um, and it's really the things that we put on them and enable them to do to really uh, achieve that distance. And that should be the goal as we introduce autonomy to the soldiers. Sure. So I, I want to go with that thread for a second. Um, I had the opportunity recently. I went on behalf of the commanding general of CENTCOM to the AOR to see firsthand what, it, what you're talking about. And something that jumped out to me was that user interfaces and the complexity is really hard when you are in the field, things are coming at you. It's like a Las Vegas casino machine in there. And it, like getting to the end user, the warfighter, war is so incredibly difficult and so incredibly important. But how do we get after that when we're prototyping tech? Yeah, so first of all, where are we? We're at two humans operating one robot right now. One's driving and one's yep. operating the payload. And what we've got to get to is 12 robots to one human. Yep. Uh, and that's down the road. 
But like, like Rob was indicating, we don't want to boil the ocean here. So right now, any country that's in the robotic space, any of our adversaries can do the following things. They can do obstacle avoidance, waypoint navigation, and teleop. So start there. Make it the best that we can do and have that be increment one. And then add autonomy, add payloads, all of these things. Because if you don't do it that way, what Rob often reminds me is you're going to be no further along because you're trying to do everything at once. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have to iterate. We need incremental value to the warfighter as fast as humanly possible. And, and I think on top of that, we, we have to develop standards, right? Standards of, of implementation. So the government's been investing in, in robots and robot technologies for decades. You know, we've uh, all the way prior to that program that can't be named, it's got three letters. The first one starts with F, the last one ends with S. We've been investing in robotic technologies um, and that has continued through the years. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of effort out there, but, but uh, to, to steal a, a phrase I think I heard, first heard from you, there, there's a thousand blooming flowers out there with regards to activities and efforts and in some cases standards. Um, there are some, some great standards that have been developed uh, with, with the government and industry working together. We need to kind of settle on one, even realizing it's not going to be perfect, um, but at least provide a focal point for industry and the industry innovation that's out there to develop towards. So that allows us to integrate quicker um, and build on what we have. Uh, and then spiral, you know, spiral through that uh, over time as we continue this learning. Because we've, we've got a couple of cycles to get this right. You know, the first increment that we're working, increment one, um, that'll be out in a couple of years in that two-year two window that General Rainey was talking about earlier, um, it's not going to be perfect. It, it's step one. But if we can get that about right, I think we have an opportunity to then pick up the pace. Yeah. You know, what it also will do is, you know, if you look how many vehicles, I'm sorry, how many companies build helicopters for the military, how many ve yep. build vehicles, how many build trucks, it dwindles, right? But we have an opportunity here by taking each one of these components and using the standards that you discuss to keep everyone in there so that the best companies and the best technology can be implemented through open systems architecture and other things. Absolutely. And if, if we make the standards so rigid yep. that you have to plug into it, I don't care what's in the black box. Just be able to interface yeah. with this standard. Well, and when it comes to these kind of systems, like you all are hitting on, it's sensors, it's software, and it's all of the things that we see in the commercial marketplace that are just taking off. Mm -hmm. And so the likelihood that one company could actually do it all is going to be near impossible, right? And we can't predict the future. So what capabilities will we need to add? So I guess the, the more pointed part of that is Open architectures, interoperability, and the existence of standards is critical because we're killing Americans if we don't. So we have, a, we have our critical partners here that um, General Rainey talked about. How have your expectations for the industry and the industrial base changed? And what companies are going to prevail as we start prototyping and rolling out HMI? You want to go first? Go ahead. So. Um, I don't think there's a, a, a winner or loser here. There's definitely a winner, and it's a soldier um, at the end of the day. But you know, the, the goal is, in my opinion, is I want the best. I want the best thing we can get. And, and companies have areas of expertise. And some companies try to do a lot of things, and some companies focus on what they do really, really well. So to get back to those standards, um, if I can have company A and company B each bring their best thing, instead of company A trying to do also what company B does and package it all up and, and get us into a Absolutely. vendor lock situation, um, I, I'll rather have, I'd rather have every company doing what they do best and building that team and that enterprise. And I think, quite frankly, in this space, and I've learned a lot this last year on robots since General Rainey kind of looked at me at this conference last year and said, hey, I want you to hey, look at the robots. You're the robot guy? Yeah, yeah. Look, look, look at helping us expedite this robot thing. There's a, there's a lot of great industry partners doing good things. We just got to synergize that effort. And, and I think that, that, that MOSA uh, architecture that, uh, that Ross talked about will help get us on that path. And, and the signal to industry is, hey, we're going to have, there, there shouldn't be a thousand points of different standards and different architectures. We're going to settle on, on, a, on one or a few, you know, network architecture, um, you know, autonomy architecture, and we want you to build to that. And, and, and we'll compete, we'll keep competition uh, alive sure. and continue to evolve because the technology is, is not static. It's going to continue to evolve, whether it's network, whether it's 
tracked vehicles, whether it's the payloads, and the payloads exist, right? So they're the same things that we give to soldiers today. We just have it on a vehicle that they're in, or it's in their rucksack, or it's on a UAS, which is a robot, by the way. Um, it's adapting those to this, uh, this, uh, this uh, MOSA architecture that we put out. And, I, and again, I think that's where the real learning is going, going to occur. Hey, hey Rob, what, come at me with how the requirements community could fall into a trap. And then I'll come at you with how I think that I thought you were going to ask him to name all the types of robots. <laughs> I love this question. So I, I think right now, um, quite frankly, when, when you look at the space and you look what we're doing for the armor and the infantry, uh, we've got two different requirements generators. Right, so the CFT kind of owns the uh, the heavy armor uh, requirements, and the Center of Excellence uh, down at Fort Moore owns the light infantry requirements. We're trying to get commonality here from a from a MOSA perspective, and if I can get commonality from a payload perspective, certainly the truck's going to be different. It's going to be you know JLTV versus a tank, right? So so the transport mechanism might be different, but everything above that, where we can keep standard, we should, and we're going to have to keep an eye on on ensuring that we. We can maintain commonality, realizing the fight's different, light infantry fight's different than armor, but where we can achieve commonality, which will allow us to scale um, within the resources we have, is going to be important. Yeah, and I think that if we, if we keep doing things the same way and we P-spec this thing out like we've traditionally yeah. done, if we use seed drills like we've traditionally right. done, we're just going to end up with something far less than optimal. So I'm 100% on, on PSPEC, and it was mentioned this morning as well about capabilities-based documents. And, and the worst thing you can do is bring in our engineers to help you write your requirements because that's what you're going to get. You're going to get very, very specific solutions, uh, technical solutions spelled out in spades, and it's going to limit the flexibility once you sign it and give it back to me. So, so this, this is what I, I always I thought you were going to say is you requirements people, <laughs> you write a requirement, you start us down a road, and then you move the goalpost, you change the requirement, or you uh, want to continue to iterate, m much akin to like a Pentagon Wars, give me some portholes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as long as the requirements community stays engaged throughout the entire process, moves from supported to supporting, and as long as the acquisition community moves from supporting to supported, I think we can, we can maintain consistency in those requirements and, and get what we want. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, ACDDs versus CDDs at this point in time. What are we going to learn? What's good enough? We can snap the chalk line and then build upon that. Um, we get locked in too early on, on overambitious requirements. Uh, again, because sometimes acquisition, we're, we're our own worst enemies, right? If you come in and tell us what's the perfect engineering solution, we're going to write it out in a P-spec, yeah. and, and it's going to come back to, to haunt us down the line. So um, we've just got to gotta watch that carefully from both sides. So I want to I jump in here for a second. Two things. How are you thinking about the difference between a standard and an over spec requirement? Those two things get conflated quite a bit. Yeah, so it, from a requirement standpoint, I don't care what your payload is, how it interfaces with that, think a USB plug, mm -hmm. okay? Everything's gonna have to have the same standard to interface with the operating system. That's the definition of a standard, yep. right? So I, I think that's the way we need to look at it. And then the autonomy package or the uh, operating system on board like you can get really caught up in, in a lot of things, but if you can define the middleware and how it interfaces, uh, the interfaces between that platform, that AI platform, well, then you can move forward very, very quickly and you don't have to mess with those. But we get to Rob's point earlier, we get so focused on perfection that we lose sight of good enough. So how are you gonna rework the requirements? So you mentioned capability, portfolio. I, I like to also say, think of it as outcome, right? So right now our requirements are on time, on budget, on schedule, doesn't matter if it works. So when you're thinking about these future systems where we don't know where tech's going, how are you going to reimagine how the requirements get done working with Rick? Yeah, I, it all comes down to modular open system architecture. We've done it in aviation. We've done it in Bradley replacement. We're looking at it on M1, E1. Uh, and we need to maintain that with with the robots. Uh, 
again, it's the truck is the truck is the truck. It's these interfaces that are going to get us uh, the ability to maintain pace with technology as it advances. Because these are going to be in the formations for tens and tens of fifties of years, right? And then I like your uh, Ink One through Ink Six. You know, what, what did you call that? Like Ink One's. I'm sure be, it was brilliant. Whatever. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant. <laughs> um, but you said. You know, Inc. One is not the destination. I think yeah, that's yeah. what you said. That's first step, yeah. And I think being dogmatic over requirements at this point is, is the mistake, right? So even the standards and the, and the architecture we put out, it's a starting point, but it's, it's not gonna be the end because when somebody, we determine we need the flux capacitor to integrate as a yep. payload, we will have all the architecture laid out for everything but the 10% of newness that that flux capacitor brings. And we've got to, we, we've got to collaborate with government and with industry to adjust that architecture over time based upon the realities of, of the battlefield. So let's talk about how that translates down into the field. So you talked about iterations, more MVPs, let's get capabilities. Walk me through how you're going to field it. What does a prototype look like? How are you going out to demonstrations? Um, General Rainey talked about we're doing 25% more experimentation and we're taking it to the tip of the spear. So walk me through HMI, we're putting it out into soldiers' hands, we're that's, iterating. That's a good question. We'll be debating this probably for the next six months, but go all ahead, right. I'll let you take a shot at it first. We've got 15 minutes. So I get the right Rob's rebuttal. Did, <laughs> Rob's got it all figured out. Um, okay, so first, it's about getting that MVP in the hands of our soldiers. And that's one thing the Army has done well over the past five years, is it's not just a soldier touch point, it's a soldier touch point to inform requirements to make sure that you start with the customer first. And we have, we have traditionally not done that very well. Um, but if you, we'll, we'll take it as Inc. 1, Inc. 2, Inc. 3, just hypothetically. Inc. 3, science and technology being worked with the uh, HMI platoon at Fort Benning, right, to, to no noodle through that and make sure that we have the requirements about right. While Inc. 2, may be at the National Training Center being fought every day and every month with the OP4. And then Inc. 1 is being put into a no kidding force comm unit uh, to better them as they deploy. And that could be in Korea, that could be uh, somewhere else in the Pacific, it could be in Europe, it could be in CONUS. But then when Inc. 4 comes in, that all slides down and we, we iterate and iterate and iterate. Sure. Um, that way we're not we're not locked. I can see you uh, rubbing your at, legs. Yeah, <laughs> I look at it a, a little simpler. So, so we had a great video we saw this morning. I think, yep. I think Ross is going to show it again before the next session um, of what we saw last week out at uh, National Training Center. And the first human-machine combined arms live fire exercise ever conducted, and, and it was done brilliantly. Um, to, to see the tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, the evolving doctrine that the unit that has those robots and how they employ it, you really saw the future. Um, but what I also did is I looked over at the parking lot um, off to the side and looked at all the cars. Uh, that represented, you know, not the VIPs that were there, but the FSRs that were out kind of supporting that activity. And that's a metric, right? So as, as we get to the point where we're ready to turn this over to soldiers, I need to see the number of cars required to make the thing work shrink significantly. And that's, that's, not, that's not the sexy stuff, right? So, so that's, that's fixing your network, uh, having a good network architecture. It's, it's hardening those robots and the payloads that are on them so that we don't have to have an eight-man FSR team assigned to overwatch this, these four robots in the field. Um, it's, it's getting through the safety piece for autonomy software where we no longer have to have a, a guy, an ATEC you know, person with a kill switch in a truck following behind it. That's what I look at. So it, to me, increment one is all about getting this to where we feel comfortable giving it to a soldier. And uh, to, I'll, I'll paraphrase General Rainey, he, he, what he says, we'll know we got it right when that, that first sergeant uh, and that company commander say, hey, this, this equipment you gave me is worth the pain in the butt uh, it takes to sustain it because it's providing me more capability than I have to put into making it work. And I think that's, that's a good kind of common sense metric that we've, we've, we've got we've to get comfortable with. So I, lo I love the way that you all are thinking about it. And we heard a couple of things this morning. Um, we heard General Rainey repeatedly say, 
we don't have a tech problem, we have a tech adoption problem. We heard Honorable Bush say, it's not a tech problem, it's a money problem. Yep, you've heard this before. So tell me how you're getting after this more creatively. Are you, how are you funding? You know, I know that Ricto specializes in this and there's authorities that you're using. Like, how are you approaching this differently to kind of overcome something? I'm not printing money. Um, so we, we, we prototype a lot of things. I thought that was your first this. innovation. Yeah, no, no, no I, I wish we could. Um, it, it's gonna take hard work. And, and even this year, so as this mission came, kind of came last year with no resources. We were in the execution of 23 money. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out, well, where are available resources? Um, and instead of just trying to, to take from one and give to another, what are those activities? And it's over half a billion dollars a year in S&T funds uh, that focus on robotics and autonomy. How can we bend those efforts a little bit towards a common purpose so that the big bill isn't just go out to a vendor and get a big bill to build it all. How can we bend the S&T to get us down that yeah. path? And they've been working that in so many different areas across different centers, uh, development centers that, that AFC, AFC oversees, and it's really kind of leveraging all of those efforts, the monies that they're already doing and saying, hey, you know, come off azimuth five degrees and you've got something that I can use on HMI. Uh, spent a lot of time and effort this last year trying to get us to that point. Meanwhile, as we palm to the future, we'll get that wedge in and start building it out over time. But then on the back end, it's important to bring those PMs because Ricto typically takes S&T and we get it to a prototype and we pass it off to a program office. In this case, we already have a few program offices that are out there doing robots. Sure. So we've got to, we've got to hold hands on both sides yeah. across that valley of death um, to make sure that the PMs are ready to accept it. And we've got to hold them accountable to, hey, wait, you know, we, on the S&T side and as we develop the prototypes, we've got to be held to a standard of a schedule which makes S&T very uncomfortable. Um, but at the same time, they've got to be willing to commit money to integrate that into their existing programs of record yeah. on the other side, which makes them very comfortable. So we're all going to be very uncomfortable sure. for a while, um, but that's the way it's, it's going to have to be, I believe, to make transition work. Well, the other one is <clears throat> we've got Ricto, three-star, Deputy Commanding General of AFC, three-star, CAT Commander, three-star, MILDEP to the ASALT, three-star. That forms the core of the BOD, Board of Directors, and very transparent and so the the army this has traditionally been the army in my experience rob and i disagree he says bad things about me i say bad things about him and How dare you. then we we get that out of our system we say you want to get a beer and he said yeah let's go get a beer and it's over right yep well as long as we maintain that we can hash out all these problems that we're doing it tomorrow yeah. Um, is our next time? meeting. Uh, I'm here, right here. <laughs> um, but that's, that's how we're going to do it because we've established a board of governance because we realize there's a thousand yeah. points of light on this. Everyone's got their own UAV. Everyone's got their own controller, Absolutely. et cetera. And just getting that standardized because if you can't do it with those, if we can't do it, we should be fired. And you, you noticed he also mentioned Tradoc, right? Yep. So Absolutely. it's not just about robots. It's how do we get the rest of that PFP aligned as well? Um, so aligning across all of those activities, whether it's who's working the doctrine for robots, who's working the organizational construct, how are we going to train this, yeah. what policies need to be adjusted yeah. to allow for you know autonomous systems, and certainly there's the you know there, there's there's the, the trip line right now of you know autonomous lethality, which we're not going to cross anytime soon, um, yeah. but there's still policies that we're going to have to work through. We've got to look at all of it, or else all we're going to be doing is fielding not one robot but four robots. Yeah to the soldiers who have too much kit already. So we got to think through the whole thing. Yeah. And that, that bot is going to get us there, I think. Well, and I think the training piece is such an interesting part, and it's related to a lot of things that you all already talked about. Everything from you need a first sergeant to be able to go into the battlefield and know how to operate a robot. Right? That's, a, that's, a new, that's a new way to train and a new way to think about it. So I think it's such an But our soldier, I mean, our soldiers do that every day when they're back in their barracks room and they pull up their Nintendo game, right? They do yeah. that every day. The, the goal is how do you, of course, the complexity of real terrain and everything else is different than what they have to face, but how do you start kind of sl slowly closing that gap, right? And, and that should be the goal for all of us from that warfighter machine interface. And the soldiers, you know, we shouldn't need an additional skill identifier or a different no, MOS totally for every payload that we put on a robot. Yeah, We've got to make it less complex yeah. for them. I don't need a six weeks course to use my new complex iPhone. Well, they so. said, uh, yeah. and I apologize to anyone in the room that has said this before, but 
it generally comes from parents or grandparents and they go, look at little Johnny. He's so smart. He can already w- operate an iPad. The reality is that the likelihood that Johnny's a brilliant man is probably less probably. than 50. What? <laughs> it's, how dare you? It should be, look how smart the designer of the iPad was because they made it intuitive to a two-year-old. And we've got to get to that standard yeah. across. Well, I, I have to say, one of my favorite moments when I was out in the Zencom AOR is I had the opportunity to actually control one of our autonomous trucks. And the thing that I love about how you all are thinking about involving the end user and the warfighter is they're just infinitely creative and resourceful. So I had no joke had an Xbox controller because it couldn't get the parts for the real controller and it worked like a charm. And I'm like, oh, I'm just playing Nintendo doing donuts with a truck. It was great. Same thing, yeah. 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 Um, it's really good that you were playing Nintendo with your Xbox controller, Megan. Well, Ro- shush. Rob's still on. <laughs> you know what I meant. Ro- Ro- Rob's still on Atari, don't feel yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And television, thank Oh, you. and he's in charge of our future. This is great. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, so one last question I'm going to flip to. I lost the timer, so someone will have to keep me honest. Um, OK. So from timelines, um, you know, kind of give me a little bit of the future. What kind of timelines are you looking at here? And then most importantly, we need all of the people in the audience here, whether they're soldiers or their industry, to really, really chip in and do their part. So tell us what that looks like. It sounds like an acquisition question to me. OK. So. Not fast enough is the Way timeline. Way to dodge that one. <laughs> um, not, not fast enough is the timeline. And as we laid it out, uh, we're looking at about a 27-month turn for increment one. And it's a lot of the things that we've seen, so there's not a lot of new stuff. It's, it's stuff we've already demonstrated, okay. but it's how do I take that demonstration and get it into an actual capability. So all that okay. stuff I talked about earlier about you know, the network, the network, the network, the network. We've heard about it this morning as the, the number one priority, the number one focus area. We have got to get that right. Uh, so there's some work to do there from a network architecture perspective, and we've got all the experts from um, C5ISR working that and also coordinating with uh, POC 3T on that on the back end. Um, then there's you know the hardening of those platforms and systems. Uh, there's laying in that architecture and then the testing associated with it. So General Rainey wants it tomorrow, um, and we can have it tomorrow, but if we have it tomorrow, we get what we had two weeks ago, and we've got to provide the FSR. So it's going to take a while to do that hardening, and as you know, somewhat resource constrained right now, um, which we will always be, but doing the best with the dollars we have now to try to expedite that process. But probably about two years. But if we get that baseline right, it's that, that old go slow to go fast, right? So if we can get this about right, signal to industry, here's what the Army is doing, not what a small organization within any of our S&T centers or one small product office, here's what the Army's doing. We need your help, we need your innovation. We get that architecture right, getting, getting them building to that, those spirals will get quicker and quicker. Yeah. Now, you made me think of something you know, as you're saying, we want to get the testing right, but not too right. Like, how do you balance and calculate the risk here? You know, we've inherently have been a little bit more in the risk adverse in some cases. I'll say acquisition, for example, and risk of getting protested. Oh. But like, how do we balance the risk when we're looking at systems like this? I, I don't know how much this is public knowledge, so. <laughs> all heard the, it here all, first. All the microphones yeah. just went on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please. Right. Um, the advances in ATEC over the last two years have been incredible, what that organization has done. Um, and so I think we can test faster, we can, we can get solutions into the field faster because of that. So there's certain things we're not gonna compromise on. We're not gonna compromise Safety. on some, something that's gonna hurt a soldier, sure. et cetera. I mean, that's all, that's a given. Um, but the things that we can you know, compromise on is, okay, well, we said it needed to, drive 250 miles, but it only drives 240. Is that acceptable? You know, these type of things where traditionally our threshold requirements have been such that, oh, if yep. it, it doesn't meet the threshold, it's, it is a no-go from the start. Right. Safety uh, confirmation, safety release, capabilities and limitations document from ATEC, we're out the door. Oh, are you going to hold them to it? I'm going to hold them to it. Well, it was a perfect tee up for one of the first questions, so I have a set here. Okay. We'll see which ones I can actually read. Your handwriting, people. <laughs> um, okay, first one is for 
um, Lieutenant General Kaufman. So picking on that thread, when and how will the Army change acquisitions to a formation-based process? I, we, we field equipment, we fight formations. The HMI platoon is bringing all that together. So you're still gonna buy individual items, but the way we fight it and the way we design it and the way we write the requirements allows it to be fought in a combined arms fashion with humans and machines. But the, you know, it's impossible if I'm buying four robots well, I'm still buying four individual robots, but now they're in a platoon. It's like I have a tank platoon. I have an HMI platoon. I've got an infantry yeah. platoon. There's equipment associated with all of that. But it gets down to uh, our doctrine, our task organization, all of these things. And by taking this holistic approach for human-machine integrated formations, that then becomes the mindset. Yeah. And it's not, I need a new robot. I need a new I need a robotic platoon. So is this connecting the thread, um, the last panel talked a lot about capability approach and a portfolio approach. And is that kind of what you're getting at is rather than buying these systems individually, you're thinking about this as a capability? Right, so if you look at it. All right, Ross, I you challenged smirked. you on this, right? So, you smirked. Yeah, so please. we went to Texas A&M last year. Yeah. And we, uh, I got my first introduction to the robot community. And again, that was where I, we came up with a thousand points of light, thousand blooming flowers, whatever, hundred kayaks on the water, all going different places. Um, I said, what are you trying to do? What metal task are we trying to accomplish? We need, that, we need to look at it from that way. If we're talking about formations, how we fight, what's the, what's the, what's the task for that infantry or armor unit that we're trying to get after? And then let's see how we can add autonomy and robots and uh, roboticized payloads to help lessen, uh, you know, lessen the risk to soldiers and increase that lethality. And, and so we started working that. And so what you saw at NTC was an iteration of that. Hey, let's not just have robots out there. Let's give them a mission. Let's give that unit a mission. And that doctrine as it involves, we're going to find out what the next hard tasks are. And you know, whether it's a deliberate breach or whether it's you know, a, a battle position defense, whatever those tasks are, where can autonomy, where can robots help at that formation level? No, I think that's fair. Yeah. And I think that's gonna, what's coming out of your doctrine. When everyone, anyone questions me about robots, they're like, I'm not sure. They're, they can't move as fast as a tank or they can't do this. I said, okay, well, if you were in the defense and you had uh, robots in front of you that could identify the enemy, make them deploy, uh, and not put any humans at risk, would you want them? I said, absolutely. I said, well, welcome to the robotic yeah. nation. Yeah. Because that, that is one capability, and that's probably one that can be easily done today. And then if you take it a step further, how about the artillery? Like if you want to roboticize something, if you look at the way artillery moves on the battlefield today, they generally get in a column, they move from their position area, and they traverse almost in a convoy. Yeah. They go there, generally park, and excuse me, red legs, but like a lazy W or something. <laughs> and, and then they shoot, and then they do it again. So you could roboticize that very easily. Sure. And you could apply this to anything we do. Decontamination of vehicles, refueling. You know, there's things that we supply could do to transport. Uh, easy, low-hanging fruit supply, right? Logistics. Yeah. Um, probably the easiest case ever. It doesn't blow anything up, but it's easy. Probably safety risk pretty low because we're not putting soldiers on it. Um, there, there's things that we can do um, that are out there that are just ready to be done. But a, a fair criticism of us would be, okay, well, who's going to fix them? How's that going to happen? And do you need more people to do that? And how's that? So that, yeah. all these details need to be worked out. I think that the... The challenge that I'd like to put before is, okay, how about robots fixing robots? How are the prognostics and diagnostics on the robots allowing us to do that faster? Sure. Um, the, these are things we need to think through, and this, this is part of what the board of directors and the community needs to, to work through. Well, the other thing is we've talked a lot about the end user and the warfighter, and we've talked a lot about requirements. And if I were to have another criticism slash question. Please. Question. Um, how, do you, how are you going to make sure you're actually connecting the feedback and the requirements that you are seeing from the person actually having to fix the robot or work with the robot all the way back up into the acquisition system? Like, how are we going to innovate that 
process? Well, I think we're already doing that. Um, lots of programs, especially rapid prototyping efforts, utilize the sol soldier touch points. And, and bringing those soldiers in. And here, here's where you have an opportunity, right? You know, when you're in a unit and you hear about all this great stuff happening, but you never see it, it gets to you. You're kind of managing that expecta expectations or managing those expectations is hard. But if you were part of that process, and so what I tell the teammate, when you bring the soldiers in, what are you trying to learn specifically? So we need to know what we want to learn. We need to capture that yeah. and we need to follow through with it. Right? When that sergeant comes and says, you know, this color should be blue, not green on the interface, next time that soldier comes three months later, damn it, have it blue, right? And, and, and now they own it. They're like, I made a difference in this. So the ownership and wanting to make it successful, you know, just, just from a psychology perspective, it starts getting that buy-in early. And then they're trying to say, okay, now what can I do with this? Instead of just pointing at everything yeah. that's wrong with it, you know, I, I had a part in this, so I wanted to succeed. Yeah. So that sure. soldier involvement early and often is critical. Yeah. Yeah. You, we need to take a page out of the software development handbook. Yeah. So we're with the user, they recommend something, and you change it overnight so when they come back in the morning, it's there, and you continue to iterate and iterate and iterate or else they don't feel like their, their opinion counts. Yeah, well, and I, also balancing that, I think the tough job for AFC, and one of the things that I've recognized is the end user will understand the challenges and have really great input, but not necessarily have the context of what the art of the possible is, and like balancing those two things to make sure you're pushing the requirements, you're not just always being reactive, but you're also projecting the future. How, how do you tackle that? Yeah, I think, there's probably two sides of this. Not everyone's opinion is equal, right? So you have- Mine's most important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> at least second best on this stage. Um, so, <laughs> but you have to aggregate that feedback and then take it to decision making. Because what, what has happened to development programs in the past? That, well, you want this, I want, and who's, the, who's making sure that that makes sense from a total Army perspective? So getting that feedback and then, it's not filtering it out, it's, it's make, being prudent and making decisions so that you're not sending the developers just in a circle and never ending. So, so that's one piece of it. And I'd say the next piece is, when is it good enough? Because if I'm a, if I'm a developer, if I'm iterating, Oh, it's never done. Never done. And just, just keep paying me. Keep paying me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to continue iterating as long as you want. But it, we got to slap the table and say this is a min viable product and our soldiers need it. Sure. Okay, um, I'm going to try to make, it's a long question, but we're going to get to it. Um, one of the fundamental problem sets around autonomy is being able to take in the data. We know data-centric warfighting is one of the most important things that General Rainey talked about this morning, um, especially for navigation and location. So if I were to summarize this, there's advancements in computer vision, camera, radar, LIDAR technologies, but what fundamental technology improvements need to happen in industry in order to close the loop on the autonomy problem? We've got to figure out how to integrate all the things we have to do to help that problem set. The other, the, the other situation I see, we, we can get perfect autonomy over time, and we'll have a robot that we're not willing to trade for first contact, right? So we've got to keep these affordable. They're expendable. Uh, expendable yeah. has, you know, has a price tag. Certainly nothing's, you know, nothing's worth a life, but there's still, we want to be able to put these in harm's way where needed. Um, I think the integration of a lot of the technologies that, that were mentioned in the question, I think kind of gets to that point. We need to leverage as many of those as possible to have that primary alternate you know, contingency emergency navigation capabilities for when there were environments where some things are denied, GPS denied. Um, somewhere where you know, there's obscuration, so my optics aren't working and it's not working well on the battlefield. Where can we reduce LIDAR, which is nothing more than having a big light coming off your robot saying, shoot me, for anybody that's looking in that spectrum. So we, we've, got to, we've got to work, I think, a combination of those technologies to figure out how to do this best. Yeah, I, the autonomy problem is, first of all, I didn't know this until I got in this space a few years ago. All autonomy funding in the United States started with off-road autonomy from the Army. And a bunch of little companies popped up and started working this problem set. And it just proved to be too hard. The yeah. technology wasn't there. And from that was born the on-road autonomy effort that we see in self-driving cars, et cetera, today. 
it takes a human between six and nine years to learn how to maneuver a vehicle tactically so that you don't show the underbelly of the vehicle to the enemy. You don't drive on the high ground and flank yourself. These things take time for a human. But what, when we start talking about the level four autonomy where we are today, um, getting to level six autonomy is a huge step. We just need to acknowledge that we're going to continue to work on it and iterate on this, uh, and, and we'll get there. But the men viable product and having the ability to uh, get these in the hands of our soldiers, because they want full autonomy. We all want it. It's going to allow us to go 12 robots to one person. But they'll take what we have today because it's going to make their jobs better and it's going to make them safer Sorry. in the battlefield. I, I'm still stuck on it. Take six to nine years to train an armor guy how to drive a tank. Not drive, <laughs> maneuver. Okay, it's a key component. It's, you know, but I think that was I, a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, do it in four. The infantry, how long does it take you? About six, nine years? Well, you guys need us just to guard the tanks, right? Yeah, yeah. or warm up in the back. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we have two minutes left, and I think we actually made it through these one way or another, but um, 30 seconds each. Two questions, so you're going to have to be short. That's the biggest challenge. First question is, what, what is one piece of advice or ask that you have for folks in the audience on how they can be supportive in this important mission? And two, if there's anything I didn't ask you, what, what do you want people to know? And I'm going to time you. You go first. Thanks, Rob. You're it gives you more time to think. You're a gym. <laughs> um, first of all, the, what I'd like people to know is that we need this capability in our, our formations today. You, you see what's happening around the world, and it is, this is absolutely critical for our soldiers in the future. So if you're wondering whether or not to get into the robotics space, I'm asking you, get in the robotics space. And what was the first question? That was the first question. <laughs> Thank you for keeping him honest. Uh, is there anything question? I did not ask you that you want the audience to know? Okay. Uh, no, that was the second question. I answered that Maybe one. Maybe they're the same okay. answer. It's okay. Um, and this is not a winner take all scenario. Yes. Okay. If you're in the LIDAR business, start working towards non visual LIDAR. If you're in the computer vision, business continue to push that so that we don't that we can use that to not only map but maneuver um, can, there's a everyone can play in this space and so don't don't feel like it's a winner take all Rob all right Great answer. I was going to just stick with that, but let me just, just add to it. You know, we'll, we'll pay for your innovation, right? So industry's going to innovate, and, and we need to pay for it. Um, but we're also, we'll pay for it up to the point where we find another example of that innovation or that capability that's better. Uh, so we're going to be committed to kind of a, a MOSA architecture. It will evolve over time. Um, so keep paying attention to the RFIs. We're going to publish that. We're going to give it out. Uh, it's not going to be a secret of, of what, we, what the standards are. So develop to that. Don't try to sell you know, the, the Army the whole kit and caboodle. You know, I want the best platform guys building the best platforms. I want the best autonomy folks doing the best autonomy. Yep. And I want the best payload folks to figure out how to adapt their payloads to those other two. I don't need you know, one company to come in and try to do it all. It's, it's really hard to do that. Um, vendor lock, Congress doesn't particularly like it as well. Neither do uh, the soldiers. So, so do what we do well um, and, and help us go fast. So, thank Fantastic. You. We are getting the hook. Gentlemen, first of all, give them a huge round of applause. Okay. And it's been an absolute honor. And I learn something new every time. So please, please get involved in this critical mission. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Long commute. Yeah. <clears throat> Give everybody a quick uh, second to in and out. No, I don't think so. So good afternoon. I'm Major General Retired Jeff Kramer. I'm a board member here 
um, the local chapter of AUSA. And I'm going to pile on with everybody else. Welcome to our beautiful city of Huntsville. And for this afternoon's panel, I'd like to introduce the panel moderator, Ms. Kimberly Newton. She is the Deputy Director of Integration at Army Futures Command. Since joining the Army as a DA civilian in 2009, she's made stops at headquarters US Force, or Army Forcecom and also at headquarters DA G357. But before we give her the opportunity to get up and introduce the panel, I would like to reintroduce uh, Lieutenant General Kaufman, if you would like to come on up here and give your speech. Okay, um, this is a great panel and just amazing people and experts except Rob Rush. <laughs> but the, uh, this is something I'd like you to think about. It, it perplexes me. Humans and robots, which one is decisive? And so on Mondays I wake up and I say, the job of the robot is to allow the humans to get into a position of advantage over the enemy so we can impose our will. And then on Tuesday I wake up and say, you know, maybe the robots are so specialized, they're almost like working dogs, and it's the human's job to get the working dog or the robot into a position to do what only they can do. And then on Wednesday I'm just totally confounded and I, it's probably both. These robotic formations need to be able to put the humans where the humans can be decisive and put the robots where the robots can be decisive. And it, so it's not, there is no simple answer. It's what's best and what the commanders on the ground have decided. We talked a little bit about the future. And I, for those of you that uh, were here before, I apologize, but we're at autonomy level four now. We need to get to autonomy level six but it's taken us two humans for one robot, and the interventions, the number of interventions is not acceptable at this time. We need to get to one human controlling 12 robots, and the only way we're gonna do that is through autonomy, so that they can maneuver and do those skill sets on their own, which calls for real-time mapping and all types of interesting things. But you, like, how do we want them to maneuver? We want them to maneuver like water. They take advantage of the terrain to, so that it can move seamlessly across it. And without further ado, the panel's gonna take over and we're gonna start. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to Human Machine Integrated Formations. I have an amazing panel here, five distinguished uh, panelists to talk to you today and offer their perspectives on how the Army can take advantage of technology to enable, not replace, soldiers to perform their missions. We've heard a lot of conversation about HMI and human machine integration over the last several days. And so today we really want to talk a lot about, you know, the work that has, that can be offloaded to machines so that soldiers can do what soldiers do best. Make value-based uh, decisions, accept risk, and practice the art of command. So today, I have the honor to serve as the moderator for this panel. Daily, I have the pleasure to serve as the AFC Deputy Director of Integration. One of our primary missions is to provide oversight of AFC's human machine integration effort. We'd like to thank AUSA for the opportunity to host this panel and to highlight this critical topic. So in a minute, I'm gonna introduce my teammates here and give each of them a chance to, to talk to you a little bit about um, HMI from their perspective. And then while they're doing that, I would urge you to uh, take use of the cards that are gonna be coming around here in a little bit. It's really, this time is for you. We want to hear the questions that you have and give the team here a chance to uh, provide you their opinions on that. Um, and then if there's uh, follow-ups, you know, send that back up or I'm sure we can use the microphone. All right, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So sitting right here to my right, Lieutenant General Rob Rash, Jr. is the Director of Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, or RICTO, at Redstone Arsenal. 
Lieutenant General Rash is responsible for the rapid fielding of selected capabilities to deter and defeat rapidly modernizing adversaries, including overseeing development of an Army long-range hypersonic weapon. He leads the Army RICTO mission to rapidly and efficiently research, develop, prototype, test, evaluate, procure, and field critical enabling technologies and capabilities that address near-term and mid-term threats consistent with the Army's modernization priorities. Prior to this role, Lieutenant General Rash, Rash most recently served as the Program Executive Officer, Missiles in Space, again here at Redstone, here in Huntsville. Sir? Kim, thanks, and it's really an honor to be on, on this panel today, and I want to thank AUSA as well for just a tremendous showing. Uh, every year, uh, the team does great, and it seems like they get better and better, and to echo the comments earlier, this has got to be the best uh, AUSA session we've ever had. Got that plug in there for you, for you, General Brown. But excited to be here on, on the panel. Uh, it is a very distinguished panel. Um, I wish you would not have added the junior, because um, Ross Kaufman will never let me forget that. I can hear it already from the back of the room. Uh, but really excited to, to be on the panel and, and excited to be part of, of the HMI effort. So it was at this conference a year ago when General Rainey uh, got up and, and spoke uh, about kind of the future of, of warfare. And, and immediately after he came off the stage, I got summoned to go into the back room. And that's where he kind of laid out the construct of a formation uh, based, you know, ro robotic platoons at the infantry and armors. And I've still got the, I'll, I'll frame it one day, he'll be really mad if I, if I show it out, but he drew it out and I've still got it in my office, sir, um, and, and I'll keep it and I pull it out every once in a while just to, to remind me of, of what you asked us to do. Uh, the problem was at the time is we didn't, we didn't have resources, right? So there's, there's no money. So it's a good idea uh, without money and we usually say that's a hallucination, but instead it, it, became, it became a dream. Uh, and I challenged uh, our best uh, within the RICTO organization, this is kind of in RICTO's, uh, RICTO's area, of taking emerging technologies and try to give them that last shove across that valley of death, um, but, but got the right folks on the team really to, to learn about, about this technology space. And so for the last year, uh, that team has been out kind of finding out where the state of the art is uh, on technology, who's doing what to who. Uh, and, and where's their money coming from and how are they doing it and building the relationships, basically building the team. Uh, and this is a large, large team. And I, quite frankly, I had no idea when we first sat down how big the s and enterprise is, and not just government, but the IRAD efforts uh, within industry, uh, academia as well, are, have been a part of this. And, and I learned a lot from, uh, from General Kaufman because he'd been working this space uh, for several years. But, but building that team, understanding the stakeholders, uh, and, and, and trying to see how we could put together a plan to realize this vision of, of putting together the pieces and parts to get increment one out the door. So excited to, to, to be a part of it. Um, I view our job in, in increment one really is, is kind of four lines of effort, and I, I sort of describe these a little bit um, in, in the last session, but, but it really starts with, with taking all the things that, that we saw in the video and getting those hardened to a point where the number of civilian contractor vehicles that are in the parking lot behind it gets down as close to zero as we can. Uh, that, we, we've got to do that. Um, if the soldiers you know, can't operate it or every time they take it to the field, we've got to send it back and, and have it reworked again that, that we're not meeting the mark. So harden those things that we have now in that, uh, in that min, min viable product. We've got to, to focus on the network. You know, the, the, the pace, the architecture for that network is, is going to be critical. And we heard some, some stories this morning about last week how the EW systems worked really, really well, too well in some cases, uh, taking our own systems down. We've got to have a, a network architecture uh, that is solid, that is dependable, uh, because as you start adding the lethality pieces to it, um, we've got to pass that safety threshold uh, in that regard. We've got to focus on software for autonomy and software for safety. And working closely with ATEC and General Gallivan on what's good enough from a testing perspective, uh, ensuring, again, safety, safety of soldiers, um, of our soldiers is that critical point where we will not cross, uh, but getting that right. And we do those three things, and then the fourth thing, which I think uh, is, is, I try to use this with, with General Rainey as my get out of jail free card, because he says, Rob, you should be able to do all that in three weeks, not two years. Why are you taking two years? Um, it's a go slow to go fast uh, kind of construct of getting the architecture about right. 
letting industry know what that architecture is, getting them building towards that architecture to allow those future those future integration, those future increments to go faster and faster. So um, we're not going to get it all right. Uh, I absolutely know that. Um, the soldiers will, will be the first to tell us that we, we, won't, we don't have it right, uh, but that's what we're there to learn. This is a campaign of learning, and we've got a little bit of time. We don't have decades of time, but a little bit of time to get this right, but we're excited to be a part of it. Glad to be a part of this panel today, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Major General Curtis Buzzard. He's the commander of the U.S. Army Maneuver Center of Excellence in Fort Moore since July 14, 2022. Prior to that, he served as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, Plans, and Training, G357, at U.S. Army Forces Command, and as, then as the, as the 78th Commandant of Cadets of the United States Military Academy from June 2019 to May 2021. Over his 31 years of service, General Buzzard served in numerous command and staff assignments across airborne, light, and mechanized infantry and striker formations, and deployed multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan. Sir? Well, thanks, Kim. Uh, I'm also honored to be part of the, this, this panel. And General Brown, sir, thanks for sponsoring this. Former MCOE commander and General Rainey, sir, thanks for your leadership in this, in this space. Very important topic. Uh, human machine integration. Many of us are fresh off of a, you know, a great, uh, some great effort on this out at Project Convergence, out at the National Training Center, and we've also been working this in support of Futures Command down at Fort Moore, really since last year, largely too, with our experimentation force. And it really is a team effort, not just military, but with industry and academia and others on the, the panel here. And as we've discussed, I'm sure this week. The changing character of war and what we're seeing uh, adversaries now and as they're preparing for the future doing, it's really important for us to be leading in this space. And so you may wonder, well, where's the MCOE role? Where do we fit in? Well, the Maneuver Center of Excellence is the, the force modernization proponent for, uh, for maneuver brigades uh, brigade and below. And so our four types of brigades, armor, uh, infantry, striker, and our security force assistance brigades. And, and that's as we design and, and modernize the forces, that's in support of, uh, of Army Futures Command. So we work hard on the concepts describing how we're going to fight, how we think we should be organized. And we're learning each and every time we get out and use this equipment, much like General Coffin was alluding to in his opening comments. Uh, but that ideally will drive desired capabilities that we want to see developed. And ultimately, we've got to work the integration of this then across dot mil PF, so the doctrine, organization, training, et cetera, across this, this portfolio for that, that uh, brigade and below. And as we've been working it, several themes have emerged, and these are, I'm sure, largely consistent with what you've heard throughout the week. You know, one is having this operational approach that starts with, or is really informed by how you want to fight. What tasks do you want HMI to accomplish? Not as individual systems, but as integrated capabilities to enable formations. The goal is not a separate uh, capability, but something that can bring to bear, uh, that will really could have multiplicative effects. Secondly, don't trade blood at first contact. We've got to use robots for that. Shame on us if we don't. Um, when multiple HMI capabilities can use multiple payloads, you're able to, to sense, protect, attrit, uh, kill, um, you know, make quicker decisions, all this, uh, and, and again, not putting people in harm's way but we, where we don't need to. And uh, third, nested in that is this idea of offloading risk and work. And there's, somebody came up with this phrase, dull, dirty, dangerous, you know, dull being Something may not be super exciting, but still very important. Could be a static LP, OP that's observing. Could be some small resupply uh, that we could do uh, robotically or with HMI. Dirty, you know, chemical or biological detection. We don't want to put people in harm way. We can use HMI capability to do that. Or dangerous, like we worked out at Project Convergence, a team that, you know, a, a combined arms breach, a role there, support by fire position, other things that we can use to, uh, to enable our formations and, uh, and offload risk and work. Enabling decision making and reduce cognitive load, you know, leveraging data, uh, machine learning and AI. I mean, just as an example, think of a small UAS or some type of sensor, air, you know, airborne or on the ground that has aided target recognition and can identify what, it, what tank that is on the ground. That takes away, you know, maybe us having to memorize all the combat vehicle ID from the air. It tells what it is. 
It, 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 can, it knows where it sits in the high payoff target list. It, it knows the attack guidance matrix, so we can shift to what's the most appropriate capability to then destroy that, and it can then enable the commander to make that decision that much more, more rapidly and, and ideally connected to luring munitions and other capabilities um, that are airborne, which really, which really leads to my next point on seeking commonality and integration. Um, it's not so much about the platform, it's really about the payload. We hope that the platforms are somewhat common so we can sustain them um, more and more easily, maybe with the rail system so you can rotate different, whether it's EOIR and electromagnetic sensing or direction finding capability, counter UAS. We can rotate these on them. It's really about having an open architecture and the, and the software that will enable them to integrate and not be, again, one-off capabilities. They can operate it as, as, as a system and ideally, again, on a common network with a common controller so we don't have many of the young soldiers right now are carrying individual controllers for individual systems, but we should be able to have a common one and not nine antennas either, uh, but a single one that allows us to, to operate more expeditiously. And then lastly, uh, in support of, you know, the chief has emphasized this point, but about continuous transformation. As General Rainey likes to say, you know, perfect is the enemy of good enough. Uh, we've got to get good enough capability out there, get it in the, sol in the hands of soldiers, let them experiment with them, and also think about how to employ our legacy systems. What, how can we augment them to bring them into this space to also, also contribute? So, you know, closing, I would just say the Maneuver Center of Excellence has a rich history of innovation from the Airborne Test Platoon to Tank Infantry School to General Moore and Air Cav, uh, Air Cav Tactics, and we're excited to be, uh, to be a part of this, uh, this team effort which is really what it is, so thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, next, Dr. Rob Ambrose, the Director for Space and Robotics Initiatives at the Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station and the Associate Director of the Texas A&M Space Institute. He joined the faculty of Texas A&M accepting the J. Mike Walker Chair in Mechanical Engineering in August of 2021. His research interests are in the space systems for defense, security, and commercial applications, as well as robotics and autonomous systems for helping humans on Earth. Dr. Ambrose retired from NASA in August 2021, where he served in the SES, or Senior Executive Service, as the Chief of the Software, Robotics, and Simulation Division at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Ambrose? Thank you, and I want to thank uh, General Rainey and the Army for inviting me and including me in this. Uh, as you heard, I am now a professor at Texas A&M, and uh, really enjoying that. Uh, the young people are uh, much better than uh, people complain about. If anyone's telling you, uh, you know, kids these days, you know, they need to come to A&M and see our kids. These 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 young people are. Uh, really uh, amazing, and I think our future's in good hands if we give them the right tools. And so that's on us older folks to make sure we do that. Uh, when I was at NASA, my job was to help astronauts do what I think are some of the hardest jobs in the solar system and uh, come home to tell the tale. Uh, we were building advanced new kinds of robots that would be part of that team, uh, a team of uh, humans and robots working together, uh, which uh, was a fascinating set of challenges. Uh, we, we, my, my division was created to go figure out how to assemble the space station with a team of humans and robots. And we did it. It was an amazing feat. We learned a lot. And we then turned our gaze towards the, the moon and planning how uh, we could uh, deploy logistics, uh, set up habitats, and support humans in extremis on the moon. Uh, one of the things that I learned uh, in, in you know, two or three decades working in that area, is that when you put robots in a team with people, it's, it's very easy to think of the, the, the robots like people, especially if you're asking them to do jobs that maybe decades ago were done by people. It's, it's easy to, maybe humans want to anthropomorphize these machines, even when they don't look anything like a human. Uh, I had the opportunity to build some robots of all different types, including ones that look remarkably human, but even those, you've got to remember, they are not a human. And so that's a trap you can fall into, but it's really missing a, a better opportunity. You really want to exploit the differences. You want to leverage the difference that a robot has uh, in comparison to the human teammates. So for example, 
a, you know, a NASA formation, if, if I could use that term, uh, a, a spacewalking team. They're on the clock. They've got about eight hours in their spacesuit. And so everything is very urgent. And the tempo, the pace, it's practiced. Uh, time is of the essence. But I reminded people that a robot can hold its breath a long time. And so do you really want that robot in the airlock with the astronaut sitting for six hours pre-breathing to go out? No, it, it, it could already be outside. It could have been outside for days, weeks, months. Uh, how to use a machine that's just very different than, than, than a person is, is something we, we have to constantly think about. The other th thing I want you to, to remember is, you know, uh, the general said good enough. You know, good enough might be as good as it gets because the technology is moving so fast that to get from that 80% to the 100%, you're just wasting your time because tomorrow's robots are gonna be so much better. So it's galloping right now. The technology is galloping. And so it's, it's not just figuring out what the right answer it is, it's figuring out what the right answer is today, tomorrow, and the next day, and to be ready to roll with that. Uh, but what an amazing time to live in. If I could die and be reincarnated as one of my 22-year-old students right now, you know, what a time. To, to be in this field. Uh, General Kaufman said, if, if you're not in robotics, you need to get there. Uh, I agree. If you've got kids who would like to study robotics, send them to Texas A&M, and uh, we'll get them started right, give them the tools to, to really have an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Chris Orlowski. He's the Assistant Director and the Growth Lead for Land Systems Andrel Industries. Dr. Orlowski joined Andrel in the fall of 2023 after retiring after 20 plus years of service in the United States Army. His final assignment in the US in the Army was the product manager for robotic combat vehicle in the US Army PEO ground combat systems. He led a team to design, implement, and execute the programs responsible for delivering the hardware and software programs for the robotic combat vehicle family of systems. Chris. Thank you, Kim, for the wonderful introduction. Um, truly honored and humbled to be here about part of this uh, distinguished panel, General Rainey, everyone here. I'm glad, glad to provide my thoughts and insights um, to just to highlight a couple things. I had some comments, but it sounds like the RICTO, some of the great things they're doing has already uh, crushed a couple of those comments, so I'll save those for later. But uh, uh, it does take a team. I just um, said what you're doing is all I said. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I was saying. It's like it does take a team to deliver these systems. Uh, we worked close in hand with GVSC, the Armament Center, C5ISR Center when I was in the seat at RCV. Um, my wingman, who I don't think is here, but Major Corey Wallace did wonderful work to push the requirements forward uh, for RCV and deliver it. And one thing I wanted to highlight was, not only does we work as a team, but I think under General Kaufman and General Norman in the CFT, is they did an excellent job of communicating the current state of thinking, the current state of requirements to industry. And I've I was ready to say, like, I would encourage that, and it's great to see with all the things that the, uh, the RICTOs released in just the past few weeks of things that they're looking for, requirements they're looking for, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, there are ways and spaces to do, the, uh, can tell, tell industry what you're thinking, so as an industry, from an industry's perspective now, we can say, hey, um, that might be something we want to invest in, that might be something we can deliver to, uh, that might be something we want to create a new uh, business line for and go after capture work because we think we have something that can push the capability forward. So we could encourage, you can engage with industry as much as possible, um, engage with industry in the right forums. Um, just saw that uh, I think AUVSI sponsored a panel out at Compact Fleet uh, the last fall where they did secret level discussions about uh, user stories, user problems for complex, for pack fleet, and brought in a bunch of industry partners to do that. So I thought that was a pretty cool thing uh, to, to talk to and recommend. And continue forward, um, one of the things I thought of and I talked to a couple of folks about this recently, is one of the things I learned on the government side um, from industry was the concept of operational design domains. So from a commercial automotive, spec, like automotive vehicle perspective, you know, things are much further along on the highway than they are in the city. And that's, you could argue, it's because of the highway driving and even watching my own kids drive, they do much better on the highway they do in the city. Uh, it's an easier problem to learn, the, 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 the factors, the complexity is not as much um, as it would be driving in a city, for example. And I think if we look at going forward from an HMIF perspective and integrating robots into human formations is where can the robots provide a 
autonomy and automation now, and where can they grow forward? So, like one of the phrases I started, I used when we were in our, still in RCV was, if you just break down what we actually have in the Army and the opera, operational mode summary and mission profile of primary road, secondary road, cross country, robots are going to do a lot more today on primary roads as you get closer to cross country mobility. And I stopped saying off road personally because it has different connotations. But in the cross country mobility autonomously, there are some challenges and there's a lot of people investing in that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be having autonomy in certain places now. Uh, one of my bad things, if you want to put a truck on a road at night and you're not really worried about what happens with anything on that road and you can control access to the road, we can do that today. We can do that tomorrow. You don't need to um, continue to invest in that. That's a capability that exists today as, as an example. And so could encourage where do those where are capabilities now and then as experimentation and capabilities continue to emerge, where do you add it more challenging and complexity? Uh, so one of the things that we often looked at with RCV when I was there was what are the spectrum constraints? And I know General Rash mentioned from a PACE perspective, we did a lot of studies with DEVCOM C5 ISR. But what's the available spectrum? What are alternative networks? How do you start fusing those things together? But then we also played those in a, in a simulated, contested, and congested environment. And I think the next step really is how do we start looking at playing those in certain areas um, where we can get after from a community perspective how are those systems revolved and resilient? We're seeing those open source uh, intel reports from Ukraine, understanding what happens, and not just Ukraine and other places, but experimenting more, testing more. Uh, to pull you a plug in for the Indiana National Guard, it used to at least uh, in Miskatatuck in Indiana. You could do about whatever you wanted, they didn't care. I don't know if that's still the case, um, but that was something we used to do in a past job when I was at DARPA. Um, and then the one is being in the great state of Alabama, as an avid Detroit Lions fan, I need to thank um, thank you for Jameer Gibbs and Brian Branch. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. And now, last but not least, Dr. John Brennan is the General Manager, Public Sector of Scale AI. He serves customers with machine learning and artificial intelligence strategies, data infrastructure, models, and operations across the military departments and federal agencies. With 25 years of experience across the public and private sectors, John has developed and led programs in cloud computing, data science in support of intelligence collection and analysis, cybersecurity, new product innovation, and supply chain. He started his career as an Army infantry officer serving in Korea and at the Old Guard in Washington, D.C. Later, he served in Afghanistan with the Central Intelligence Agency. John? Thank you so much, Kim, for that introduction. Congratulations on your assignment. And General Rainey and General Kaufman, thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. There's a small number of times in our lives where we experience alien technology. Uh, it's happened three times for me. The first was when I was in Korea and I was introduced to a thermal imaging site and could literally see you know, humans at far distance at night um, as if they were next to me. The second time was seeing that computer vision applied to geospatial intelligence. And the third time was last month. When I was in Korea, it used to take 16 people to carry a dismounted 50 cal to the top of a hill with all the ammunition and barrels and tripods you would need. Last month, uh, I saw a self-driving 50 cal. That's alien tech. Um, there is a revolution in military affairs going on, certainly. Whether we embrace it or not, it's fundamentally altering and how we conceptualize, plan, and execute military operations, with human-machine integration at its core next. Humans, as capable as we are, we have cognitive frailties. We're not good at things, and those all become magnified when you're tired, wet, under stress, and bombarded with information. Machines do not. AI and human-machine integration will be the key of a new operational art. Um, let the machines, as we've heard, take the first contact. Let's help them deliver excellence in maneuver. Let's teach them to resupply us and themselves faster and achieve higher accuracy in the effects that we need to deliver on the battlefield. Autonomy should not be binary. It's not a zero or one. You can achieve semi or partial autonomy that is equally useful. And in terms of AI ML processes, there are a number of things to think about that are similar to how we train humans. We come to trust humans because we train them, and then we test them, and then we confirm that the training has taken hold. We see them reinforce it in real life, in practice. 
This is exactly how we turn civilians into soldiers. We train them in fitness, marksmanship, unit tactics, land navigation, and then we have them demonstrated in exercises to know that they're ready for war. That same process of training and testing and reinforcing is exactly how AI models are built. The model is its data. The data is the model. All machine learning models start off at an elementary level, and it's only through additional training, testing, and refining them that they come to develop the capabilities we want them to have. First, you teach a car how to drive straight and stop. Later, you teach a car how to properly go around a van doing deliveries stopped in front of you. Like, AI, like humans, AI doesn't have to be perfect to be useful. Even semi-autonomy is helpful. Even a few false positives and false negatives will be useful. Commanders already know that the first report from the front is going to have some level of inaccuracy in it. In fact, if you go back to the last time we were in a conflict with China, there were a number of reports along the front lines that the Chinese divisions had crossed into Korea, but the humans ignored them. Uh, and that's how we had battles like the Chosen Reservoir, where 125,000 Chinese faced off against a Marine division of 25,000. This requires a paradigm shift in how we think about fielding technology. You have to be willing to field technology that's good enough, and that that's your starting point for iterating. Our vision must be incremental advancements, iterative improvements, and deployable results all along the way. It's important to view the journey towards AI integration and autonomy across the spectrum. Striving for total level six self-driving cars is how you get lane assist and brake assist which happens for me frequently driving around DC. My car just stops before I hit the car in front of me. Um, that's important for our families. It's also important for our war fighters. We need all those incremental improvements along the way. So what do you do to get there? The first is you must have structured AI-ready data. It's fundamental to all the other work. You cannot contemplate building any sort of model for automated target recognition or perception engineering for autonomy if you don't have training data. Um, it requires an army level approach. You will lack the compute and the engineering talent for each PEO to do their own thing. And then finally, stop throwing away your data. All of that data is useful. It needs to be labeled for either uh, computer vision for autonomy or computer vision for ATR. I look forward to the conversation today. Great, thank you. All right, just a reminder before we jump into the questions, um, we'll tee up a couple, but please, fill out those cards and send them down and um, we'll make sure that we get them into the rotation. All right, General Rash, I will not, I'll give you a bye and not pick on you first. Oh. Sorry, General Buzzard. Um, just to set the conditions as we start, um, you know, everyone's kind of uh, provided some experiences as you all gave your introductions. Um, really based on those types of things that from the past, how do you see HMI equipped formations enabling maneuver on the future battlefield? Well, uh, I, one, I'd like to build on a, a point Dr. Ambrose made. You know, we have an experimentation force, a company minus, that's been employing this technology really for the last probably nine months or so. And it really is a mindset shift. I mean, interestingly, I think the commander, if he were to tell you what he thought at the beginning and what he thought at the end, or how he was employing the capability, he was reticent to lose it. He was worried about the quadruped dog. It looks like a dog. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but he didn't want to put it in harm's way, but that's the point. You know, this mindset shift to think about, should a robot do this or should I put soldiers uh, in harm's way? And so what, what's so great about the, the demonstration that was done out of Project Convergence is it really helps a whole lot of other people visualize how this capability can make our formations better. When you see, robotic capability, you know, clearing, leading the way into buildings, looking, all, all, all these things you can see and sense prior to, uh, to first contact are different. And, you know, I think about as a small example, again, small UAS, you think about our, our battle drills and what we train lieutenants and basic officer leader course, you know, why would you go into a building or a trench or anything without being able to see into it first and maybe have an effect? And that could be ground, air-based, whatever. Um, so I think, uh, you know, this will impact doctrine. I mean, what's really neat is how this experimentation force has built a, a tactical SOP or a tax op on how to employ this capability. Many of them, little, little battle drills, how they use this collectively in an integrated way to, uh, you know, to aid in the mission. I think a lot of what, what, uh, 
you know, how it'll um, enable maneuver is really kind of what I touched on, this ability to see an impact beyond an intervisibility line, beyond line of sight, to be able to, to see, to sense, to use electromagnetic signature detection capability, to direction find things emitting, to be able to bring to bear loading munitions on this, and then to be able to do other things like resupply, and it, it, it's going to change and I think enable the pace to be quicker, both the kill chain as well as just their ability to maneuver and, uh, and operations, and then you blend in there all the other things with, with data and aided target recognition and all these things that are going to enable uh, commanders, but it's still about the people. A whole lot of this is about, is about young people's ability to embrace it and visualize and understand how this can be used to great effect, and I think that's what's going to be great about our experimentation force. I think they'll be able to help the rest of the force really embrace this, not that they wouldn't anyway, but, but because they've seen it in action, I tell you, they want this stuff. Everybody that's used it, uh, they want it. They want it in their formation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So kind of to pull that thread, really, um, as we talk about the biggest considerations for industry, really, um, as we look at meeting demands for HMI requirements at the brigade and below level, what would you... Um, what would you tell our industry partners? Some From me? Yes. Um, some of them would probably have some, some, uh, some, some good ideas too. I think, uh, you know, one we've touched on, I think I heard earlier, this idea of an open architecture and really the software and this ability to enable the integration. You know, oftentimes, you know, General Rainey uh, is always giving great guidance to all of us. It's about, but not these one trick ponies. You know, this is about integrated capabilities to enable formations. And it's got to be an agile development process. It can't be a 10-year and it spits out the perfect solution. It's two to three. We're handing something, you know, we're getting something in soldiers' hands and we're, we're updating it, iterating on it, getting soldier touch points and, and feedback. You know, I do think there's a, uh, there's, um, there's a balance, or maybe it's not a balance, but some stuff needs to be really good, maybe the Gucci version of something, and then some stuff needs to be very simple and, uh, and attritable and lethal. I mean, things that we can, we can employ very rapidly, and a company commander cannot worry about the, it's on its property book and doing the flipple afterwards, you know, that we can, so there's this mass versus precision almost in this space also. I think, I think multiplicative effects is an important piece of this. I also think, uh, you know, things that are also marsupials. If there's robotic capability or HMI capability that's able to bring to bear other capability, ideally at some point these things are, you know, coming off one another. You might have a, an FPV coming off some other type of aerial system or a ground capability coming off, a, you know, ground robotic capability coming off a ground capability. So I think that's something just to think about even as we go, as we go forward. But the, just a couple things from my space, but I think, you know, Colonel, or General Rash and uh, others here probably got some, some good points too. Uh, thank you, sir. Chris, John, did you want to jump in? Yes, please. Uh, just one add, the comment of the, uh, added the open architecture comment. Um, I think it's important that that is not conducted behind closed doors and that that architecture has industry participation. And one of the best examples I've seen of that is um, the Air Forces it used to start it off as UAS control interface, but then it became the universal control interface. Uh, but the Air Force put in place a consortium of multiple companies, all those folks integrated or interested in that space as an example. I'm not saying this is the way it has to be done. And then they used an FFRDC to manage it in Lincoln Labs. And the way it was is everybody got a little piece and everybody voted on the interfaces, everybody voted on the standard and the architecture implementation. And OMS and UCI, which has been proliferated across the Air Force and other places, has done that. And I would encourage um, that as there are thoughts, I think the government should own the architecture, should own the reference architecture so everybody can play. Um, but as we continue through that, make sure industry is a part of that so that there aren't things being asked that are hard to implement or um, could be improved on. You may be asking for something um, that could be constraining or putting a requirement in that could be constraining what industry can do and deliver capability faster. If I could just add, um, I can't underscore enough how difficult the fight before you is. It is the status quo bias. If you think back to the 1990s, that was the first time we saw a UAV and we were, we were searching for persons indicted for war crimes in Yugoslavia. And the Air Force left Yugoslavia, and the CIA left Yugoslavia, and they met again on a battlefield in Afghanistan. And 
the Air Force showed up with B-52s because their culture is to have a pilot in the seat. The CIA showed up with armed predators. So at every level of what you buy, how you train, your requirements, you assume a human is going to do everything. You have to fundamentally rethink. It's not soldier touch points, it's robot touch points. They're going to come after network capacity just like the commanders do. They're going to need more electrons than you do. They'll give you their water, but they're going to take your electrons. So at every level, the bureaucracy is going to resist. And it's going to take extremely high persistent degrees of leadership at every level to overcome that status quo bias. Now, we can see what's happening in Ukraine, but we will forget. And when we forget, the leadership needs to be back again. Thank you. All right, we've talked um, a couple times about Project Convergence, and we saw some of the video that we just recently had from the experiment last week. Um, General Rash, Project Convergence, the focus you know, seemed to be on weapon platforms for autonomy and robotics. Is there or will there be something similar for non-lethal mission-critical vehicles, say cargo loaders or ammo handling, and how can industry be a part of that? Yes. No, absolutely, and, and kind of a carryover from, from the last conversation uh, over with General Coffin. Those are probably some of the low-hanging fruits, right? Um, those things, the, the burden of, of safety uh, for logistics is going to be lower from a testing perspective. Um, it gets back to, you know, how quickly can we integrate? How mature is the technology? How quickly can we, can we integrate? We could do a lot of that stuff today, and, and we saw a lot of that last week, um, quite frankly. Uh, some of the UASs were doing resupply with those capabilities. So, so the technology's there already. Uh, from an industry perspective, um, look for those RFIs, be a part of those consortiums, and, and we're not starting from scratch. So it's, it, this isn't starting today. This has started years and years ago. GVSC and C5ISR and uh, Armament Center up at Picatinny have all been working these pieces uh, uh, over time. So we've got a good starting point. We, we need input from industry. Uh, what we don't need is another common controller. Um, common, the common controllers, as I've seen over the last couple of days, are not very common because uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to neck that down. Uh, but, but be a part of the solution um, and, and seeing how your capabilities can fit in this train or this, this robot architecture as it continues to grow. Thank you, sir. We've also talked quite a bit about um, training and um, Joel Rainey highlighted in a, some of his comments earlier about leader development, um, other aspects of DOTML PFP. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, really from a sustainment perspective, when you look at that, and this is for each one of you, but we'll start with uh, Dr. Ambrose. How, does the, how do you envision HMI altering or impacting future sustainment footprints? <clears throat> I'll give you an analogy to another industry. Uh, if you look at uh, medicine, you know, the modern hospital, some of the first entrance into that for, you know, from the robotics industry were surgical robots, and they got a lot of attention, and they're, they're pretty darn good, by the way. But the industry is now stepping back and realizing that most of the other things that they uh, have in a modern hospital need automation also. You know, the, the, the scalpel is the shiny thing at the tip of the spear, but this incredible army of people staffing a hospital uh, is very expensive. And most of those people are the real sources of infection and other changes that, that, that they really need to make in the hospital. So it's an industry that started with the, the, the pointy end of the spear and then stepped back to think about uh, just the flow of the people and the materiel through this this complicated thing called the modern hospital, and I think uh, there's an opportunity here as well. You know, clearly, you know, our, our, our minds are drawn to the you know the, the urgency of a formation in battle, uh, but miles behind that, weeks behind that, before that, uh, how did all that material get there, and, uh, and then how do you sustain it in place? You know, I think. Uh, behind the army will be the robots making that possible. And uh, honestly, I think a lot of those challenges are, are simpler. That is the lower hanging fruit. It might not be as glamorous, 
But you know, I, I, I've been assured that the Army is the world's expert, the U.S. Army is the world's expert in logistics. So if uh, anybody can understand it, I think the folks in this room can. Uh, of course, skinning up the, the logistical pyramid with, with robots mixed into the formation, that's already a good thing to do. But then automating the logistical support uh, would be a, a next logical step. And I think it, it would allow you to concentrate your, your people where it matters and uh, kind of uh, de-staff some of the logistical behind, uh, behind the formation. I think that's a, a logical thing and I think a lot of those tasks are already something that are within reach that don't need as, you know, don't need as many miracle breakthroughs in research. Great. Any other? Did so I'd add a comment there. I'd, I would challenge that depending on the system and depending on how fast that technology is moving, do we maybe need to look at a different model where we're not truly sustaining these systems over a long period of time? And that maybe over three to five years or 10 years, and it's going to vary by whatever the system is, we buy new and just completely replace. Because I think especially when you look at hybrid technology and battery technology, and if anybody's ever driven an electric vehicle or hybrid for a long time, you learn that after a while your battery kind of sucks and it doesn't work as well as it used to. And does it make sense to actually go and replace that or does it make sense to, re or I should say fix it or upgrade it or actually replace the whole system and get something new? So it's something we thought about, but it's, that's a, from a cultural standpoint, that's a hard thing to get certain folks in the Army to turn their heads on. Right? So. Absolutely, thank you. So one of the things that um, we've talked, several of us have talked about, you know, and Don mentioned about a paradigm shift in how we field technologies. And one of the things we've really been looking at is an iterative approach for how we do this. To your point, you know, we, we capitalize on new, on new ads to the technology, better capability. But one of the things, and actually, Dr. Ambrose, I'd like to go to you first, but we talk about cost. Right. So, how um, you know how if we could get the reduction in a in a robot cost, you know, how does that? How do you think that changes how we would employ them? And then, where do you think in that cost curve, you know, that that knee in the cost curve is? Right. Well, that's that question. I think is a good follow on to what uh, Chris was just saying. Uh, at some point, when you step back and say, is it cost effective to repair this versus just move on? Uh, you move on, and especially if you move on with a much better product, right? Because remember, the technology is, is moving. But think about the you know, another modular system that you guys know very well, you know, a gun and ammo. That's kind of a modular system. If a co the cost of the robots gets down to the cost of ammo, then you put a lot more of your money in the gun. And right now, that in, our, in, the, in a modular system, what is the equivalent of the gun that shoots robots? I don't see that really, but you know, the thing that's deploying robot after robot after robot, and they're short-lived, we would never do that with people again. These are machines. Very low cost, um, quickly deployed, no sustainment. Tomorrow's ammo will be better, smart ammo. What is the system that, that shoots robots? And if you get the cost of the robot down to the point that it's like ammo, uh, well, I know you guys spend a lot on ammo too, <laughs> but uh, when you get it down to that, that price point, uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, the, the way you would start to use it would change as well. That you wouldn't be afraid of taking shots that miss. You would take more shots on goal, so to speak. Uh, my uh, uh, executive assistant's son just joined the Army, and the first report back from him in boot camp was free ammo. <laughs> I think that's a good sign. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, you know, if, you, if we get the robots down to that price point, uh, and that's a total mind shift for our, our industrial partners, right? In the aerospace industry, our industry figured out how to make profit making one spacecraft every five years, right? That's a, that's a skill, I guess, you know, to be able to do that. It's complicated, but being able to mass produce things, you know, we, we have that ability also in America and you know, being able to tap into that, I think that's an important thing here. And we can get the price point down on these machines, down to the price of ammo, uh, then it will totally change the way you use 
uh, robots as a part of your formation. Yeah, I'll just add, um, we've done this before. Uh, it's been encapsulated as rights law, uh, where when they went back and studied the production of aircraft in World War II, for every order of magnitude improvement in volume, you got an order of magnitude improvement in cost. Um, so we mostly talk about right, uh, Moore's law, but equally important is rights law. And so uh, the replicator effort, the department, sending a signal to industry that we're going to buy lots of these things and they need to be low cost and attributable will start hopefully that flywheel of rights law. Thank you very much. All right, so we've talked a lot about um, these different robots and what humans can do, what they can do. This question really talks about, um, in the past there was, there was an interest in exoskeletons and exosuits where you were you know, improving the physical capabilities of the, of the warfighter by what we've been talking here about actually adding other robots. So with the current focus in Indopaycom and autonomous vehicles and distancing the humans and the human factor for first contact, is there still a determination and need to develop this type of exoskeleton or exosuit technology? We'll go as much as the paratroopers complain about their backs, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Sean <laughs> Buzzard. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I personally haven't seen any any of that yet. I know that's been under you know under development for a while. I think anything that can imp improve human performance is a very important thing we should look at. Um, I wouldn't be in a position necessarily to prioritize where that fits right now in, in uh, ongoing efforts, but I but I think it is an important initiative. I think should still, yeah, I think it's still important to consider. Joe Rash, anything to add? That's a requirements question. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so to follow on, one of the, um, the bigger conversations that we seem to have all the time is really about risk and confidence. And so can we talk about you know, the risk and confidence of autonomous systems and lethal actions? I'll start with General Rash. So that, that, that is the key to being able to go fast, right? So is to build that, that confidence in the systems. Um, and and to, to General Buzzard's point just a little while ago, when you talk about that X4 and when we saw them back in, I think it was October, mm -hmm. uh, down at Fort Moore versus when we saw them uh, just a few, just last week, was it last week? Week before, last week at an NTC for uh, Project Convergence. The confidence in the system uh, grew tremendously, not because the system got any better, um, but because the soldiers understood the capabilities and just as important the limitations of the technologies they had and they had adopted, adapted their techniques for utilizing them based upon that. So we get at that through testing, we get at that through training, we get at that through reps and sets uh, of iteration and, and I think that's an important thing that we do early on in this effort is involve those soldiers um, to, and continue to involve them uh, through this development so they build confidence over time. So every time we bring it to them, it's not the first time they've seen the robot, they're just looking to see well, what, what have, how have you improved it and made it, made it you know, mow better. Uh, and then as we, as we you know, get those soldiers proliferated throughout the Army, you know, you've now got not just a single unit of excellence, you've got people throughout the workforce uh, or throughout our, our units and formations that understand what they bring to the, to the table. I think the tricky area will be you know, AI um, when we start bringing in machine learning. You know, from, a, from a testing perspective, uh, when you start getting into the non-deterministic uh, aspects of that, that's something that we've got to work very closely with, uh, with General Gallivan and his team, ATEC, as well as OSD. They'll certainly have a role in that, and, and Congress will, I'm sure, have an opinion as well uh, to make sure we get that right and, and not test, you know, not, not test forever, but, but test a good enough and maybe initially start off with AIML in areas that necessarily don't have lethality at the end of that chain, uh, but in some other areas where we still have that human you know, that human in, in the loop from a decision, final decision making uh, perspective to provide final, you know, a final assessment of what the machine has learned uh, to identify a target or, or identify something in the battle space. I just, if, I, if I could just add on to that, I think, you know, this idea, we, they have, they've got to build trust. I mean, that, that's what this gets down to and in, in, uh, in our experimentation force, you know, has, I mean, they have it obviously employed it in combat or anything, but they're, uh, you know, it's, it's not perfect right now yet. You know, there is range, 
you know, frequency competition, there's some range challenges with how far away you can control a little bit with endurance, but they can visualize, they can see the potential of this and, uh, and they're trusting in the way forward. And I think we'll have to get it out in the hands of soldiers in the operational force, you get it to combat training centers. And I mean, it's really, I mean, John's point on where, where UAS came, who you know, fought against it. When you realize what it can do for you and how it can really enable your formation, you want it and more. And I also think we've got to really cull the right lessons out of the ongoing conflict of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. There's examples where this works. Now it's changing, you know, that's a continually evolving conflict, but there's, uh, um, you know, I'm trying to, at, at, at Fort Moore as an example, I mean, we're, we're exposing every young soldier is getting exposed to enemy UAS. Uh, a lot of our leaders are employing UAS and, you know, just talking UAS in general is a, is a small part of this. But um, when you use it and fly it, you think about how to do things differently. You think about how to fight differently, and we need to be in that space across the whole HMI uh, formation thing. And that's why we're, again, so excited to have our experimentation force as a big part of this in support of what, what Army Futures Command's, uh, you know, working towards. So. Thanks, sir. Anything to add? Well, uh, looking around the audience, I think we're looking a little old. Uh, <laughs> uh, you look at the... Uh, folks that are coming into the Army you know, about the age of my students, uh, uh, they don't seem to have the hang up that a lot of older Americans have with being afraid of robots. Uh, you know, maybe we just saw too many bad movies. But the, the younger generation is much more willing to try and test and experiment and, uh, they're, and they're good at it too. You know, I would put the American video gamer up against anybody in the world. I mean, these people have skills. So I think they're going to be much quicker to embrace and, and try things and, and learn and evolve. And I, I, uh, I encourage you to, to let them try and give them the technology and, and let them experiment with it. And uh, they will, they'll be very quick to uh, embrace things. And uh, so there's really the two levels of trust. There's the objective and serious concerns we have with trust. But then there are just more of the, the nuance or subjective issues. I, I don't think the younger generation have those latter ones. I think they just want to get right into it and figure out what objectively is working that I can trust and what is not working that I need to avoid. Uh, let them dive into it and I, I assure you uh, that the next generation is going to embrace this technology and do great things with it. But it does take uh, training. So teaching a generative transformer to solve math problems you have, humans have to write out 800,000 instructions, and you can score an 89% on the next AP calculus test with that knowledge. So how do you translate that to computer vision? Okay, what does an enemy combatant look like? All right, now what does one look like that's surrendering or, or is wounded? You have to have all the dimensions of warfare in the model. Thank you. All right. This next one, um, actually, General Rash, we'll go right to you. Will the Army establish a single PM or PEO for robotics? <laughs> <laughs> they highlight that currently we're split between PEO, CS, and CSS for SMET and for GCS for the RCV. It seems inefficient. Should we consolidate all ground robotics in the future? So it's a good thing I'm not Mr. Bush. Um, that's, a, that's a Mr. Bush <laughs> kind of question. but. But certainly it poses a good point and something that we need to think about. Something we've actually, quite frankly, already been thinking about is, is, is how to look at this on the backside of, of, these, uh, of the S&T efforts of the early prototyping and how we carry it forward. Um, so I think we need to do a little, a little analysis. Certainly when you look at, at say, SMET, and you look at RCV, you know, they're, they're vehicles, one's tracked, one's wheeled. Uh, initially, they kind of spawn from different requirement sets. Um, but now as we look at it a little closer, there is a lot of commonality uh, between what we want the platform to do. So uh, it's something that we'll be in discussion with to see how, how we lay that out going forward. Um, when you talk about a PEO for robots, um, that, might be, that might be overkill. I mean, because you're going to bring UASs into that as well. How about every payload? Does that now fall under that robotics area? Um, I, I don't necessarily think that's the case. Um, 
because we have expertise across a lot of different program executive offices aligned with a lot of different S&T centers and industry partners that work in that space that are very good at like managing their commodities. And we do systems of systems of stuff right now. So, you know, in, when I was a PEO for Missiles in Space, you know, we, we tried to get out of the habit of building our own radios because PEOC 3T does those pretty darn well, and instead levying our requirements on, on them to build the radio and configuration manage that radio. And so I kind of look at a lot of the things that make robots special, which isn't the robot, it's the things that we put on it, the payloads. Um, a lot of those are already managed outside of any sort of robotics area. So those might stay common, but, uh, or where they are now, but I, I do think we need to look at how we manage this uh, over the long term from an autonomous platform perspective. And that'll be, you know, thank goodness, not, not Rob Rash's decision. That'll be uh, something for Honorable Bush and uh, the ASALT team to pick up. Yeah, and, I, and I'd just add, I mean, not, not, on the, not to get into the PO realm, but there the really are cross-cutting capabilities. And right, right now, we're just looking at, a, you know, a platoon formation in a battalion, you know, within a, within a brigade. And, uh, but you can imagine separate brigades having requirements when you think about breaching and wet gap crossings and other things where they might be supporting a division. You can think about this capability at, at echelon, at divisions, cores above brigades. And, and so having the right governance model is something that, that I know AFC, everybody's really, really trying to think through because it's an important one to get right given the, uh, you know, what General Rash was just talking about with respect to the, the platform versus the, the payload, which is where really I think all the centers of excellence have equities and different things that they wanted to, to be able to do for them. So it's an it's a, it's important point. Thank you. So this next one, pull the thread a little bit more on that. So you were getting this clear demand signal for HMI-related enablers and kit. We've also heard that commander's intent to accelerate experimentation. We've talked a little bit about that. So in going first to you, General Buzzard, how can the Army increase access to tech, data, capital, information systems, and soldier touch points for academic and industry partners? And then how can the Army reduce the burden of failure in favor of learning? What was the second part? How can the Army reduce the burden of failure in favor of learning? Um, I mean, I think as we talked earlier, it really is a, a team approach here. It's a community of interest between military, academia, private sector, um, and we've got to figure out venues to to bring these minds together, you know, at the micro tactical level at, at, at Fort Moore, what, what we're trying to do is we've carved out space in our maneuver battle lab and are working outreach with universities in the local area with, with West Point. Uh, we had one of their uh, faculty members who works very hard on robotics was up at AI2C at Carnegie Mellon, come in for 90 days. And the, this idea of bringing them periodically together to uh, you know, to work these issues, because a lot of these young people we're going to learn more from than, than, than I'm going to, uh, you know, give, give, uh, give guidance to them. So I think that's important. I think you've seen across the Army, too, a variety. Uh, there's innovation labs in virtually every unit, and there's, there's funding that they're able to use to, to experiment. And what we've stood up also to kind of help, um, you know, bracket that to some degree, I guess, is a maneuver innovation forum where every month we get these innovation centers up on the net and they share what they're doing. We help coach them maybe to certain capabilities that we've already looked at that are most promising. Um, we share tactics, techniques, and procedures. We really need to have a, a, a hot loop to very rapidly share these things. Um, uh, so I think that's part of it, and I think I, I didn't hear the last part of the reduce the, the burden of failure for. Um. I was trying to, remember, but I mean I think we're very comfortable. I mean our folks, particularly our X4, going out and not doing something right, and recocking, doing it again, and you know tr trying it in a different way, and we're going to need to do that over and over again because some of this is immature, and. Uh, we've got to be comfortable with it not being perfect. And again, that's where I think the demonstration out of Project Convergence and, and the one we did at Fort Moore really just help people visualize the potential. When you see the potential, you can't help to want to be on the team and on board. But I, but I think, I know that uh, Dr. Ambrose with, probably does some stuff with the Corps Cadets down in Texas yes, A&M too yes, and others, so you know, might be able to. Well, yeah, uh, we've got a, a, a large Corps. We, 
uh, commission more officers than any other university in America. Uh, proud traditions there, all services, uh, including more recently some from the Space Force that I've been working with. And uh, you know, back to the question on, on reducing the cost for failure, you know, having these kinds of exercises where we can try things and experiment, uh, where it's not on the battlefield, you know, that's, that's essential. And you always need to be able to do that. And I, I applaud the Army's uh, efforts in that. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to try things at a much lower cost of life. And I think that's clearly the right, right way to go. Yeah, I would just add to, I mean, we run a, a smaller experiment that generally feeds uh, Project Convergence, but it's a great series of touch points just to get for small industry to get it in soldiers' hands and get that feedback. And we know we've had companies come, adjust it, come back again, adjust, you know, that's the, the this uh, rapid iteration is what we're really looking for. And, and, and where that gets a little scary, though, is when you start talking programs of record, right? So now there's a big commitment, there's an acquisition program baseline, it gets a little little uglier there, which is why I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with this in kind of the Ricto space, right, where we're doing rapid prototyping. And, and if you're not failing in that, in that space, you're, you're not going fast enough. So you got to be riding that edge, you know, and fail here while we're learning versus failing when we're actually in war. That's where we don't, we don't want to fail. Um, so challenging the team to be willing to take those risks um, in this particular effort for HMIF Increment 1 with this board of directors at the three-star level, understanding that risk uh, across material, across all the aspects of .mil PFP, and being willing to underwrite that risk for those folks that are out doing it. Uh, and the senior leaders above us, you know, certainly with General Rainey, uh, Honorable Bush, you know, the Secretary Chief under Vice, who are being kind of briefed up on this, they understand the risk we're taking. Um, but, but sometimes you've got to fail early uh, and then get back up and realize that, hey, it was another, you know, it was the last six inches, you know, that we, we needed to put some money into to, to get after and, and solve that problem. Uh, if we can lay it out for them, uh, I think the leaders are comfortable with that, especially in something as revolutionary as uh, human machine integrated formations. Thank you very much. So, along those lines as well, as we talk about failing fast, failing early, um, but then, sir, you mentioned lots of different programs of record. And so, as we look to synchronize HMI efforts um, across multiple, those multiple programs of record, but we're also seeking to integrate these mature commercial uh, solutions into a single formation, how can we as the Army or the DOD ensure that we have good communication with industry and, you know, so that it doesn't appear like we're, these are competing and separate efforts, that it's all holistic? That's a great question, and if we could solve that for every problem, every dollar would be would be well spent across the board. But what we've certainly spent a lot of time uh, this last year trying to see what the state of play is in this particular uh, environment. I think you're already seeing some of the things that, that have been rolling out, some of the RFIs uh, out to industry that will lead to RFPs. I mean, those aren't things that, that RICTO developed. Those are things that we kind of coalesced from the centers of things that have been happening already. And those are signals, right? Here's, here's where we're looking for information to try to coalesce this team and, and build this, this, uh, this MOSA architecture. Um, I guess that's redundant. Um, but build the MOSA environment uh, for which industry to, to work against. Now, the, the challenge here is, in, from, at least from, from a RICTO perspective, uh, and I think I might have said this earlier, is we're used to taking S&T and getting it to that prototype and turning it into a program of record. In this case, you have programs of record already. Uh, in some areas, and, and they may not be completely synergized at the pace that HMI is, is working, uh, and that's where, you know, commitment, I've got commitment from, from uh, Honorable Bush uh, on the, and working with the PEOs and PMs on that side is to make sure we've thought through what transition means from S&T through RICTO to the PMs, uh, and there's, if we're not making both sides uncomfortable, then we're not doing it right, you know, so S&T community typically hates a schedule because you can't put a schedule on innovation, but in this case, we've got to drive towards, towards schedule tans tangible results uh, and, and technology you know, maturation levels over time. We've got to be willing to commit to that from an S&T perspective, and then the PMs have to do what they hate to do, and that's commit to wait and have dollars allocated for when we actually deliver that thing that they can integrate in their programs of record going forward. From the robot platform perspective, that's going to be a little bit harder, um, but we're certainly working closely with them to do it. For the payload guys and 
and, and everybody who's building a thing now for the Army, that's a potential payload in some way, shape, or form. It's just another configuration item that they have to manage. Hey, I've got my, you know, I've got my Coyote, uh, or I've got my counter UAS system, or my EW system, or whatever that I'm building that currently goes on an Inlets platform, whether that's a Striker, whether that's going to be a JLTV, and I also got a version that might be a little bit smaller for an SMIT, and maybe just a little bit bigger that I put on, on an RCV. So it's just configuration management within that perspective. We've got a ways to go to to totally get it aligned, but but I'm absolutely encouraged by by the leadership in the Army and their commitment to doing this uh, on the ASALT side, on the AFC side, and certainly uh, you know above us at the Chief and Secretary at that headquarters level. Thank you. So actually, the next question, we'll kind of flip that on its head a little bit. I'll go to Chris first with this, but do we have to think of robotics as holistic in the Army? Or can we affiliate individual task areas with defined results and then find to find manpower savings? So the manpower savings question is always a tough one. Uh, there was a study about 10 years ago that tried to quantify the savings of uncrewed, well now I'll say uncrewed, logistics trucks and went further into like well, how much are you going to save from that soldier and life savings and all these things and it becomes really difficult to do that. I would, I would turn that a little bit and say not necessarily manpower savings and uh, but years ago when I was running the DARPA Squad X program I went down to see uh, Mr. Sando and I know that nine is a sacred number at Fort Moore and you don't, you don't, you don't mess with nine. Purple squad. <laughs> um, but one thing I said to Mr. Sando was what if we give you capabilities to make your nine better so maybe you can deploy less nines and you can accomplish the same mission. And one of the things we worked with at the time with the Maneuver Battle Lab was how do you baseline a squad's performance? And then if you're adding capabilities, integrating uncrewed systems into that squad, how do you know it's better? And how do you improve those metrics? And I think the same thing, you gotta do that at the system level and there are subsystem metrics you can do. One of the things we worked with GVSC on was well, how are, and other programs have done this, how do you know your autonomy is getting better? Because there are some times where you're gonna watch it and you're like, eh, the robot's not really doing anything interesting different than I saw last week. But if you build up those metrics, you collect those metrics, you know that maybe the number of interventions are less or this time it spends trying to figure out its next solution is quicker. And, and overall, in aggregate, your time to complete the mission is better. The number of successful runs you have are better. So those, that's not an easy problem because the, that parameter space can get too large and infinite very quick. But what are those key things you want to do and track to show that you're improving not only the systems themselves, but that you're improving the overall performance of that, that unit as well? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I would just add it, it's a great point. You might be able to make the lethality of the existing squad equal to a company, or or you might attack the holy grail of the size of a rifle squad or, or an armor company too. And just because of the capability that we bring to bear, and that's something I think everything's on the table when you when you look at this, and you know, once it gets fielded and the confidence. And but that's that's uh, I mean, those are great points. Thank you very much. So, John. Um, you've touched on this a little bit, but what, what else can we learn from the successes and the growth areas from commercial autonomy as we look to develop Inc. 1 and then into the future? Um, so it, it's a progression. The self-driving car industry in the United States and the world is roughly seven years old now. Last year in California, about 1,600 vehicles traveled 9 million miles. There were fewer accidents than humans had in the same amount of miles, but the accidents are very high profile, so your public affairs team needs to be integrated into your AIML uh, projects at an early stage because they will have spectacular blow-ups and everybody just needs to be ready for that. The other important thing is that most models start off very unimpressive. And again, they only get better with that training. What we're trying to do is take the 10,000 hours it takes to become an expert and put it in a machine so that it can get mostly 70 to 80 percent of things right. And as the co-panelists have outlined, these are, um, you know, probabilistic, non-deterministic systems. Um, and so I think those are the the keys in terms of the training. You just you'd have to leverage the new software pathway that you're building, I think, so that you can continually refresh. What does that version of the hardware know? What is the next skill we're going to give it? And the hardware will give you new advances that you'll then uh, follow up with software and models on. Thank you very much. All right. So another question from the audience, and 
really just starts out by highlighting a lot of different difficult nuts to crack, if you will, that we've already talked about. But really, um, I guess I would like any of your thoughts as we talk, as we think through this about, you know, security, potentially if there's any type of robotic security efforts from Ukraine or energy for the robots. How are we thinking through the infrastructure for that and the recharging time? We already talked about the sustainment and, the, and a little bit about repair, but more about the sustainment. And then a discussion um, of whether or not we need a new MOS. So I'll go to Chris first. From a security perspective, uh, I could tie somewhat to one of the general buzzards comments earlier about do you want it to be the exquisite system or do you want it to be the throwaway system, right? And it's, I think, the, I think you want to mix. Um, there might be things you want to put out there that you're okay to lose. There are going to be things you put out there that you're definitely not okay to lose. And uh, there are some institutional knowledge challenges with that. Uh, but I think there's technologies you can put out now that are not sensitive that everybody could have, just like, hey, is there somebody around my platform I might want to do something different or I can alert, provide some alerts to security. There's some things you can implement now. Uh, we partnered in our CV with some small business in the RA salt supply, but it's like, hey, how can we leverage commercial technology? It's like, I just want to know somebody's around my platform, right? Uh, maybe I don't put the sensitive item on that platform that I'm going to put in harm's way. Uh, and from a cost perspective, I think there's a challenge, like if I don't need it to do everything or I'm, I'm planning to lose it, it's gonna, it can be cheaper than something that I'm not, I'm not planning to lose. Thank you. General Rash, anything to add, particularly from the energy piece? So, I mean, there's a lot of activities and focus on power and energy going forward anyway, and I think it's important as we look at robots, we, we fold in a lot of the efforts that are occurring on the hybrid electric front. Um, from a power perspective, uh, potentially even looking not just as robots as power consumers, but maybe even power providers um, on the battle space. So, so there, there's, a, there's a rich area that I don't think we've even thought deeply about scratching the surface on, at least within government. I know industry has, has looked at some of those. I've seen some, some potential autonomous platforms that are big batteries um, on wheels, right? So uh, they could not only power their payloads, but, the, but, uh, but also offload that. So it's something that we've, we've got to look at. It, it falls into that kind of congest, contested logistics space as well, um, that I, I think we've got all the right people, you know, putting the rough, kind of the, the rough framework together for us to get after it, but it's going to have to be part of our, uh, our kind of incremental learning over time. Just on the, on the security uh, piece also, you know, one aspect of it too is what the signature of the piece is and the signature of the ground control station. You know, if we've learned anything of the, of the last couple years of this war, you know, the last 20 years, I didn't have to worry about looking up or how long I keep my hand mic. And that's definitely changed. And uh, so, again, that, you know, an ability to not be a beacon for, uh, you know, indirect fire uh, following on. And then, and then I think, you know, a lot of what I want is it can blow itself up. Like, it can go, like, you think of some of these small robotic capability that goes in and sees an enemy, will just drive at it and kill it. Um, and, and it might be a way to save things, too, also. And that's, and I agree with the point, again, I don't think it's either or on the, the kind of mass versus precision. We, we definitely want some exquisite capability to be able to do some very important uh, things for us, obviously operating in an EW-denied environment, potentially, and, and other things. But we want other capability to be able to go right at an enemy in, in mass and, you know, uh, wave after wave and some, I mean, I think we've watched the Ukrainians also be very savvy in how to understand the EW condition that the Russians are providing and how to navigate around that and look for temporal or, you know, opportunities to be able to inject some mass of, uh, of, of cheap capability. And then on the energy, and I'm not an expert on it at all, but I think that this ability, again, back to kind of the marsupial piece of, there's a robot out that can come back to another robot and get power from that. That one can also plug into somebody else. It's this layering of, you know, power as a resource beyond just fuel that we're now going to have to think about the distribution of. Oh, thank you very much. So we're almost out of time, so I'd like to do one last question and come to each of you um, as we close. So, and we'll start with General Rash. What can we do today to position us for success for HMI in the next five years? I think the, the first thing we can do um, is manage our expectations uh, coming out of the gate. 
you know, videos and demonstrations and experiments are great. Um, being able to achieve all of that to the, to the point where you pass the litmus test of, I can give it to the platoon and the first sergeant and company commander say, this piece of kit, and we give them a lot, this piece of kit is worth the pain in the butt it is for me to maintain it and get it to where it's supposed to be on the point of battle. Uh, so what we think is a men viable product today uh, may not actually be that men viable product as we work through this, uh, uh, work through this um, kind of first increment. Uh, but I would say stay tuned. Uh, I think this, this first increment as we get to that MOSA uh, architecture and we get that out and proliferate it, I think our potential to move a lot faster going forward as we understand the space we're working in and we really work the innovation of industry um, I think it's gonna gonna set us up for a, a lot of progress over the next five years. General Buzzard. Okay, I, I mean, I think I'd probably double down on what General Kaufman talked about earlier. I, I just think it's embrace the potential. Uh, you know, we're all in the pool right now and the water's good, get in there with us. I mean, it's a, this is a tremendous opportunity here. Focus on what's good enough. You know, let us iterate on it. And uh, I think just it's a, there's just, you know, tremendous potential, potential to this. And it's in the best interest of, of our soldiers to be, to be leaning forward in this. Great. Rob? I just recommend we, we remember it's a big world. There are lots of different terrain types. And we know what we're seeing right now in Ukraine is, is one of those. Uh, it's obviously different than desert combat. But... Uh, you know, island hopping, other kinds of terrain. Uh, often robotics makes advances in spurts with different kind of morphologies of machine, different kinds of machines that come out. And if we were to get ourselves into something where we, we need more littoral, I think we would suddenly see a different set of machines and now the way we use them is different and they would change our thinking. So let's remember there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of environments that we could work in and uh, be ready uh, for, for a different type that we, we might face. So I'm going to say spares, spare parts, spare robots, spare systems, because uh, we want the soldiers, we want the experimental force to put those things in harm's way, uh, not obviously kinetic harm's way, but to use them in a way that they would want to, um, not have them baby those systems. And I've been around enough of a decade plus robotic testing to see you're going to break stuff, you're going to hurt stuff. Uh, and to plan for that and take those lessons, learn and build them in the next requirement. Because uh, one of the things I noticed from like witnessing off-road autonomy testing quite a bit is they run into things and they break things. And I even went back to my team once, I was like, well, what are, what are we doing about this? And we really have, to be fair, we didn't really have a good way to be like, how do I take what's typically been a crude vehicle requirement and make that road more robust to hitting things, ditches. And we, don't, we need to collect that data for an example and build that in the next one so that the, the next generation of robots, you maybe don't need as many. Um, because what we don't want to do now is slow down the pace of experimentation and innovation because we didn't have the material on hand. So that's what I would say is we spares. John. If you spend enough time on YouTube, you'll eventually come across a video of some Marines putting a refrigerator box over themselves and walking up to a computer vision detection device. And that's how they defeated the uh, automated target recognition. So every one of these models is going to fail in the face of a thinking enemy. And you need to just practice now, how do you refresh everything every month? It will be extremely difficult to do, but that's gonna be basically your new OODA loop versus a thinking enemy. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Can I have a round of applause for our phenomenal panel? Hey, thanks, Kim, and thanks to all the panelists. Awesome panel. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our programming for the day. The exhibit halls are open until 1700, so please go and network with our exhibitors. And then for those of you going to the Rocket City Bash later tonight, hosted by our award-winning Huntsville chapter, we look forward to seeing you there. Programming begins again tomorrow at 8.30, so please join us for our final day of panels and a closing keynote from Lieutenant General Chris Mohan. Thanks, and have a great Army night. I got rice cooking in the microwave. I got a three-day beard I don't plan to shave. And it's a, a goofy thing, but I just got to say, hey, I'm doing all right. <laughs>